Hello everyone who is showing up today on this is the second day of the California Bioresources Alliance Symposium, uh, Pathways for Integrating our Bioresources Management. The program for today is four more sessions. Next slide, please. Four more sessions. Um, actually, these are yester yesterday's agenda. We, we went through uh, four sessions of um, new collaborations, which highlighted two new associations in, in the bioresources space. Um, we discussed market integration between many different business models in our space, uh, achieving net zero carbon, as well as uh, plastics as a bioresource. For today, next slide. Well, let's take care of some housekeeping first. Um, to reduce disruptions, your uh, microphones and videos have been disabled on the part of attendees. Um, the uh, agenda for today can is available at the uh, the the website that you see here, CBAS program on the bitly backslash. 2021, or if you have uh, a cell phone that automatically reads QR codes, um, if you just take a snap picture of this QR code as you see it on your screen, that'll take you right to the program as well. Um, as you probably heard, this is being recorded. Um, as, as far as the, uh, the, the four sessions, Next slide, please. Um, for today, we have two sessions in the morning and two in the afternoon, just like what we had yesterday. So it's, but they're all different topics. Uh, we're going to start out with session five, which is progress on uh, the California SB 1383. And I'll be introducing um, the moderator of that session shortly. Then session six, after a a short break will be on research on bioresource pro, uh, products that build and to build healthy soil. Uh, session seven after lunch will be on advanced bioresource technologies um, that will tra help transition us to a, a green circular economy. And then we will have a discussion about the future of bioresources in the afternoon panel. And there'll be a lot of opportunity for weighing in uh, from the, the uh, uh, attendees on learning about as well as participating in pathways for improving uh, bioresource management. So the, the, up, the opening session this morning is focused on the progress that we are uh, have been making in California on um, S uh, SB 1383, which is the short-lived climate pollutant strategy that's uh, being implemented starting January 1 of 2022. To moderate the panel and introduce all of the speakers on the panel, uh, and then have plenty uh, some time at the end for question and answers or uh, technical questions for each of the panelists. Um, I would like to introduce to you a colleague uh, that I've known for as many years as I've been doing this business, basically the last 20 years, uh, Greg Kester, who is the Director of Renewable um, resource recovery and re resource programs for the California Association of Sewage A uh, Sanitation Agencies. So I'm turning you over into the capable hands of Greg Hester. Hi, Greg. Thanks a lot, Dan. Uh, hello, everyone. It's a uh, pleasure to be here and uh, be with you all. Uh, I think we have an exciting uh, panel today. Um, to talk about the implementation of SB 1383. 
in uh, the order that we will uh, have our speakers as shown on the on the slide there. And I would like to um, just note that uh, if you can, uh, if you have questions, please type them in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And um, we will go through all the questions, uh, as many as we can, at least at the end of the complete panel. Uh, so not after each uh, individual speaker. Uh, so with that, I'd like to introduce our first uh, speaker is Julia Dolliff. Julia is an environmental scientist with the local assistant branch at Cal Recycle. She began her career with the department in 2014, and she received her Master of Public Policy in Administration from California State University, Sacramento, and her BA from UC Santa Cruz. And with that, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome Julia. Thank you so much. And I just want to make sure that you can see my presentation. Yes. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, you're fine. All righty. Uh, so good morning, everyone. I'm going to provide a brief overview of the organic waste reduction targets outlined in SB 1383. And while there are many important programs that jurisdictions must implement um, as part of the 1383 regulations, including mandatory organics collection services, edible food recovery programs, and capacity planning, today I'm going to focus on what constitutes landfill disposal and the procurement requirements. So as we all probably know at this point, organic waste comprises over half of California's disposed waste stream, and food waste comprises approximately 13% of the state's disposed waste. And this is at a time when one in five Californians or approximately 8 million people are struggling with food insecurity. SB 1383 was signed into law in 2016 as part of California's larger strategy to combat climate change. The law is designed to reduce global warming super pollutants, including methane. Landfills are one of the three largest producers of methane in the state, so we need to move away from landfilling organic waste and, of course, edible food. By 2025, SB 1383 requires California to reduce organic waste disposal by 75% and increase edible food recovery by 20%. And organic waste is defined broadly in the regulations and includes food waste, paper, cardboard, green waste, organic textiles and carpets, lumber, wood, biosolids, digestate, manure, and sludges. The regulations become enforceable on January 1st of 2022. That's coming up very quickly. So that means that starting on January 1st, jurisdictions must have their programs in place and CalRecycle can begin enforcement actions on jurisdictions and other entities beginning in 2022. In 2024, jurisdictions are required to take enforcement action against non-compliant entities. So Article 2 of the regulations identifies facilities, operations, or activities that are considered a reduction in landfill disposal. These include recycling centers, comp compostable material handling facilities, in-vessel digestion facilities, biomass conversion facilities, soil amendment for erosion control, revegetation, slope stab stabilization, or landscaping at a landfill land application, and animal feed. If an operation is not specifically identified in the regulations, then it is automatically considered disposal. However, the regulations do provide a process for CalRecycle to consider additional pathways for diverting material. For a technology or process to constitute a reduction in landfill disposal for the purposes of SB 1383, the permanent life cycle greenhouse gas emissions reductions must be equal to or greater than the emission reductions from composting organic waste. This process is open to any stakeholder that's interested in determining if a new activity counts as a reduction in landfill disposal. 
So for a power cycle to consider whether an operation, facility, or activity counts as a reduction in landfill disposal, an applicant must submit the information outlined in the regulations, which includes some general information, a detailed explanation of the new activity, the mass in short tons of organic waste differentiated by type that will be processed each year, each calculation, assumption, and emission factor used to calculate the GHG emissions and the expected permanent GHG emissions reductions of the new activity, and documentation demonstrating the GHG emissions and emission reduction factors have been peer reviewed or subject to scientifically rigorous review methods. And CalRecycle, in consultation with um, the Air Resources Board, will use this information to evaluate the new activity. And so that's a very brief high-level overview of the Article 2 um, requirements. We do have a web page specifically dedicated to Article 2 and applying for um, an activity that may constitute landfill disposal or um, not constitute landfill disposal. So feel free to review our web page for any more information. So Article 12 of the regulations outlines the procurement requirements. These requirements were designed to help build markets for recovered organic waste products and to help close the loop on recovering and using diverted organic waste as a result of SB 1383. While expanded organics recycling infrastructure is needed to accommodate newly diverted organic waste, there is sufficient infrastructure currently in operation to produce the quantity of products that must be procured by jurisdictions beginning in 2022. Jurisdictions have two distinct procurement requirements. These are to procure recovered organic, organic waste products and recycled content paper. Today, I will focus on the procurement of recovered organic waste products. These are mulch, compost, energy products from anaerobic digestion, including transportation fuel, electricity or gas used for heating applications, and electricity from biomass conversion. CalRecycle has now assigned an annual procurement target to each jurisdiction based on their population size. Jurisdictions can find their procurement target on our website. For the procurement of recovered organic waste products, a jurisdiction is defined as a city, county, or city and county. The target will be recalculated every five years to account for changes in population. Therefore, the procurement target for the year of 2022 will be in effect for five years until 2027. Rural jurisdictions that are exempt from the organic waste collection requirements are not required to comply with the recovered organic waste product procurement requirements until 2027. And as I mentioned, the procurement target is specific to cities and counties. However, jurisdictions are encouraged to work with special districts, regional agencies, and other similar entities to help meet the jurisdiction's procurement targets, provided that this is accomplished through a direct service provider contract or written agreement. The regulations provide jurisdictions with flexibility in meeting their procurement target. For example, a jurisdiction may meet its target entirely with one product or through a mix of products. The regulations outline specific details as to what makes these project products eligible for procurement, but the key is that the products must be one, made from California landfill diverted organic waste, and two, be made at specific types of facilities or operations. The regulations are final and do not allow for additional product types to be considered to comply with the jurisdiction's procurement target. We commonly get the question of whether biosolids may count towards a jurisdiction's procurement target. Biosolids are included in the definition of organic waste in the regulations. While biosolids are a distinct material type, the organic waste product may produce compost. And compost, as I just mentioned, is an eligible recovered organic waste product as long as the final product meets the definition of compost as outlined in the regulations and is produced at a compost operation or facility or a large volume in vessel digestion facility that composts on site. Jurisdictions can meet their procurement target through, a, through direct procurement or a direct service provider. An example of direct procurement would be a jurisdiction directly using the product themselves or giving it away. 
And it's important to note that the regulations limit procurement to use or giveaway and does not include the sale of products. An example of a direct service provider would be a jurisdiction contracting with a hauler to procure eligible products on behalf of that jurisdiction. Other examples of direct service providers could include landscaping services or transportation services. Procurement through a direct service provider requires that the jurisdiction have a written contract or agreement with the direct service provider to procure recovered organic waste products on behalf of that jurisdiction. Procurement does not necessarily mean that products have to be purchased. A jurisdiction that owns its own organics recovery facility, for example, can procure and produce products for city and county use without a financial transaction. A jurisdiction may also acquire products in another way, such as free delivery or distribution of products from a hauler, and can subsequently use or donate those products to meet their procurement target. Additionally, the products that are procured do not have to be produced within the jurisdiction, made from organics collected within the jurisdiction, or even used within the jurisdiction. In the case of energy procured from the grid or a natural gas pipeline, procurement can be a paper transaction. The regulations don't speak to the contracting and mechanisms by which products may be procured. As such, there may be an opportunity for jurisdictions to procure eligible products on paper. So this could be an arrangement where the actual recovered organic waste product is not physically transferred to or received by the jurisdiction or their direct service provider, but it's being considered procured through record keeping and a paper trail. So for example, here's an ex uh, what a paper transaction could look like. So if a POTW receives say 100 tons of organic waste from specified solid waste facilities and produces renewable electricity, a maximum of 24,200 kilowatt hours would be available as an eligible recovered organic waste product for procurement. So a jurisdiction that's procuring electricity from the POTW may count 24,200 kilowatt hours of their total electricity procured from renewable gas towards their target. And this example is using the conversion factors that are outlined in the regulations to convert the tons of recovered organic waste to its equivalent in kilowatt hours of electricity. Lastly, CalRecycle built a mechanism into the regulations where the procurement target can be lowered to ensure that a jurisdiction does not procure more recovered organic waste products than it can use. A jurisdiction can support use of a lower target by showing that the amount of fuel, electricity, and gas used for heating applications procured in the previous year is lower than their procurement target. This mechanism will be triggered by a jurisdiction as part of their annual report, and the jurisdiction must keep records to, to support the use of that lowered procurement target. So this slide provides some examples of how a jurisdiction might use these products to meet their target. For example, a jurisdiction can use renewable transportation fuel to fuel their buses or waste fleets, or a jurisdiction's franchise waste hauler could use the fuel for their trucks if they are a contracted direct service provider. Another example is that a jurisdiction can use the electricity generated from biomass conversion or renewable gas from AD to power the on-site needs of the organics recycling facility itself or other buildings or infrastructure used by the jurisdiction or their direct service providers. So renewable gas used for transportation fuel, electricity, or heating applications is an eligible recovered organic waste product that jurisdictions may procure to meet their target, provided all requirements and standards outlined in the regulations are being met. And renewable gas in the regulations is defined as gas derived from organic waste that has been diverted from a landfill and processed at an in-vessel digestion facility that is permitted or otherwise authorized to recover organic waste. Renewable gas from a POTW that co-digests organic waste may count as an eligible recovered organic waste product, again, provided it meets the requirements outlined in the regulations. 
And the regulations do require that the POTW receive organic waste directly from specific permitted or other, otherwise authorized solid waste facilities or operations. The POTW transports less than 25% of its biosolids to activities that constitute landfill disposal. And the POTW meets the requirements for an exclusion from the solid waste permitting or notification tier. The jurisdiction must receive a record documenting the tons of organic waste received by the POTW from the specified solid waste facilities or operations. And only the portion of renewable gas that is produced from organic waste received directly from specified solid waste facilities or operations may count towards a jurisdiction's procurement target. Renewable gas that is solely derived from sewage is ineligible for meeting the procurement target, and that is because sewage sludge is not typically destined for landfill disposal. So the gas that's generated from digesting that material does not contribute to achieving the 1383 landfill diversion goals. So this slide highlights some of the tools and resources that are currently available to help jurisdictions implement their procurement targets. The procurement calculator tool is on our website and can be used by jurisdictions to calculate their procurement target and the quantities of recovered organic waste products that would need to be procured. And this may be helpful to a jurisdiction um, in planning for their procurement and tracking their progress towards meeting their target. We also uh, published the recordings for several regional webinars that we hosted over the spring. And those webinars included a section on the procurement requirements specifically and included a live Q&A session as well. We also have a model procurement policy on our website, which is customizable for jurisdictions and have additional case studies on procurement that highlight jurisdictions that are already making progress towards meeting their target. If there are other resources that you think would be helpful to any of you, um, please let us know. And again, um, we did publish just this week the official procurement targets for every jurisdiction. So finally, I'd like to mention that as part of the governor's $15 billion climate package, CalRecycle was provided $10 million to expand food waste co-digestion projects at existing wastewater treatment plants, $90 million for organics, organic waste infrastructure grants, and $60 million for grants to local jurisdictions to assist in the implementation of SB 1383. So obviously that's great news and more information on those grant opportunities uh, is forthcoming. So that concludes my presentation. If you need further information on the procurement requirements, please review our procurement web pages, contact with us with any questions. And with that, I'll hand it back over to Greg. Thank you. Thanks very much, Julia. That's great. And uh, I see we do have a couple of questions that have come in. And so please do uh, continue to uh, type your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And we'll go over those uh, at the end of the panel. With that, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Chris Hun, uh, with the State Water Boards. Chris is a staff um, climate lead at the California State Water Resources Control Board. Uh, working primarily on implementing the State Water Board's climate change resolution, statewide interagency climate planning, and coordinating with regional water boards on climate action. He has a PhD in developmental engineering from the Energy and Resources Group at UC Berkeley. And with that, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome Chris. Great, thank you. Let me get this presentation up here. All right, um, does it look like I'm sharing the right screen? Yes, it does, Chris. Great, thank you. So good morning and happy World Toilet Day to everyone. Uh, again, I'm Chris Hyun, Climate Lead at the State Water Board, and I'll be giving you an update on excess digester capacity analysis and, uh, water, water, and a water board's perspective. Um, so first I want to give you a bit of context on how we prioritize climate action at the State Water Board, including co-digestion. For the past year, I've been the point person on co-digestion at the State Water Board, but I am a part 
of several climate initiatives at the State Water Board. I prioritize the climate actions in the State Water Board climate resolution adopted in 2017, as Greg uh, had mentioned, uh, which includes co-digestion among other climate action items. Uh, I also work with other state agencies, including the governor's office to develop climate plans, like the state adaptation strategy and the sea level rise uh, work plan coming out this year. Finally, the State Water Board also has environmental justice considerations and recently adopted a racial equity resolution. Co-digestion is one among several of uh, st the State Water Board's climate priorities in my bailiwick. So that just gives you a little bit of context for co-digestion at the State Water Board. So in this presentation, I will do a quick overview of the co-digestion capacity study we conducted with Corolo. I will go as quickly as possible through this, and I will give you a full overview. Um, uh, at la I gave a full overview at last year's uh, symposium, but some of you may not be familiar with the report, and it may be helpful review for others. Uh, then the second half of the presentation will focus on what happened after last year's presentation since the report's release. So first, why did we conduct a co-digestion study at the State Water Board? Um, uh, Julia has already explained uh, Senate Bill 1383, which is one of the main motivations to cut down greenhouse gas emissions, 40% methane reduction from 24 levels by 2030. So this is a huge motivation uh, for the study. Uh, and greenhouse gases can be reduced by diverting food waste from landfills, but then where do you put it if you divert it from landfills? One way is compost, as uh, Julia had explained, and another is co-digestion at wastewater treatment plants uh, that already exist. If you don't already know, co-digestion is processing food waste at wastewater treatment plants through anaerobic digestion, through which uh, biogas can be generated. In fact, before the report study, there seemed to be a lot of unused excess digester capacity to produce biogas. Could co-digestion reduce greenhouse gas emissions enough to help meet the goals of SB 1383? This question led to the production of the report, Co-Digestion Capacity uh, in California. It's a six chapter report with appendices. It was finalized in 2019. So on the cover, it says June, 2019, but was actually released uh, uh, in August, 2020. And spoiler alert, I'm about to give you three key takeaways of the report right now. So according to the findings of the report, one, at least 50% of food waste in California could be recovered, two, Maximizing co-digestion is a net positive financial investment statewide. Three, diversion of food waste for co-digestion could reduce up to 2.4 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent by 2030. So that's the overall report, but I'll also give you a chapter by chapter breakdown and again, quickly go over the takeaways. You can read the report on our climate webpage at the State Water Board. You can also go back to last year's presentation um, at the symposium. And there's also a great video on YouTube by Casa and Carollo from last year um, so that you can look up. But I'll go over some key points of each chapter. So chapter one focused on the food waste itself and not on digestion. So this chapter came out before other major studies by Calorie Cycle, but it did show uh, conceptually how food waste diversion could play a major role to achieve SB 1383 goals. And this was based on the 2017 uh, food waste inventory. So in chapter two, uh, this chapter starts uh, looking at co-digestion capacity across California. And it showed that if wastewater treatment plants were to expand and use their full uh, digestion capacity, then they could cover about 25% of projected food waste in 2013, as calculated in chapter one. Uh, 2030, not 2013. This diagram shows the key processes in co-digestion. The processes considered in this study are in the dotted box. So these are all processes within a wastewater treatment plant. Um, so there's food waste receiving station, of course, anaerobic digestion, biosolids dewatering, flare, biogas conditioning, and biogas utilization. In chapter three, we look at the investments showing that revenue could cover 
a 15-year capital and O&M costs. The numbers favor renewable uh, natural gas as well as larger facilities. So here I must emphasize that uh, the report is a statewide analysis and outcomes vary by individual facility. Uh, there were also considerations for jobs, noise, odor, and regulations, though the analysis was um, not uh, very detailed. Chapter four, uh, the financial analysis was detailed, but um, some of the other order and, um, uh, and noise were not as detailed. And I'll explain that later when I talk about the updates. Chapter four is a greenhouse gas reduction analysis showing up to, four, uh, as I said at the beginning, 2.4 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent reduction from diverted food waste. And then chapter five has a number of case studies of small and medium sized facilities. And chapter six, uh, larger wastewater treatment plants, um, including East Bay Mud and uh, sanitation districts of Los Angeles County. And again, you can read more details in the report and the other references I mentioned earlier. So now for the continuation. So since the last symposium and since the release of the port, uh, report, the State Water Board has done a number of rollout activities, um, including again, the release of the report um, in uh, last year, uh, webinars with groups like CASA and Carollo, um, interagency planning uh, with agencies like uh, Cal Recycle, um, <clears throat> uh, the Air Resources Board, uh, the CPUC, uh, US EPA, um, and then focus calls with key stakeholders, including a focus call with various wastewater interest industries, uh, including CASA, uh, associations, and then environmental justice organizations. So through all of the rollout actions so far, we were able to gather feedback on the report and ideas for moving forward. We considered the report throughout the rollout, rollout process like a roadmap and shared with stakeholders as such. So we have a pretty clear destination, uh, 3.4 million tons of organic uh, of organic waste diverted and co-digest and co-digested, and also of course greenhouse gas reduction. But we wanted more clarity on what industry and environmental environmental groups thought are in the way, and in a sense, get us all on the same page during this rollout process. So we were able to identify various uh, barriers, uh, including first and foremost financing both capital and operations and maintenance, um, regulations on land application of biosolids, nutrient discharge, uh, demo projects, uh, as well as pre-processing, particularly for feedstock, feedstock supply and quality and contracting for pre-processing uh, before it gets to a wastewater treatment plant. Um, so the food waste needs to be turned into a sludge, uh, into a slurry. And also economic viability, including concerns about the energy market variability, um, composting competition, and especially feasibility for the smaller uh, facilities. Uh, also novelty, meaning um, co-digestion is, is outside of a wastewater facility's uh, core mission. So how do they negotiate that? Um, and also a lot of unfamiliarity around co-digestion. And then other barriers included odor and traffic impacts, um, and then slow decision making, um, including by people like me at the State Water Board and Cal Recycle and others. So there are also opportunities that were identified uh, during this process. So co digestion aligns with climate goals, including SB 1383. So these are state climate goals that are rolling out. Two, uh, there are solid waste programs in development as um, Julia had been, uh, did a whole presentation on. So these are already rolling out and providing um, uh, food waste stock and the regulations needed to collect the food waste stock. There's also precedent. So uh, 
as shown in the report, there are various small, medium, and large wastewater treatment facilities that are already doing co-digestion. So there's tech skills and lessons learned already. There's also willing partnerships uh, between solid and liquid waste. And also, as the report shows, available unused uh, digester capacity across the state. So we were able to identify various priorities, um, including what industry stakeholders had listed out or agreed or had we had concluded uh, five top priorities. Um, one is financing strategies for facilities to expand into co-digestion. Two, increased access to markets for energy products. Three, high quality and regular supply of feedstock for a plan for navigating regulation and permitting, and five, feasibility assessments for individual uh, facilities. So this is not to say that the State Water Board or Calorie Cycle will, will fix all of these challenges, but both industry and state agencies should consider these priorities for funding, regulatory design and implementation, and for further research. So there are some environmental justice concerns that were also pressed upon during the rollout. So environmental justice leaders brought up concerns about surfactants, PFAS in wastewater sludge, particularly uh, truck traffic dust and other impacts on communities already at greater health risk near wastewater treatment facilities. Uh, my team, uh, a major concern was that the report did not include a major uh, a more detailed assessment of community impacts. My team has started to look into what a more detailed uh, environmental justice assessment could look like by comparing co-digestion readiness of wastewater treatment plants as determined in the co-digestion report and Cal Enviro screen scores of communities in and around each wastewater treatment plant. So a wastewater treatment plant may be quite ready for co-digestion, a score of five or six in blue, but also the community around the facility, facility may have a high Cal Enviro screen score in red. This is just a back of the envelope analysis, not to make any conclusions about community impact, but to show that further research is needed to understand the relationship between co-digestion and community impact. So currently, uh, it has not been decided how or who will conduct a com community impact study. So our agencies are continuing to discuss about this, in particular between the State Water Board, Cal Recycle, and Cal EPA. Not only this, but you may have heard that also the 20 million uh, that Cal Recycle has received for co-digestion this year through the uh, climate package. So Cal Recycle has been, has been appropriated $20 million to award as grants to expand food waste co-digestion proje projects at existing wastewater treatment plants. Eligible projects may include the design and construction of integrated organic food waste pre-processing and anaerobic digestion systems that will divert significant amount of food waste from landfill disposal to co-digestion uh, for greenhouse gas emission reduction. So CalRecycle will present the proposed program and scoring criteria in early 2020 with the application process to be released the month after the public meeting. So stay tuned through Cal Recycle's Greenhouse Gas Reduction Program um, listserv to stay appraised of the release of the proposed program criteria. And thank you very much to all those who participate in the um, formation of the report as well, including Greg. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, great overview. And uh, just as a reminder for uh, folks to please uh, type your questions into the Q&A function. And uh, we'll proceed on uh, with uh, Hillary Gans. Hillary is a senior, has worked in recycling and composting in industry for over 25 years for private companies and public agencies in Northern California. In his current position at the South Bayside Waste Management Authority, or Rethink Waste, Hillary oversees the operations, capital projects, and contracts for Shoreway Environmental Center that handles 400,000 tons per year 
of recyclables and waste from the agency's half million residents located between San Francisco and San Jose. Hillary completed a $50 million master plan design and construction project to modernize the Shoreway Environmental Center into a state-of-the-art recycling and transfer center that's been nationally recognized and received the LEED Gold and Swana Gold Awards. Current projects include uh, MRF equipment upgrades and organics to energy projects. And with that, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome Hillary. Uh, thank you. I'm assuming everybody can hear me and I'll just proceed yeah. with my slides. Uh, you know, first of all, thank you to Dan and Greg and all the folks that put this symposium on. Um, uh, great to get this message out. And then to uh, Chris and Julia who preceded me, they, they teed up this discussion very well. And uh, John is gonna follow me, um, John Hake. And uh, so I won't try to trample his uh, presentation, but uh, East Bay Mud, uh, who John works for is a great partner in our project. So um, as Greg mentioned, I work for a public agency, uh, the South Bay Side Waste Management Authority, also called Rethink Waste. I'll do a little intro to who we are and then get into a case study of our organic waste energy project and uh, uh, talk a little bit about the technology and hopefully some technology transfer discussion. And with that, I'll try to stay on schedule. So uh, again, the SPWMA, give you an orientation geographically, we're on the peninsula, San Mateo County, we service half of the, roughly half the county of San Mateo, basically from San Francisco airport south to the Santa Clara border. 11 cities, half million residents, 10,000 businesses, and about 500,000 tons per year. Our facility uh, includes a MRF, uh, state-of-the-art MRF transfer station. That's the only processing that we do on site. We really transport everything else to off-site processors. Um, but we do maintain about a 50% average uh, on the on diversion. Uh, again, we're a public agency, but a little different. We have a public-private partnership in that we uh, contract out the collections uh, community uh, trash truck collection, and then we uh, contract out the operations of the facility. So we don't actually uh, do anything. <laughs> we we uh, uh, have other folks help us, uh, and they're really the experts. This is uh, just a slide just to give you a visual of what the facility looks like, 16 acres, um, and we move an awful lot of material. Uh, organics, so getting into the organics program, um, we have a three card system. We rolled that out in 2000 um, and we allow residents, residents to put food waste in their green card. So it's a green waste, food waste, residential collection program. Commercial uh, is also uh, mixed organics. Um, this gives you some stats on the existing residential program, the commercial program, I just refer to it as SSO, source separated organics, uh, was initiated about 15 years ago. And, you know, pre COVID, we had a really robust program. We we're collecting almost 100 tons a day. Uh, that's now cut in half. And during the peak of COVID, it was down to 25%. So we're really uh, rebuilding our program. Um, obviously, people weren't using the restaurants and, and other uh, community meal. Uh, and, and food oriented locations. So, uh, you know, we're kind of starting from a whole in trying to meet our 1383 uh, goals of diverting organic waste. Uh, it would have been great if we had just been able to continue a progression up from 100 tons a day, but we're kind of waiting for materials to, to return. Eventually, uh, we expect that we'll be double what we were pre COVID. So, we're 35,000 tons a year. Uh, 100 tons a day, uh, we expect after we roll out 1383 collection, expand that collection program, which Julia talked about as a requirement uh, by 2024, we should uh, have 70,000 or almost 200 tons per day. So I'm gonna sort of switch over to uh, sort of lessons learned and giving some advice from, from our case study um, and show you some of the case study work. 
So growing organics diversion is not easy. Uh, this is a really tough stream I mean, to work with. I've, I've dealt with all of them, uh, including lots of organics, but not food waste really. Our, our, built, our built composting facilities uh, for the private sector. Um, I've built MRFs and I've certainly had my share of C&D work. Um, so uh, this is the toughest stream <laughs> to deal with. Um, it's putrescibility is really what makes it so hard. Uh, it's also very expensive to collect. Um, these materials are, have to move. Um, and so you have to have a source separated collection program that gets at those materials quickly because they just can't sit or else vectors and other problems occur. Um, the cost of composting has gone up too. Uh, and why is that? It's basically that there's a shortage of composting facilities. Why is that? Uh, I don't know. Um, I would suggest uh, you'd ask the regulators. Um, there are plenty of people who would, and companies that would start composting facilities in the state, but they can't seem to get them permitted and built. So that's left a, a shortage of capacity, which has driven up the price, and it's only going to get worse. Um, the other thing that's going to get worse, much worse, is contamination. Um, as you mine into the food waste stream, uh, you, you collect more material. Think of you know, going after every taco stand with a, with a bin. Um, trying to get food waste, you're going to get an awful lot of material that's not food waste. And that just makes it really hard for people trying to manage uh, the organics and, and trying to deliver a quality product. So those are some uh, serious challenges. Talk more about that. But obviously what we're talking about on the big scale is just moving this material out of the landfill. The typical pathway has been going to compost. And I'm suggesting for food waste, the there's a better pathway, uh, anaerobic digestion. Uh, you've seen dry digestion facilities built in the state. Um, in San Jose, we've got a large one. Um, these are in vessel. They are, they are collecting gas, and, and they have that great benefit of, of getting more value out of the material. Um, and then there's wet anaerobic digestion, which we're talking about near here now. And uh, we talked about uh, how we can expand uh, wet digestion through the use of the wastewater treatment plant infrastructure. So more about that. Uh, this is uh, looks like food waste, but this was actually my ramen dish uh, a week ago. It was delicious. Uh, this is what food waste actually looks like when it comes into our facility. And uh, you know, I'm looking for that ramen dish <laughs> in there. Uh, you, you don't see a lot of uh, food waste there. That's because everything's in bags. And you also saw an awful lot of uh, wood and uh, uh, other waste. Working with wastewater treatment plants, they don't want that stuff. They can't take it. They have uh, no ability to manage it. And uh, it just becomes a problem if the materials are contaminated. So they want a clean, liquid, organic material. And that's been the challenge of, of, of our project is to make a material the wastewater treatment plants want. Uh, why do they want it? Because it, it uh, helps uh, generate energy. So this is just what that material looks like. And it starts here uh, with our organics processing system uh, installed by and manufactured by a company named Energia. Um, they have a unique system. It's really built around this hub of uh, extraction technology. Uh, they call the Oryx. Uh, to simplify it, it's a big garlic press. It's, it's like a baler with perforated chamber. As the material gets squished, the, the non-organic material stays inside the chamber. Anything that'll flow goes out through the holes. Um, you can imagine how that would work. Um, and the idea is it works on large volume basis. We're doing about 15 tons an hour. Uh, unfortunately, this isn't enough. Uh, it's more processing and contamination removal is required in order to go to a wastewater treatment plant with this material. And so this is a, a two-stage process. This is the second stage. Uh, the material uh, in, a, in a pumpable form now, as it's diluted, goes through a series of machines that essentially uh, take the, the contamination off the top, the floating material, and the contamination off the bottom, the grit, you know, uh, rocks, bone, whatever is in that food waste that uh, wastewater treatment plants don't want. So again, we're looking for a consistency of kind of baby food. 
and uh, a puree, a smoothie, uh, you know, just to continue with the food uh, analogies. And um, if we deliver any material that's uh, contaminated, it becomes uh, instantly known to the wastewater treatment plant and, and that jeopardizes our relationship with them. So this has been a, a big focus of this project. The next stage is to get it to the wastewater treatment plant. It's, it has to go in tanker trucks. We're used to transporting everything as a solid waste, loading it with buckets in the big trailers. And um, uh, this is a, a whole different type of uh, logistics. Uh, this is a South San Francisco wastewater treatment plant. We're unloading uh, the slurry into their digester here. Um, so our partners, uh, again, we can't recycle this material by ourselves because we don't do anaerobic digestion. We do um, waste handling, and uh, that really doesn't include liquids. Uh, so we're an intermediate processor, just like we are for recyclables, right? So when we process mixed recyclables, we don't recycle those materials. We process them, clean them, and get them ready for market. So in this way, the wastewater treatment plants are the market. And from the top going down, our partners are uh, Central Marin Sanitary, East Bay Mud, uh, South San Francisco Wastewater Treatment Plant, Silicon Valley Clean Water. So we've got uh, a lot of you know, willing partners, uh, as uh, Chris mentioned. Uh, there is a, an interest and a willingness on the wastewater treatment plants to, to enter into relationships for this material. We just have to meet them uh, and meet their expectations uh, for this material, which means a reliable, clean uh, product. So, um, you know, really summarizing what is the reason that a wastewater treatment plant would want to take this material? Because obviously, as we've said, they're not they're not obligated to do it. Um, this is this is not really their mandate. Um, even though food waste, you know, I would argue that it's really not a solid waste. It's really a liquid waste, I and mean, it's it's eighty percent water. Um, half, most of the food waste winds up going down the pipes in, uh, in garbage disposals anyway. So this is material that uh, maybe is better suited for wastewater treatment plants anyway. We're just getting it to them in a form that works. So wastewater treatment plants are probably the biggest ener single energy consumers within your community. Uh, the reason is because is they're running electricity and pumps 24-7. Uh, so uh, that adds up to a lot of power. Uh, nice thing is they're publicly owned, so they can they can move uh, without having without being profit uh, 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 centric, shall we say? And uh, you know, and I think that what we're seeing is that really everybody's trying to solve this uh, methane issue and, and the issue of climate change, and uh, that's they're really part of the regulatory and mandate driven umbrella of trying to solve this uh, problem. Um, also mentioned uh, by Chris, most wastewater treatment plants have uh, excess capacity that's readily deployable and it's easily permitted um, to handle this type of material. The other big benefit is uh, they're usually urban, right? So it's the same waste shed, same watershed. This material, uh, waste and water, both flow regionally and locally, so uh, you're reducing transportation. Uh, with compost, we're taking materials great distances. Some, you know, half our material goes over the Central Valley to Tracy. Um, so our project specifically, uh, we started in 17. You know, the planning happened long before that, actually. Uh, we developed relationships with the wastewater treatment plants in, in 2019. We installed this energy system that I showed you the video of, and have been working uh, on startup uh, for you know, really several years now because COVID uh, shut us down for a whole year. I mean, we just shut the, the operation down literally and put, put it on mothballs. So we've restarted um, and we're continuing to send material now, probably three to four loads a day. Uh, these are the 5,000 gallon tanker trucks out to wastewater treatment plants. And it's, uh, I think it's been very successful. And I guess we'll hear from, from John on that as well. So I'm going to zoom way out and look at, uh, you know, these are kind of recommendations and lessons learned. Um, so, you know, we're looking at anaerobic digestion over on the right here at the top. Uh, in the middle, you've got composting as a technology and then combustion and gasification. 
not, a, not one of these is going to work for our waste stream. We need all of these. Uh, uh, composting is great for uh, sort of mixed 50% uh, moisture material, uh, material that has a balanced C to N ratio. It's really best for yard waste and agricultural waste. It doesn't work so well on food waste. It just makes a mess. And, um, you know, if you look at anaerobic digestion, uh, it's much better for wet, nitrogenous, and putrescible materials, really materials that, that can't sit around at all because they start to rot and smell. Um, and that's really what we want. We want that uh, nitrogenous and, and high protein content in the food waste because that's what generates the power uh, and the biogas at the waste order treatment plants. Um, I, I am a firm believer that we need uh, combustion and gasification in this state. It's been uh, sort of a, a dark horse for what reason, I'm not sure, but if we're gonna deal with all the waste and all the, the ag waste uh, that and, and, and uh, um, wood waste that's in the forest, uh, the most appropriate technology is gasification and combustion for energy purposes. So uh, drilling down on, on organic waste in particular, um, you have to pay very close attention to the feedstock. Again, I mentioned moisture content and nitrogen ratio. Uh, what's the quantity and the quality of the material? If you've got small quantities of anything, it's really hard to do to do anything. You need economies of scale. You need uh, this is this is all very expensive equipment that's required, and so you just need a lot of a lot of material. Um, and then, is the material uh, separatable or mixed? I showed you that picture of uh, food waste that was coming into our facility. You saw wood waste sitting on top of it. When it arrives at our facility, we'll pull the wood waste and the yard waste out and send that to composting. Um, so is that material so mixed in that you can't do some crude floor separation with it? If so, now you've got to deal with uh, wood waste uh, that's now mixed into that stuff and or metal or whatever else is mixed in. So uh, that's an important issue that I think just gets missed. And contamination levels, this is the, the stuff that is mixed in that you just got to figure out how to get out. And uh, that was the really the thrust of a technology portion of my presentations, how we're doing that. And then um, if you don't have consistent, reliable markets, uh, you might as well not even start because um, you need, this material needs to move, cannot stockpile it. And, um, you know, my uh, drum about contamination is that, uh, in my opinion, uh, if we push all of this food waste into composting, we're going to kill composting in the state. Uh, there is so much contamination in food waste that the ability to make a quality product is going to be uh, a real challenge. And once the markets uh, have, have been dumped on with contamination, they're not going to come back. They're not going to trust this material or uh, the purveyors of this material. Um, who am I doing on time? So I'm going to roll through this pretty quickly. Uh, this is, I think, really just a, a matrix for um, anybody who wants to look at these slides at, at later. Um, but if you're trying to figure out how to make decisions about where to send material, what pathways, um, you know, you've got these rankings or this, this matrix that um, I filled out here that gives you some orientation to that. Um, you know, obviously we're talking about uh, uh, methane capture as a goal and regulatory compliance, um, we've got uh, different cost elements that need to be taken into consideration. And uh, as I keep talking about contamination, um, because if you uh, don't take contamination concerns uh, into consideration upfront, they're gonna, they're gonna get you in the end. <laughs> so uh, pay attention to those. So this is uh, the same grid filled out for our project and, and our agency. And it just talks about where that material is going. Our landfill is, is Ox Mountain Landfill. We have two composting. This is along the top uh, blue line. We have two composting facilities, um, one in San Jose Bivon, and Bivon uh, Recology in the valley that we go to. And um, the wastewater treatment plants that we uh, use. And um, I filled in cost numbers here that you know, if you want to do the math, you can see 
really what the what the net costs are. Um, compost, as I said, is expensive. Uh, it's expensive to tip, but it's also expensive to transport. As I said, we're going up to the Central Valley with this material. Um, you know, we can only make two trips per day. Uh, the landfill is much closer. We can make four trips per day. Uh, that actually winds up being a, a big cost. And it's a, a big uh, incentive to process the materials nearby uh, and take them to local facilities to handle that material through uh, a wastewater treatment plant anaerobic digestion. So uh, thank you very much. And I'll, I'll wait for questions. And I know uh, John will pick up, uh, pick up the food waste where I left off. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Hillary. Great job. Um, and moving on, I'm pleased to see folks are typing questions in the Q&A, and please continue to do that. And with that, I'd like to uh, welcome our uh, final speaker, uh, John Hake, uh, with the East Bay Municipal Utilities District. Uh, John serves as East Bay MUD's Resource Recovery Program Manager, overseeing the acceptance of truck, truck waste materials for treatment at the East Bay MUD wastewater plant including anaerobic digestion for energy production. He has over 30 years of experience with wastewater treatment system planning, design, and operations, including pilot treatment systems and startup of new facilities. His recent focus has been on renewable energy recovery and from organic waste. He's been involved in multiple renewable energy projects, including technology evaluations, electricity generation, and biofuels production. John has a BA in economics from Middlebury College and an MS in environmental engineering from UC Berkeley and is a registered civil engineer in California. And with that, it's uh, my great pleasure to welcome John. Great, thank you very much, Greg. Um, and yes, yeah, so um, uh, I work for the East Bay Municipal Utility District, uh, better known as East Bay Mud. And we are a joint water and wastewater agency that serves the cities of Oakland and kind of the surrounding areas. And we provide wastewater service to the cities of Oakland and Berkeley. And so we operate a large urban wastewater facility, which is located in the city of Oakland, shown in this photo on my um, opening slide. And in this presentation, I'm gonna be talking specifically about co-digestion opportunities and challenges, and in particular, um, focusing on food waste and some of the um, impacts that we see from SB 1383. And uh, I'll start just by providing a brief background on the resource recovery or R2 program as we call it in East Bay Mud. Um, before I get into talking about food waste, both the potential that we see as well as the experiences we've had at East Bay Mud um, in handling solid food waste. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about 1383 um, before concluding with uh, challenges and our next steps as we see them at East Bay Mud. So at East Bay Mud, we've, um, we have a, what I would characterize as being a very large and mature program of accepting um, trucked waste. And really when uh, we talk about resource recovery or R2 at East Bay Mud, um, really what I'm talking about is this trucked waste acceptance. And that's the, the program that I manage. And we've been doing that for over 20 years now, um, starting with some liquids like septage and over the years, installing new receiving facilities, which are shown in the photographs here on this slide, uh, over the years and expanding our capability to accept more and varied waste. Um, we're open 24-7, 365. We get between to 100 to 150 trucks every day. And most of this is liquid. Um, however, I am gonna be in this presentation really focused on uh, solids and the solid food waste. And the great benefit to accepting these materials, uh, well, one is for the high strength materials that we accept, we put them directly into our digesters. And of course that increases the biogas production. We have on-site cogen, so we're producing more electricity. Um, and, and so there's a considerable cost savings there. 
uh, for us, uh, both for the avoided cost of having to purchase power to operate our plant, um, which is considerable, and uh, as well as having a surplus, uh, which we can export on the wholesale power market and earn us uh, earn the uh, agency revenue. And over the years, as the program has grown, uh, we have accepted more waste and increased the, the amount of uh, cogeneration and electricity produced. And as you can see on this graphic, you know, if we start in 2002, at that time, we were only producing about um, uh, enough electricity to meet half of our plant demand. And today, we're well over 100%. And so, you know, more than meeting our on-site use, and we sell our power, our surplus power on the wholesale market to our neighbor, the Port of Oakland. And we've been doing that for about the last 10 years. So now I wanna shift gears and, and really talk about the solids element and food waste potential as we see it as a, as a wastewater treatment facility and uh, someone who operates digesters with the potential to take this kind of material. But just to put it in perspective relative to the rest of our program today, um, it's solid food waste is only about 4% of the high strength waste that we put into our digesters today. We take a wide range of uh, different kinds of wastewaters from various industrial and commercial facilities, dairies, wineries, breweries, uh, slaughterhouses that produce bloods. We take fat soils and greases from grease traps as well as a number of other uh, food processing uh, byproducts that we put directly um, into our digesters. So why are we really interested in food waste? And I think this is gonna echo some of what Hillary said in the prior presentation, but from the, from a, say a wastewater treatment plant perspective, we see this as material with a very high energy content, which can, produce more biogas than maybe some of the other waste streams that we accept. And I think that the key thing for us is that we see this as being a, a local waste stream. And, and Hillary said this also, but you know, some of the waste that we receive come from tens or even hundreds of miles away. And yet we, um, as a wastewater treatment facility, we serve uh, you know, a very uh, dense urban area which generates a lot of food waste that's very local and, and very near to us. And so I think in some ways it's much more sustainable to expect that, you know, these, um, that we start to accept more of this waste that's, that's closer to us and with, you know, sort of a lower hauling uh, associated with it. And of course, uh, as, you know, was mentioned earlier, uh, SB 1383 with its landfill diversion mandate is going to really drive more of this material in the future. Um, food waste is lower in nitrogen than some other categories of waste streams that we take. Some of the protein waste streams have a lot of nitrogen. And later in this presentation, I'm gonna to touch on why that's important to wastewater facilities. And, uh, you know, essentially, as I said, you know, the hauling costs, um, sometimes hauling solid materials around is gonna be because it's denser, it's going to be cheaper than hauling around liquids. So that's another consideration when we consider in what form do we accept the food waste. Um, this should look familiar uh, if you were watching Hillary's presentation. Uh, yeah, this is uh, what's called source separated material that's shown in this photograph. And these are some of the waste streams that we've accepted at East Bay Mud in the past. As you can see, there's a lot of contamination uh, associated with these waste streams, a lot of plastic bags that they come in, as well as a lot of other little surprises in there. And so here are some photographs of what that looks like at the wastewater facility when you get food waste that's got this, this level of contamination. I mean, I think it's pretty obvious that, you know, metals and plastics and grit are all going to um, are all going to present problems to you know downstream to your equipment to your pumps to your screens etc. And we've experienced a lot of this. I think one point that I want to touch on here with respect to the contamination is that I, 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 one of the things that I think we're learning at East Bay Mud is that sometimes 
you know, it may make more sense to remove contamination, maybe at the solid waste transfer station, some of these, and it might make more sense to remove others at the wastewater facility. And just as an example, I think metals and plastics can be removed from the solids when they're collected. Um, but when you're, when you're removing grit, you really have to slurry the material and make it liquid so that you can separate the grit out. And that might be better accomplished at the wastewater treatment plant where you're adding water, and slurring the material. So these are some considerations as we move ahead in terms of how we handle the contamination. And, and to me, this just kind of emphasizes the real importance of the partnerships that you establish with the folks on the solid waste side, like we're working with Hillary, uh, we work with um, folks in Contra Costa County and their Hall of Republic, and these are all folks who we partner with. And, and, and this is a really important element, I think, to you know, working through these kinds of projects. So this is just a, a brief example of how we used to do this. And um, so this is material that was uh, uh, from, uh, coming from Contra Costa County. It's dropped on the tip floor. And it, at one point in time, we were, um, we were uh, grinding the material there with the contaminants in it. And then you can see it's being offloaded at our wastewater treatment plant in, in photograph number three there. And that's, so that's solid material that's about 25 to 30% solids. It's dropped into an underground storage tank. We add water, we mix it. And so there we're slurring it, but with all the contaminants, and then we have to pump it and push it through screens, which are shown in, in um, photograph number four. And I think one of the things that we learned from you know, working with this um, is that, that some of the, the, like the screens, for example, were just not really robust enough to handle some of the contamination that we were seeing and receiving. And so as part of that partnership, um, we were working uh, uh, with Contra Costa County, and I mentioned Republic, the hauler. And, at the, uh, and so one of our ideas was, well, let's in, install maybe more robust where there's an improved technology to do separation. It's more robust, better designed to handle some of this contamination like metals. Why don't we do that at the transfer station and remove those contaminants there um, and then bring us a solid material where a lot of the metals and the plastic um, have already been removed. And that's something that we started about, uh, about a year ago. And I would say that's been very successful. Um, another thing that, that I think um, we're, we're starting to notice under SB 1383 is that some of the larger waste generators, so this might be a, like a supermarket chain or you know, institutional um, like hospital cafeterias where they generate very large amounts of food waste, have worked with private companies that can set up their own sort of pre-process there on the site. And then they can you know, do the separation and slurry the material. And so we've received some of this waste as well. Um, and we're seeing increased activity in this area um, also. So um, just briefly to summarize a few lessons learned, we think that sometimes it makes sense to remove the contamination offsite at the transfer stage. While we can handle liquids very easily, we recognize that falling around liquids where water's been added offsite and then brought to the wastewater treatment plant just incurs greater hauling costs. Um, at the same time, some, some of these contaminants might be better removed at the wastewater treatment plant. We're thinking about grit specifically there. Um, but this is all, even though we've been doing this for a long time at East Bay Mud, I think I still, in some ways, consider this early days. Technology is still developing. You know, partnerships are still exploring new ways of doing this. I mean, uh, Hillary mentioned that you know we're working together, and I didn't say anything about that in this presentation because I knew you were going to hear a lot about what's going on at SBWMA from Hillary. But that's still a different approach, and we're very open to that. And and so we're we're working with all kinds of people to try and figure out what the the best solutions are. Um, I'll just now briefly um, touch on a few elements of 1383. I know Julia covered this in um, great detail earlier. Uh, and I think one of the obvious impacts that we you know, expect to see is that those regulations are gonna have to drive more of that material to other processing facilities since they can't, since they're not supposed to be going to the landfill, they need to go to composting or anaerobic digestion. And so we're, um, I would say, 
we've been doing this for 20 years. In the last few years, we're definitely seeing an uptick and an uptick in interest for doing more anaerobic digestion of this kind of material. And um, Julia also talked about the procurement credit. And so that's going to be uh, very beneficial uh, for facilities. Uh, that's going to add some value to handling these materials and specifically for the byproducts. And energy is a byproduct of handling solid food waste. So here, this is just to give you some idea of the costs. And these are estimated costs and some of the values that we get in return for the, the byproducts shown in this graphic. Um, but it, <laughs> it, it costs a lot to handle this food waste. I mean, there's the contamination removal, then, then we incur all kinds of costs relating to chemicals for treatment. Uh, we add different chemicals for dewatering. And then that dewatered material, the, the residuals from the anaerobic digestion of the food waste, that needs to be hauled away. And so there's costs associated with that. So, I mean, this is a conservative estimate, but we think it costs, you know, in, in our estimation, based on some of the material we've received over the last year or two, we think it costs about $60 a wet ton to handle this material. Now we get some value back. Um, there's an energy value. Um, and in the next slide, I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about how that energy value looks, but we estimate we get about $6 a ton for that. And this is very preliminary um, because the procurement credits are just starting now, but we think, you know, we estimate we might get $6 for that. So, I mean, clearly there's a gap there in terms of, um, some of the value that you get for the byproducts and the cost to, to handle the food waste, which needs to be made up in the tip fee. And just to kind of emphasize the biosolids hauling aspect of this, I mean, uh, we, we've been hauling our biosolids for land application for a long time. Some of it, some of the material still goes to a landfill, especially during the wet weather season, but that's gonna have to start to go away. We, there's, there's um, in the future, because of 1383, we expect less material to go to landfill and more to land application, but that's gonna drive up the cost for the biosolids handling. And that's something that we've observed over time. So now I wanna get into some of, um, some of the challenges for doing co-digestion. And there are several topics here that I wanna just kind of go through quickly. Um, and the first one is energy prices. And I mentioned the energy value and you know, there's great energy value for avoided costs, but at this point in time, we produce more than we need. We export the power. So we're, the value that we get for any additional food waste that we accept at East Bay Mud is really tied to the wholesale market for renewable energy. And what we've seen over the last 10 years or so is generally renewable energy prices have been declining. And here in this graphic, I'm showing an example of solar pricing. But solar and wind both have been, you know, those prices have been going down. And while that's really good news for ratepayers in California, it's not such good news if you're uh, generating electricity from biogas and you're having to compete with some of these uh, technologies, which are really rapidly improving over time. So we're seeing that we get less value for the energy. So a lot of people ask us, well, why don't you do renewable natural gas or RNG, inject into the pipeline? And while that's technically feasible for us at East Bay Mud, we have a nearby gas main, but we're still seeing some challenges here that we think are significant. And the big one is a regulatory challenge. We, um, <clears throat> we know that today we operate under something called the on-site exclusion. And the minute we send any gas off-site, we lose that exclusion. And then we become subject to more stringent regulations under CalARP and CalOSHA. So that's one of our large concerns. Another concern we have is just looking out into the RNG market. You know, we see that a lot of dairy projects are starting up and dairy digestion is producing a lot of biogas that will, um, you know, start to fill gaps in that market. And it's, I think it's going to be hard for biogas that's generated at wastewater plants to compete with the dairies because they get such a, a beneficial uh, carbon intensity value. Another thing that we're going to see is has to do with nutrients. So um, today at East Bay Mud, we discharge our effluent to the San Francisco Bay, and we're not subject to any sort of nutrient limitation today. However, we know that those are coming and that our local regulator, the Regional Water Quality Control Board, is looking at nitrogen discharge to the bay. And, 
And so we know that what's coming in the next five to 10 years will be something of a load cap um, with respect to nitrogen. And so why is that a concern for co-digestion? Well, some of the nitrogen in our wastewater that we're discharging to the bay comes from the resource recovery program, including food waste. And so one, uh, one thing is that, so if we're asked to reduce nitrogen loading and we're accepting these materials, you know, we have to look at, well, um, uh, how, do we, how do we meet those nitrogen load caps? Well, one way would be to install um, technology or equipment to, um, for nutrient reduction, but that can be really expensive. That can be tens or even hundreds of millions of dollars. So if we're given a choice between, you know, potentially meeting the load cap by reducing acceptance of certain waste streams versus, you know, spending maybe a hundred million dollars on a nutrient recovery project, well, then, you know, that's something we're really going to have to think about hard. Um, and the same principle applies here with the nitrogen from a greenhouse gas emissions perspective, because um, a greenhouse, one greenhouse gas is nitrous oxide, which is emitted both from the wastewater treatment process as well as from the effluent that's discharged to the receiving water. And so the more nitrogen that we put into the wastewater treatment process, the more greenhouse gas emissions we have. And, and so that's another consideration as, as we look down the road. So uh, recognizing that there are some challenges that we're seeing, um, East Bay Mud is, is still very interested in exploring and expanding our food, food waste partnerships because we think it's a local sustainable waste stream. And so we're, we're still very much interested in working with our partners to kind of further the cause here in diverting or these organics away from landfill. But, Looking ahead, we have to recognize there are some challenges. The energy value, for one, we have to figure out a way to maximize the value of our biogas. And I'm still, um, we're still looking at various ways of doing that. And the energy markets in California, they're a very dynamic place and a lot is changing very rapidly. But so that's going to be a challenge for us as to how do we get the, the greatest value so that we can keep our tipping fees reasonable. And then lastly, um, you know, we're going to be looking at, at nutrients that we're accepting from these waste streams. And as I've just explained, you know, that's going to be a major consideration as we look down the road in the next five or 10 years. So we're going to have to align our program with, you know, some of those other goals that, that are, you know, uh, very environmentally important also. Um, so that uh, concludes my presentation. And um, maybe we can move into the questions if there are any. Thank you. Thanks so much, John. Um, excellent. Great job as always. And uh, thank you all panelists. And we can um, get into the questions and uh, answer period now. And just so folks know, uh, uh, some of the questions have been answered in the Q&A uh, feature of the uh, Zoom. Uh, but we will still go over uh, a number of those as we can, as time allows. Um, so we'll start with uh, Julia, perhaps, uh, since she started out uh, going first. Um, and just one, uh, one clarification. Uh, when you said a procurement um, product need not be a cash transaction, it can be one, though, right? It could be a cash transaction. Yes, yes, it definitely could be. Okay, great. And um, uh, we'll move on to Chris. Um, if, uh, if food waste is first co-digested and then the biosolids are composted, is there a way to sort of double count that uh, greenhouse gas reduction? Yeah, I tried to punt this to Julia in terms of uh, SB 1383 regulation um, statewide, but I did mention that we did look at biosolids application and comparison to, and compared it to composting, and we did see, we, we did include reductions accordingly for, right. our, for our GHD reduction analysis. Okay, thank you. And uh, Hillary, a question for you is, um, what materials are allowed in the residential green bins? 
uh, residential green bins, it's beef and yard waste. Uh, that's the way that program started out. And then we added food scraps. And when you talk about food scraps residentially, um, we allow them to go, the food scraps to be uh, put in a bag uh, and we want that to be a compostable bag. I think that's probably the question. So, you know, we encourage uh, uh, compostable materials that uh, are used in food service, utensils, et cetera. So that would be more in the commercial uh, usage. We're not going to see, you know, compostable utensils in residential. And, and just a follow up to that, did you have to do a lot of training to your residents when you started the uh, addition of food waste to those bins? And was that successful? Uh, it's really hard to say, Greg. It's a very good question. Um, you know, I think it's twofold. Uh, your question is, um, when you ask residents to do something, what do you want them to do? <laughs> um, you want them to put their food waste in a bin and uh, separate that from the solid waste. And then you want them to do that uh, well, so they're not putting contamination into the organics. Um, I'd say uh, both are, are very, very, very hard to control. Um, I, I think that the residential food waste program is uh, poorly used. And uh, I have no way to document this because it's just you know a, a plate of pasta mixed in with a, with a, a you know, 64 gallon container of yard waste. So how do you possibly do the measurements there? Uh, but you know, just looking at back at the weight increases, you know, historically the trend data, uh, I see very little change in the quantity of material coming in. It's hard to find food waste in the residential program. So I honestly think that these residential food waste programs are not very successful at capturing food waste from residential customers, unfortunately. And then, uh, boy, contamination is just, you know, every time you're handling food waste, there's plastic involved. And that just winds up in the product. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and John, uh, one for you, when, when you have to add liquid to your um, feedstock that you get, uh, food waste feedstock, do you add um, that liquid as sludge or as effluent or potable water or what do you use for slurrying? We're, um, we're adding secondary effluent. So it's treated okay. wastewater from the plant. We, we would, yeah, we would not use potable water for, for that purpose. Okay. And um, going back to uh, Julia, um, uh, here's one that if a uh, jurisdiction hires, say, a tree trimming outfit um, who tree, trims trees and creates a mulch product, um, for that jurisdiction to either use themselves or to give away, uh, can that count toward their procurement uh, requirement? So the answer uh, to that is probably not. And that is because mulch has to be produced at specified uh, facilities that are outlined in the regulations. And if it's not produced there, then it will not count towards a jurisdiction's procurement target. Okay. Um, and, um, Another one for Chris. Uh, do you know if the new Infrastructure Act, the recently signed by President Biden, includes federal dollars for co-digestion or anaerobic digestion, biogas use, and or biosolids? Uh, I'd have to look more deeply into the infrastructure bill, but there are a couple of promising programs, including the Wastewater Efficiency Grant Pilot Program, which is a waste to energy program. And also, of course, the Clean Water Infrastructure Resilience and Sustainability Program, which is pretty broad, but also includes enhancement of energy efficiency or the use and generation of recovered and renewable energy. And I guess that I would just add to that, I know that there are you know, the significant money in the act for wastewater infrastructure. And I would assume that all of these would count as that infrastructure that's a need. Uh, so I would expect that there will be a lot of eligibility. Um, another request for you, Chris, was to provide the link to the uh, capacity analysis report. And I see you did that in the Q&A section. 
so folks can uh, access that there. Uh, we also have it on our CASA website as well. Um, and moving back to Hillary, uh, what are the major contaminants that you remove in your pre-processing and where do those contaminants go? Yeah, uh, boy, plastic, plastic, plastic. I mean, it's just, uh, um, the, the, uh, and, and when we talk about plastic, what type of plastic, it's plastic film. Uh, the, the problem is, you know, by weight, uh, plastic film is is uh, nothing, right? It's just, uh, just so light. So uh, if you want to try to quantify contamination, uh, percentage by weight is typically done in the industry, but it's not a good measure uh, because uh, you can have an awful lot of plastic film and it weighs very little compared to wet food waste. Um, the other materials that I mentioned um, that are heavier are the grit that comes out of the out of the um, slurry. Uh, it's probably equal by weight to the plastic, but the plastic waste coming out is you know uh, eight times the volume of the grit. So uh, again, I just caution people about using weight as a measure of quantification of contamination. Yeah, thanks. And uh, John, back to you. Um... The Public Utilities Commission is expected to release a uh, final decision to um, implement SB 1440. And in their draft decision, at least, which we think will carry over, they prioritize biogas from wastewater treatment plants and who do co-digestion as a top priority uh, to have the IOUs procure uh, that biogas through pipeline injection. Do you see that as changing the landscape for East Bay Mud in terms of making injection a more viable option? Yeah, that's a, a great question. And I, unfortunately, I haven't followed 1440 as closely as I would like. Um, but I, yeah, I, I, the short answer is I do think it will definitely be beneficial. Um, you know, I mentioned in my presentation about the dairy digesters and the competition from, you know, that biogas. And so certainly I think 1440 will be very beneficial in stimulating additional demand that's not, you know, contingent on like, a, a, say, a CI value. Um, right. So, yeah, uh, absolutely. Great. Um, and we can go back to uh, Julia. Um, Article two in the 1383 regs uh, mentions paralysis, um, but the product of paralysis, biochar, is not included as an organic product. Um, is there, how is biochar viewed, I guess, on this uh, organic landscape? Um, so I wasn't completely sure what the question was. Um, so if it's, more about procurement and whether biochar can be procured as an organic waste uh, product. No, biochar is not listed as an eligible product. Um, and then regarding Article 2, my understanding is it's not, pyrolysis is not listed in Article 2. Um, so anything not listed um, as constituting a reduction in landfill disposal is automatically deemed landfill disposal. And they would have to submit um, like the application to um, determine otherwise. So hopefully that answers that question. Yes, thank you. Um, and then uh, this is one that might be out of um, our scope of uh, uh, expertise, but Chris, do you know if uh, there are any carbon credits um, provided for methane produced from digesting dairy manure? That is a little bit outside of the scope of the report uh, that yeah. I know of. I'm not sure how the carbon credits may work for dairy digesters. I'm not, is anyone else on the panel now? <laughs> I, I know they get tremendous benefit for the low carbon fuel standard. Um, you know, those are incredibly low CI values, um, but I don't know about carbon credits. Um, that's great. And um, 
uh, Hillary, um, a question for you is whether or not you do any messaging on the use of garbage disposals for your residential customers. Mm. And if so, what that messaging would be. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. Um, and this kind of highlights one of the points that I made in my presentation. Um, you know, is food waste a solid waste or is it uh, something that should go down the sewer? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I, I, I think <laughs> I think it's a debate and uh, it's probably a debate within the wastewater treatment plant, uh, wastewater sphere. Um, but, uh, you know, if it's a solid waste, we're, we're gonna try to handle it. If it comes in the solid waste stream, we're gonna try to handle it. Uh, we don't wanna tell people to put it down the wastewater, to, down the sewer, uh, because as I understand it, it just causes problems in pipes and plumbing. But, um, you know, it, it could be that the, uh, the state and the localities decide to message the communities um, the, the residents and the businesses to not put it in the solid waste programs, but to put all food waste down the drain. And that might, I'd like, I guess I'd like to hear what, uh, what the wastewater folks think of that. Yeah, it's an interesting uh, discussion, but I, I do think that they are generally accepted. However, uh, not in all jurisdictions. <clears throat> um, going back to you, John, uh, not something that was overly touched on in your presentation, but you did mention the acceptance of slaughterhouse waste and uh, grocery store waste. And if those wastes uh, contain meat, are there requirements that you have to meet under CDFA? And if so, what are they and are they um, reasonable? Um, well, so I see two parts there. So first for the food waste is the, the, is the meat that's contained in there. My understanding, and you, you may know better than I do, Greg, but I think that that's considered incidental and that doesn't trigger any sort of special CDFA requirements if it's sort of a broad commercial food waste. Right, and if it's from cafeterias and it's plate scrapes, uh, that yeah. sort of thing, it does not require anything, you're right. Yeah. Okay. So, but then the other part of it was the, the blood waste. And so, yes, that does, um, our, our first, uh, one of our first partnerships from a regulatory perspective was with the CDFA to accept uh, uh, bloods from slaughterhouses and to anaerobically digest those. And so we studied that very carefully with CDFA and kind of established that anaerobic digestion is a very suitable alternative um, for handling those wastes. And I think today, if you're a wastewater facility that's looking to handle that kind of material, um, you would be required to um, apply for a rendering permit and pay an annual fee and be subject to an annual inspection. But honestly, I don't see that, at least in our case, I don't see that as being very onerous. It's just kind of checking in with the agency once a year, how they might stop by to look at things, uh, not, not a big deal in my mind. Great. Appreciate that. And I, I understand there are only a few wastewater plants who currently are licensed under CDFA. I expect that will increase as 1383 is implemented. So it's good to know that you don't view it as overly onerous. Um, and Julia, I think we have time for one more round, perhaps. And luckily, we got a lot of questions. So great job. Um, so for uh, Julia, can farmers or agricultural material uh, brokers uh, be direct service providers uh, for the procurement? So for this one, uh, because brokers typically buy from compost facilities and then sell to end users, and they're most likely not using the product directly themselves, brokers themselves would likely not be eligible to be the direct service provider that's referred to in the regulations. However, they can serve an important role by arranging the direct service provider relationship between the end user, so a farmer, for example, and the jurisdiction. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, let's see. In, uh, uh, 
for Chris, th this is one that may also be outside of um, your scope, but I'm wondering whether it's economic to treat, um, say, diverted organic waste in anaerobic digestion um, and at the same time use a gasifier for the inorganic waste, uh, you know, having two treatment options there. Or would it be more economical to have a gasifier treat both the organic and inorganic fractions? Do you have any sense on that? Yeah, I don't. We don't. We didn't cover that in the report in terms of our economic analysis. That is a good question. I think a big thing to consider is all the regula regulatory processes that would be involved with that, and include that in an economic analysis of that. Okay. Um, and uh, I think that that was it for um, Hillary. I think that you're off the hook. Uh, um, John, one more for you. Just uh, a question as to what you do with your resulting biosolids and uh, in terms of where they go and, and how they are used from co-digestion. Um, well, you know, Historically, we've had two outlets that we we've, we've um, gone to for our, you know, for biosolids, and and the first one that we we try to use as much as we can is land application, and usually to agricultural lands, um, mostly in the region uh, Central Valley area, not far from our plant, and so, um, and but there are times um, like during wet weather when there are restrictions on land application and so in some instances we've had to go to a landfill and use it as alternative daily cover or ADC as it's called. And so we've done both of those for a long time and we are trying as much as we can to move away from the ADC and toward the land application. Um, as well as look at you know potentially other alternatives for you know. Um, further processing the the, um, uh, the biosolids so that they might not have the same restrictions that they have today and could be land applied under other circumstances. Great. Well, thank you all very much uh, for a great panel, uh, great information and uh, insight you provided. And with that, I can uh, turn it back to Dan, but thank you all very much. Dan? Thank you very much, uh, Greg, and thanks to the panel. It was very informing and um, a lot of work going on in the Bay Area, as uh, as you folks have uh, stated that. So uh, right now we're going to take a 15 minute break. I will put up. Um, no, it looks like it's already there. This is good. Um, so the next session will be uh, session eight. Eight, uh, six, excuse me, research on bioresources uh, products to build healthy soils, uh, moderated by Dr. Uh, Ruhong Zhang. And uh, we will, I'll be introducing her at 11 a.m. when we get restarted. In the meantime, uh, we have a 15 minute break. Look forward to seeing you on the other side of the break.
Have it hung or is your panel ready to go? Yes, ready to go. Great. Hello, everyone. We're back and ready to go with uh, session number six, research and um, on bioresource products to build healthy soil. This session will be moderated by Dr. Ruhong Zhang. And I want to tell you just a little bit about Dr. Zhang. She's a professor of, at the University of California and uh, Davis, and a world-renowned expert in the fields of bioenvironmental engineering and bioenergy systems engineering. Dr. Zhang's innovative research and development in the fields of bioenergy and waste and wastewater treatment has been recognized with many awards and has been widely reported by national and international news media. Dr. Zhang re received environmental award from the U.S. EPA in 2007, Achievement Award from California Bioresources Alliance in 2013, and Clean Tech Innovator of the Year from Sacramento Regional Technology Alliance, SARTA, in 2014. She was elected as a fellow of the American Society of Agricultural and Biological Engineers in 2016. I hand you over in the capable hands of Ruhong Zhang, and she and her students and uh, staff have been helping us with the um, this whole uh, Zoom webinar, so as well as the planning. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zhang, and uh, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Dan for a very nice introduction and uh, welcome to the session, research on bioresources products and to build a healthy soil. For this session, we have convened the three excellent speakers to share their knowledge on the technologies and applications for transforming organic residuals into biofertilizer products and applying these uh, biofertilizer products to build uh, healthy soils and produce uh, food and agricultural products. And I would like to um, remind you, and we will um, yeah, use a, a, a QA feature as we go through the presentations. If you can um, note the, your questions down, now we'll have our speakers to answer them as we go. And we'll have a few minutes in the end of the session to um, yeah and yeah to answer questions uh, that are not answered uh, during the session. Uh, with the, that, I wanted to introduce our first speaker. It's um, my great uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Tyler Bardzi. Um, Tyler is a SIM professor in the Department of Biosystems and uh, Culture Engineering at the University of Kentucky. And he works at UC Davis, so recently moved to uh, University of Kentucky. Um, he, uh, Tyler obtained his uh, Bachelor of Science degree in uh, Biosystem Engineering from Clemson University and uh, his uh, MS and PhD degrees in Biological Systems Engineering from UC Davis before joining, um, before he moved to 
uh, University of Kentucky. He also worked as a postdoctor scholar um, at UC Davis. And he's a research focus on development of circular bioeconomy, especially through the applications of from bioprocess engineering and fermentation to produce sustainable fuels, and fertilizers, food ingredients, and other high value bioproducts. Tyler, please, welcome. Thank you so much, Professor Zhao, for the kind introduction. Yes, um, thank you all. I'm so happy to uh, be here with you. Hopefully you can see my screen. Um, so uh, yes, my name is Tyler Barzi and I'm an assistant professor in the Biosystems and Agricultural Engineering Department at University of Kentucky. And as Professor John mentioned, I previously was working at UC Davis for the past seven years um, before I came out here uh, in Professor John's lab. And so I'm going to talk to you today about um, some projects that we uh, did there, specifically focused on digestate-derived biofertilizers and looking at their, uh, the economics of producing these and uh, touching on a little bit of their environmental implications. Uh, so first, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the co-authors of this uh, work, so some of which are on the call here, uh, Hossein Adalati, Hamed El Mashad. Brian Jenkins, Josh Rapport, and uh, Ray Hong Zhang. Also, I'd like to acknowledge the funding for this work came from the, uh, the California Department of Food and Agriculture. All right, so uh, I am an engineer, so I like to start out these presentations looking at the big picture here of what the National Academy of Engineering um, sees as the grand challenges for engineers in the 21st century. And, uh, these are not going to be new to anybody on the call, um, but it's interesting to see the uh, perspective here. So uh, one of which is managing the nitrogen cycle. The next is about carbon sequestration. We've got economical solar energy. And lastly, providing clean water. So these are four out of 14 grand challenges that the Academy uh, presented. And as with most of the presenters at this symposium, uh, you know, we're drawing a connection here of commonality among all of these things here, specifically in the utilization and management of uh, the bad word waste, um, which they're not really waste, but um, well, they're not, they're, they are waste until we find something beneficial to do with them, I guess. Um, so that's the a bigger picture of, of uh, this presentation. So uh, more specifically, I'm going to be talking about anaerobic digestion. And as everybody's heard on the call today, uh, digesters are around. They're um, operating in California successfully. This is a process of actual biological and fermentation-based process to uh, create biogas and renewable energy. But one other part of the equation for digesters is that they produce digestate, the in this case, liquid effluent of digesters that is rich in nutrients and does potentially pose uh, problems or challenges for facilities looking to uh, distribute this material in their geographical region. So we're here focused on looking at the uh, upgrading of digestate into more valuable fertilizer products um, that are suitable for many applications and potentially uh, reducing some environmental impacts uh, that we can see with this material. So uh, the talk is about uh, biofertilizers here. So I'm going to just introduce what biofertilizers are first. So right in the name of biofertilizer is biology, fertilizer meaning nutrition. So these, uh, the scientific definition of a biofertilizer is actually a kind of hairy topic, depending on who you're talking to, an agronomist or an engineer and so forth. But suffice it to say that there is uh, a need for some biology in this material, as well as the delivery of nutrition or a plant growth promoting properties. So the mode of action of biofertilizers is really wide and they can do everything from uh, 
fixing nitrogen out of the atmosphere, mobilizing and soluble, solubilizing nutrients to the roots of plants, uh, and so forth. If you'd like to get more background in uh, all the different types of biofertilizers, I'll direct you to the box at the bottom there for an excellent uh, chapter um, about this in agronomy. Biofertilizers, when you buy them, come in different formulations. So there's solid biofertilizers, there's liquid biofertilizers, there's uh, biofertilizers that are encapsulated with some kind of polymers, and there's some biology or enzyme um, material inside of that that is released slowly, so forth. In this uh, panel, you'll hear about granules and pellets. I'm going to be talking about pellets as well as some uh, liquid fertilizer uh, formulations. And so uh, the common uh, biofertilizer microorganisms are relating to many different things, but uh, they commonly are looking at transforming or fixing nitrogen um, in the soil, also about working with phosphorus and potassium to solubilize and mobilize those nutrients to the roots of the plants. And you see on the screen some genera of microorganisms um, including your arbuscular mycorrhiza and other bacteria and fungi uh, microbes that are notable for doing this. And uh, one impo important note here is that digestate does contain several of these genera and uh, can be used as a biofertilizer, not just for delivering mineralized nutrients directly to the plants, but also for uh, the microbial action in the, in the soil. So I put together this table for some market prices of various solid and liquid organic and uh, inorganic fertilizers. And I'm not going to talk about every row on this table, but suffice it to say that there's a wide range in the types of materials you can buy, whether they're solids or liquids, the nutrient content of them, as well as the cost. And in that cost column uh, right here, you see a wide range, um, and that is because there's different markets for this. So depending on the market that you're working with, you can go from uh, selling the product for a very low price, um, especially in the case of urea ammonium nitrate there at the bottom, which is UAN, um, only a dollar per pound of nitrogen, um, versus uh, if you're going into a garden, um, gardening type of market, um, that clearly is, is very different. So anyway, in our specific project here, we're looking at the uh, pilot production and application of digestate biofertilizer materials. And for this uh, project, we were looking at uh, food waste, mixed food waste and dairy manure that were uh, feedstocks to two commercial anaerobic digesters in California. We took those materials and then put them through an integrated processing system that created these biofertilizer products for us. And that contained things like coarse solids removal, um, a containerized membrane filtration system, which was essentially an ultrafiltration step. From the ultrafiltration, we have a permeate, which is this yellowish brownish liquid uh, that's mostly clear, but does have a little bit of color there. Um, that we did deliver through drip fertigation lines to uh, tomato crops. And then the concentrate from this contains a lot of very small particles and a lot of nutrients actually. Um, and that material we uh, dried down and created these solid products that we then put through a hammer mill and finally into a pelletizer before applying to fields as well. So two things that played into the background of this economic analysis that I'm going to be presenting was first about designing and then delivering these products and testing their capabilities in, in agriculture. So first was about designing customized uh, biofertilizer products by really looking at this complex digestate material that has particles of all different sizes, looking at those different particle sizes 
and uh, analyzing where the nutrients were, where the salts are, and things like that. Ultimately coming up with particle size distributions and nutrient and element distributions, which all could play into formulations of different products for different crops or different soil conditions and uh, so forth. So that was the first thing we did. And I, again, direct you to the box at the bottom for our paper on that if you'd like to learn more. The second part here of the previous work was about delivering those products to, in this case, uh, processing tomato crops. And uh, this was in California and Davis at the Russell Ranch Sustainable Agriculture Facility. And uh, we delivered this in a farm scale or field scale trial and really found very promising results that we were able to get similar or greater yields when using the uh, digestate biofertilizers compared to our mineral fertilizer, which was our UAN, urea ammonium nitrate, uh, synthetic fertilizer control. And uh, again, I'll direct you to the box at the bottom to, to learn more from this particular paper. But so all of that was really good and it played into our uh, goal to then look at the uh, economic properties of these products and really just find out, well, all, we need all of this energy, we need all of this equipment to make these products, how much do we have to sell them for in order to break even? So the overall goal was to get at that very question. And there were two objectives here for uh, conducting first our pilot scale uh, tests and uh, looking at food waste and dairy manure digestates to produce the products, characterize them, get some primary data there. And then second, to really perform the economic analysis and try to expand it to similarly designed systems that could be implemented at digesters of, of, of different capacities. So first off, some results on the nutrient composition of our biofertilizer products. So the first two columns here are for liquid products that looked very much like this uh, yellowish liquid at the bottom. And what you see from that is it's a very dilute product, uh, but the nutrients that are there are highly mineralized. For instance, in both cases, the most of the nitrogen, I think somewhat somewhere north of 90% of the total nitrogen is in the ammonium form that's directly available to the plants when you apply it. And then moving to the right-hand side, we have the uh, pellets that we made. These were solid products. And an important thing to note here is the nitrogen content was between about four and 5% on a wet basis, which was uh, good for us because that was essentially the uh, the bottom of what farmers are are willing to accept and, and pay for for their fertilizer uh, products. So um, that was a good result for us as well. And of course, it also contained quite a bit of organic matter and other macro and micronutrients. So the actual process of doing this economic model, uh, like all models really is just about doing equations and calculations using uh, the things that you see in the middle of the screen. But outside of that, there are just inputs and outputs. And here our output was looking for a break-even biofertilizer selling price specifically for the pelletized products. So some things of note here were that uh, this model did assume that the digester and processing system would be co-located, so not a central facility taking digestate from multiple digesters. Um, it was also assumed that four months per year uh, would exist each year where we have to use active drying exclusively using natural gas, just due to the climate conditions of California. And then lastly, that the main product would be pelletized um, biofertilizer products, and that the liquid or permeate from that ultrafiltration step would be sold at the cost of transport. That's sort of a controversial assumption there, especially in California, um, because of the value of, of water there, but what we uh, performed here really represents a, a conservative case. All right, so first off, for uh, transportation, 
uh, as you uh, many on the call are very much aware, uh, transportation has fixed costs and variable costs, and there's a regional dependency for this. So when trying to do this model, we had to define where we were going to be looking at. So here in the table below, you can see uh, costs of, for liquids and solids um, from various parts of the world, mostly Europe and Canada and some various places in the US. For this study, we did use the bottom row that uh, you see at the, in bold at the bottom of the screen. Uh, that is the average of two um, quotes that we got from haulers in, in California. So those were the costs that we uh, used for this model. And then a lot of other model inputs here were that uh, first for all capital expenses, we looked at uh, amortizing them over a 20 year loan period at a discount rate of about 8%. You can see the electricity and natural gas costs that went for the different unit operations, as well as things like land and labor. Um, all of that was taken into consideration in the model. You can see the sources for each of those numbers um, as well. So here are example capital and operating costs kind of added all together for different operations for an example facility treating 10,000 gallons of digestate per day. This was considered the base case for the model. And uh, to put that in perspective, 10,000 gallons per day is about what the UC Davis Renewable Energy Anaerobic Digester uh, produces each day um, of operation. It's a 50 ton per day food waste digester. So breaking this down, uh, you see the, the really big ticket items here are really the membrane filtration and active drying systems. That was expected because these are notoriously really expensive operations. Um, and you, you can see the other secondary uh, costs um, in, the, in the table as well. So to uh, put some results up here, um, so in the top right figure, you can see the total annualized costs in terms of dollars per year um, that a facility would need to pay to uh, buy the equipment to operate the processing plant and so forth. And the, the colored lines all relate to different parts of the unit operations, so separation and drying and so forth. And you see how those change for processing plants of different capacities. So the uh, bottom one here is about uh, 30 uh, cubic meters per day of processing capacity. That is the UC Davis Renewable Energy Anaerobic Digester case. A 1,000 or 2,000 head dairy might fit somewhere um, in here, um, around 100. And then moving out to 300 up here, that's pretty much the largest digester um, that I could find in the world. Um, the other important thing to see from this graph is the uh, notable gray line. It's a little bit different than the others, and that's because it's uh, normalized by the amount of digestate that it's processing. So here you're seeing the economy of scale. So as you scale up, each of your dollars pays for you know, more um, relatively, and that's what you're seeing there. So uh, in the bottom, part here, you can see the share of the annualized cost. So again, the separation and active drying are uh, making up about 80% of the total annualized costs. Um, and one note here is that the milling and pelletizing equipment um, only included the mills themselves, and there might be other things relating to conveying, cooling, and packaging um, that were difficult to include in this model due to lack of a good data for that, but those costs would likely uh, increase those numbers slightly. Um, it's the lowest cost um, that you see here, but um, it would have an impact. And uh, to gain some insight into what the impacts of that would be, we did perform a sensitivity analysis at the end of this, which I'll show you in a second. All right, so the real uh, 
important result here is, well, this is how much all of this stuff costs, but how much do I have to sell the products for in order to break even? So the break even costs here ranged between six and $11 per kilogram of macronutrient, um, which is about three to $5 per pound of, of nutrient. And that does fall within the, uh, the California agricultural solid organic fertilizer market, um, which is the yellow portion here. Mineral fertilizers like UAN are cheap and they represent this lower bound here, um, whereas the upper bounds here are for garden and nursery uh, based fertilizer applications. So smaller scales, depending on the type of product you hear, you see for the dairy manure, it's got less nutrients in it. So um, it's indicating it might need to go into a more niche market um, than some of uh, the, like for instance, the food waste. Uh, pellets, which had higher nutrient content. Um, and also you see the economy of scale here that you really kind of get to some diminishing returns um, for uh, capacities greater than about 100 cubic meters per day. So that's uh, good news. It shows that there's likely a market for this. Um, so what we did next was we chose a desired selling price of these products. So here we just chose um, the lower bound of the upper 25% of the agricultural uh, market and uh, picked about $9 per kilogram of NPK as our desired sale price. And if you draw a line across the graph like this, then wherever the uh, these intersect with that line are basically the economic limits. That if you have a digester that's smaller than that, you're going to have to sell the product for more than this desired sale price in order to break even or have any chance at making profit. And you can do that, you can pick any desired sale price and do that same uh, procedure there. So the last results I wanted to talk about here um, were about transportation. So it's an important question. What we're trying to do is uh, to make these products easier to transport farther away from the digester so the digester doesn't have to be applying all this stuff in the direct vicinity around it. Um, and these are the results. So similar to the uh, graph before, we have in the bottom left-hand side the uh, pellets and the economic limits are reflected there of about 70 to 90 um, cubic meters per day of, of plant capacity being um, anything below that basically gives you a negative feasible transport distance, which is just uh, saying that in order to transport that product anywhere, you're going to have to charge more for it to justify that expense. Whereas everything that's above this origin um, or axis, the x-axis here, uh, is economical at that $9 per pound of, or per kilogram of NPK um, chosen price. And you can see that for large capacities, you can actually uh, feasibly transport this uh, material quite far, assuming that you can get that $9 or $8.8 .8 per kilogram of NPK price that somebody is willing to pay that for. So on the right hand side, uh, we have the liquid product results. And again, this shows you the uh, feasible transport distance as a function of the price that you need to charge for this. So uh, that product is assumed to be uh, transported at the cost of production. And so you need to charge somewhere between three and $4.3 um, to justify, ju justify transportation of that material offsite. Um, and that price is higher than a UAN product, but again, does not take into consideration other potential values uh, there, such as water. Right. And uh, just to touch on the sensitivity analysis that I mentioned, uh, it's an important part of doing these types of analyses that you look at how well um, it's, it's actually getting what you want, which is we're trying to describe the actual costs of a system like this. So we look at the, uh, if we change any inputs to this model, so how much things cost, um, by 
a certain amount, how much does that change the break even price um, for the pellets that we have to sell? Well, um, what you can see from this is that there's very high sensitivity to uh, this curve right here, this curve right here, and then this one, the most sensitive. Those are nutrient content, plant capacity, and the capital cost of the equipment. So this is where things like the capital cost of the pelletizing equipment, if you need to build a building or conveying um, equipment, coolers, and so forth, that's where that comes in. Uh, so the lowest sensitivity operations here were for the land and concrete pad costs. Um, so to really optimize your uh, fertilizer system, you can increase your nutrient content of the fertilizer, um, keep those nutrients in there, don't let your nitrogen volatilize out, um, utilize an adequate scale and don't get too large, but don't be too small either, um, and then decrease the uh, capital costs um, as much as possible, which I know is easier said than done, especially um, these days with, with the supply chain. Um, so the last part that I wanted to touch on here was about the potential environmental impacts of this. Since they are biofertilizer products, um, they do have uh, environmental impacts. And uh, the first thing that I wanted to talk about was in relation to fertilizer uh, production from fossil sources. So uh, mineral fertilizers are actually quite energy um, and greenhouse gas intensive operations. And I've got a statistic here for the GHG emissions of about seven and a half kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalents per kilogram of nitrogen for uh, the ammonium nitrate um, product in the US. So we can use that as a baseline to judge you know, how well or poorly our biofertilizers are performing on a GHG basis. So to do that, look at uh, the case study of the UC Davis Renewable Anaerobic Digester, um, like I've been mentioning other parts here. So a, a life cycle assessment was completed on this facility in uh, the year 2017 and came up with a number of about 5.4 grams of carbon dioxide equivalents per megajoule of electricity delivered and uh, relate that to the California grid and it's about four to five times less. Additionally, if we then divide that number by all of the nitrogen that's coming through that facility from the feedstock, ultimately ending up in the digestate, we get a number of 1.6 kilograms, uh, whoop, uh, kilograms of CO2 equivalents per kilogram of nitrogen. And we will compare this number to the ammonium nitrate um, number and see it's about six times uh, lower than that. So uh, this is good news, means that there's likely GHG benefits also to uh, this fertilizer offsetting um, the synthetic fertilizer. But again, to note, this really needs a full LCA. That's a lower bound and does not include other emissions that could potentially come from this processing uh, system. So uh, just wanted to be completely transparent about that. So it's a lower bound there but still very uh, promising. Uh, and lastly, talking about nutrients and soil. So uh, this, especially the pelletized biofertilizer product does allow the opportunity to export the nutrients farther away from the digester, potentially reducing nutrient loadings to sensitive areas. We've all heard about uh, places in the, the Central Valley struggling with this um, and so forth. At the same time, as was uh, very well demonstrated in one of the sessions yesterday, these products also can supplement synthetic fertilizer use and build healthy soils from the microbes that the, they're delivering there um, and other micronutrients that are not really being uh, delivered by synthetic fertilizers um, in many cases. All right, so in conclusion, um, we came up with a, a really good pelletized biofertilizer product that had a lot of um, uh, content, a high content of macronutrients, but also uh, beneficial microbes in there. We came up with uh, the cost ranges for the break-even sale prices based on how much each unit operation in this system cost. And we then looked at where the solids and liquids could be transported, how far away and how much we would need to charge for them to justify 
that. And in conclusion, the, uh, there does seem to be uh, significant benefits to doing this, especially com when compared to synthetic fertilizers and the other uh, beneficial things that di anaerobic digesters are uh, delivering in, in terms of renewable energy and uh, waste uh, diversion and, and so forth. Uh, so here's all the references and I will uh, include this slide on uh, online so you can click everything there, but I uh, just want to thank you very much for your time and um, you can contact me, uh, feel free to contact me at my email or visit my labs website there and I'll be happy to uh, take questions from you either in the uh, Q&A or at the end of the session. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tyler. That was an excellent presentation. I do see several questions posted. If you can uh, answer um, those or some of those, we'll move into next uh, presentation. And our next speaker is Abdul Hossein uh, Idaladi. I'll call him Hossein. Hossein is currently uh, pursuing his PhD degree in the Department of Biological and Agriculture Engineering Department at the University of California, Davis. Um, Hussein is an expert in bioenergy and byproduct manufacturing and healthy soils. He um, obtained his uh, Bachelor of Science degree in Biosystem Engineering from UC Davis and his Master's degree in Biomedical Engineering from University of California, Irvine. And his research focus has been waste management, recouping value in food waste and agricultural residues by recycling them back on the farm. And uh, his projects include producing concentrated, well-manufactured biofertilizers from uh, digestate, um, studying efficacy uh, and efficiency of solid separators. Um, technologies on California dairies and quantifying the methane emission potential reduction from dairy manure lagoons. And uh, most recently, and uh, uh, he has been working on this project on recycling dairy manure and almond biomass from orchards, from processors, uh, back onto the farm, especially almond orchards. And it's, uh, so I'd like to have Hossein. Welcome, Hossein. Thank you, Professor Zhang. Thank you for that introduction. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Hossein Adalati. I'm, I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about the pelletization and application of composted dairy manure and almond woody biomass. Um, and I, I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple of projects, but um, the main project that I'll be presenting, the, the PI is Professor Hong Zhang, who's my advisor, and the co-PIs are Dr. Patrick Brown, Sat Darshan Khalsa, um, Dr. Frank Loner, and Dr. Pramod Pandey. And um, many uh, uh, members have worked on this project, including um, Dr. Hamid Al-Mashid, who's in our, the Zhang lab, myself, Ika Chen, um, Dr. Ika Chen, Alan Chiu, and Dr. Tyler Barsi. I also wanted to thank our sponsors and collaborators. Our sponsors were the Almond Board of California, the California Dairy Research Foundation, and a uh, big sponsor has been the CDFA, the Healthy Soils Program, and the Alternative Manure Management Program, um, and the collaborating farms, um, Wickstrom Dairy and Van Ruler Orchards, who we've been conducting research Research, um, on their farms and the help of a lot of industry collaborators who've helped us um, make this um, farm scale project possible. So some facts about the California dairy and almond industries um, that I'm sure many of you are well aware of. The dairy industry is the number one ag commodity in the state uh, with 6.4 billion in, in sales um, in 2019. It uh, produces about 19% of the U.S. milk and cheese production. It's the number three agricultural export in California. Um, and out of the 5.2 million um, uh, cattle in California, 2.5 million are part of the dairy industry, 1.7 million are milking cows. And the almond industry is the number three commodity um, for California um, with $5.5 billion in sales. And uh, the the California almond industry produces 100% of U.S.'s almonds, um, according to the California Ag Statistical uh, Statistics Review, and 78% of the world pop production of almonds. It's the number one ag export um, of California, and 
of the 24 million acres farmed in California, 1.4 million acres are dedicated to um, almond orchards. Some challenges that these industry uh, industries face. So the dairy industry is obviously very concentrated. Some a fact that several panelists have talked about. But since the 80s, that concentration has increased by about six or more fold, and the average uh, dairy farm is now about 1,250 um, cows or larger, milking cows or larger. Um, these farms generate a ton of manure in a very localized area. It impacts our air and water quality, and um, in addition to that, it's just a tough regulatory and business environment in California for, for the dairy for dairy farmers to operate in. Um, the almond industry um, has several challenges. Um, um, almonds uh, are a water intensive crop. They they uh, one of their goals is to reduce water usage for almond cultivation. Um, the waste and the residues generated in the orchards are uh, something that needs to be considered in terms of what to do with them. There's um, the issue of how to how to have uh, pest management uh, while using less chemicals and orchards can generate dust, especially during harvest uh, season. So specifically, I want to address the waste streams on dairies and the, the main two waste streams are dairy manure and sticks and twig waste from almond processors, which was something that was brought to our attention as a problem for many almond processors because on uh, the orchard, um, they can ground them out, they, they can reapply them, but once they get to, once these sticks and twigs go to the processor, there's kind of very little they can do with them. There's also issues with the cleanliness of this material. And so finding uh, beneficial uses for these two materials um, offsite is kind of what we were looking at with, the, with these projects. So just to look at kind of a generalized manure management system diagram on California dairies, um, a lot of dairies operate on a flush manure management system, which means that um, a lot of manure is generated in the uh, barns and then is conveyed by water and corrals. It's um, usually just excreted and is is uh, in a more solid form. But in the in the barns, um, in the freestyle barns where the cows uh, reside, they're flushed using usually 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 uh, lagoon water, but sometimes fresh water. Um, and then it's conveyed, M many farms have solid separation systems. And so they're eventually conveyed to um, lagoons. Uh, um, and if we look at um, the manure management system on Wickstrom Dairy that we uh, worked on, it has a very unique manure management system. Um, it uses a, a, a dairy tech system that uses rotary drum separators and um, what happens is this water comes into the first stage, rotary drum, which is a coarse um, separator. Some solids get removed, and then the water go into a settling tank. Um, and this settling tank um, allows for the, the, the particles to settle down, and then the, the sludge at the bottom of this tank is then diverted to a second, finer rotary drum separator, which then removes some more, more solids. Um, and this is a kind of an overview of what, what this separator system looks like. Um, we decided to work with these solids because they're, uh, they're, they're pretty clean. Um, they have less sand than most of the other sources of, of manure. It, like for example, if you dredge out uh, lagoon solids, you'll probably dredge out a lot of sand. In the corral, there's a lot of sand. So this is kind of a big source of manure on this farm. Um, that's easy to, to and readily available to, to treat. And if uh, you look, the, the coarse solids are particles above 3.1 millimeter. That's the screen size in those rotary drum separators. And the fine solids are uh, over half a millimeter. Um, on this farm, um, the, the coarse solids are composted or they're subjected to ad advanced solar drying, which means they're laid out in a fine layer, um, allowed to dry and then packed up and that's used for bedding. Um, per day, in, on a typical day in, in the fall, several years ago, that was about 60,000 pounds wet. Um, and the fine solids were about 100,000 pounds wet on a, on a day in a fall several years ago. And so the fine solids are, are used as bedding, but the farmer also um, composts them and land, supply, land applies a lot of it to um, off-site off land. 
The other waste stream that I want to talk about is uh, almond processor waste, the stick and twigs from the processors. And so orchard debris is on average about 13% of the field weight of material brought to the processor. A lot of that debris isn't clean. It consists of dirt, pebbles, rocks, twigs. Um, it doesn't have a lot of value. It can take a lot of space for years and it, it can be a fire hazard. And they often have to spend money to process them and have it hauled away. Um, so in our visits to several facilities, um, you can see here, that's a picture of a conveyor belt um, right after the pre-cleaning step that's kind of conveying sticks and twigs um, away. Um, there are different levels of uh, processing at a facility. So the amount of purity kind of depends on how much they work or how many unit operations they have to actually clean up the sticks and twigs. The, Impurity of the six and twigs also depends on the farming practices, the field soil characteristics, the age of the orchard, um, and then, like I said, the degree of the pre cleaning. And here's another picture um, of rock and separation from the sticks and twigs. And this is an example of a stick and twig pile from a processor at Ripon. And this is a mountain of sticks and twigs at a processor in Chowchilla. So it, it's a problem. Um, I think this particular processor spent money to grind it up um, and they still had challenges of, of getting rid of it. So an idea is why don't we um, use these waste streams for organic matter amendments? Um, just kind of like what uh, Tyler was talking about in his last talk. Um, and the benefits of organic matter amendments is they can increase water holding capacity of the soil, they can help resistance to drought, they can increase crop yields, they can decrease soil sediment erosion. And if you look at a map of where dairies and orchards are, or almond orchards are located in California, there's a lot of co-localization. Um, there's also a history of these two industries working pretty closely together. Dairies have a history of using almond hulls as feed and shells for bedding, many dairies, um, already use limited practice of composting for bedding production. So it seems like it's a great match. You can take, um, potentially take the manure sticks to the dairy. You can do some composting and then you can recycle it back to the almond orchard. So the goal was recycling dairy manure and almond stick twig waste on almond orchards as a nutrient rich, safe organic amendment to sequester carbon and provide economical and sustainable benefits to the soil, crop, and environment. We wanted to investigate the on-farm composting of dairy manure and also dairy manure co-composted with almond sticks and twig waste, and also produce pelletized amendments from the compost. Um, we wanted to apply the loose and pelletized amendments using con conventional orchard applicators and then study and compare the differences between pelletized manure and manure stick compost. Um, and then to study effects of these organic amendments on the soil and the trees as it relates to carbon sequestration, soil physical chemical properties, pathogens, soil greenhouse gas emissions, and tree, tree health, almond yield, and consumer safety. Um, a lot of the results I uh, really don't have time to present and is the analysis still going, but I'd kind of just like to show you some of um, what the work has looked like on the farm. So to give you a little bit of a process overview, um, we composted manure by itself, dairy manure on its own. That was the fine manure from the farm and the manure and stick, uh, stick compost. We actively composted for eight to 10 weeks. Um, a fraction of what was composted went to a pelletizer and we produced four different treatments, manure compost, manure stick compost, and then the pelletized versions of each. And then we put them into an applicator and applied them into an experimental plot. And this is kind of what the experimental design looked like. Um, and there was also a, a no, no amendment control. And so the, the, the nice part of the composting is it, it's a biological process that produces fertilizers that um, is more stable and, and free of pathogens. Um, the temperature of composting is 60 to 70 degrees Celsius, as you'll see in some of the data that I'll present. And it's nice because it stabilizes the, the manure um, a bit. Um, it, uh, the benefit of composting, it reduces the volume of the organic waste. It mitigates some of the methane emissions and it, it can improve soil health and um, conserve some water. Um, the ideal C to N ratio for composting is between 25 and 35 to one. 
Um, if your CDN is too low, you get ammonia gas emitted. If it's too high, you can get high microbial, uh, the microbial growth can be stunted. Um, the ideal moisture is between 40 and 60% and the temperature is ideally above 55 degrees Celsius. So these are just some images of um, us preparing uh, well, actually, it was the farm personnel preparing the compost piles for us. They load the raw materials into a side dump. They spread it out, added manure. Um, adding water is optional. Um, as you can see from the table on the right, the manure stick mixture is uh, a lot drier, but you could still compost. Um, you might just have to add water in the middle of uh, your composting. And then um, compost piles were turned weekly just to provide aeration. And some of the, you can see some of the measurements that we took on the farm. We put, installed temperature sensors in the compost pile at four different points. We were kind of interested in, in the changes in temperature over time. We um, measured the dimensions of the pile. We, we measured bulk density. We took samples back for analysis in the lab because we wanted to kind of see changes of um, in the moisture content and the, in the, in the total and volatile solids in the, in the uh, uh, compost over time. This is just shows a little bit how, how we did that. Um, you can see the temperature sensor we used, how we placed it into the compost piles in an ambient temperature sensor. And um, this is some temperature data of the composting. So um, the, the, uh, the green and the black lines are the points at the edges of the pile that lose moisture quicker and the temperature drops. The windrows achieve temperatures between 60 and 75 degrees in the first four weeks. And then, like I said, the edge temperatures um, decrease mostly because the moisture starts to drop. This is just more pictures of us taking measurements on the farm. Um, that table kind of summarizes the loss in moisture the loss in water from the pile, um, the wet mass, the total solids mass, and the organic solids or volatile solids loss. And then on to pelletization. So um, pelletization is a process where smaller particles are formed into larger particles. Um, this uh, figure at the right shows a, a flat dye pellet mill, which is what we used in the pro project. Um, the, the flat dye pellet, this pellet mill can increase bulk density, it improves storage handling and application, and it can reduce dust generation. And that's a picture of the pellet mill that we used on this project. It was a lab scale one, but, but it was um, large enough that we were able to transport it to the farm and use it. This is what the setup looks like. That's a pelletizer, bin for collection, screen, and a raised platform to make it easier to access. And I'm just going to share a video of what how the pelletizer looks like in action. Um, let's see. You can see the, the pelletizer. This is manure stick compost that we're adding into the pelletizer. And these are the pellets coming out. Sorry about that. 
Um, and so some of the observations that we saw from manure and manure compost pelletization was that um, going back, you can see that the recommended input material from the manufacturer was to be between 10 and 15%. And we we'd pelletized um, dried food waste digestate in a, in a different project and, you know, at around that moisture, it, it worked fine. We got pretty nice pellets. Um, but when we tried to pelletize the compost, we had issues with the, the pellet mill dye plugging up with hardened compost, which was really hard to get rid of, which we believe mostly was because of all of the sand in the compost. Even though we took compost from the separator um, in the compost processing, it's just on the it's on. Uh, it's not on a concrete pad. It's just on the farm on dirt. And during composting, we believe it picked up a lot of sand, and that probably contributed to why it was hard to pelletize at lower moisture. So we found at higher moisture, above thirty-five percent, the pellets are not durable. They break easily apart, and so a range between twenty-five and thirty-five percent was kind of where we found as a sweet spot to to get nice pellets. Um, the manure compost is fairly homogeneous. You don't really need material conditioning um, in terms of mixing it up or grinding it down. But for the manure stick compost, there were larger woody particles. Obviously, we didn't get break, break down completely during composting, which negatively affected the pellet durability and it caused more wear and tear on the, on the mill. So a lesson learned would be that, you know, hammer milling is, is a must when you're, when you're co-composting manure sticks if you want to pelletize. And then just looking at the, uh, the characteristics of the, of the different products. Um, MC is manure compost, MSC is manure stick compost, PMC is pelletized manure compost, and PMSC is pelletized manure stick compost. So the bulk density of both the manure compost and the manure stick compost increased. It was about two times for the manure compost and one and a half times for the manure stick compost. We see um, the, the C to N ratio between the pelletized and the unpelletized is not very different, but when you add sticks, obviously your C to N ratio increases, which is not um, uh, unsurprising. And we found that electrical conductivity dropped um, by about half when we added wood and pelletizing slightly increased electrical conductivity. Um, the NPK of the manure compost and the pelletized manure compost were, were, were really similar, 1.25% nitrogen, 0.35% uh, phosphorus, and 0.9% potassium. And for the manure stick equivalent, it was about a percent, 0.2% phosphorus and 0.75% potassium. Um, and the rates that we applied, we, we applied this at a rate of four dry tons per acre um, for each of the products, which was roughly equal to um, which, which, so you can see the NPK value of, of what was applied for the manure and pelletized manure compost, as well as for the two manure stick equivalents. We tested the products for pathogens and did not find any um, in terms of salmonella or pathogenic coli. Um, we've also collected samples of the soil and also the almonds over two years of harvest and um, have that to, to ha have to analyze those. Those are in cold storage, and we'll be analyzing those for pathogens as well. Um, here are some up-close images of the pellets themselves and the pellets in the applicator. And you can see what the pellets kind of look like as you apply them. And this is a side-by-side -side comparison of the application of composted manure and the application of pelletized composted manure. Um, so some next steps. So for two and a half years, we've been studying the orchard soil, taking samples for physical, chemical, and pathogen analysis. We've been measuring soil greenhouse gas emissions between different treatments, studying almond tree health by measuring the harvest yield, the tree circumference, and testing almonds for consumer safety. Um, we're submitting samples for analysis and analyzing the data in preparation for this project wrapping up. Um, and we'll be, uh, the official end date of the project is in March. Um, and we have a final field day, which we will also um, disseminate the results publicly. In the meantime, Wixford Dairy has uh, pressed on and they're in the process of putting in a centrifuge to clean up their um, flush water even more. And they're installing a one ton per hour pellet mill um, as part of a CDFA funded demonstration project. 
Um, so this is kind of what that looks like. The water goes again to the first stage, to the settling tank, then to the setter, second stage separator. Then they're adding this new centrifuge system, which is designed to remove some more solids. So now there's three solid streams, coarse, fine, and centrifuge solids. And um, the idea is that that will be go to a pellet mill and they'll be producing pellets on a much larger scale. Um, again, I'd like to, like to acknowledge our project sponsors um, and all of the collaborators who've helped us on this project. Um, and thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Hossein. That was excellent. And I wanted to thank you for taking lead on all those research projects. We had a huge accomplishment. Um, I would like to introduce this, uh, our third speaker uh, from this session. Um, the third speaker comes from a company, um, Vico International. And uh, Vico International is one of the major companies supplying um, palletization, granulation, uh, equipment, the technologies for uh, producing the biofertilizers. And uh, also they have pallet facility where um, people can send material in. They have um, uh, staff to work with the uh, companies and from research and the researchers to test out the material for um, granulation or uh, palletization. So I asked Nick to provide the presentation, tell us about the, their technologies and also uh, and the case studies, the projects they have successfully um, worked on. And so um, Nick can either join us live and he is gonna present the, uh, through a recording, recorded a video, which I will play in a moment. And just a few more words about the Nick. Nick Rackinger um, has been with the FICO International for 14 years as a bioresource and process sales engineer, working with this industry, a uh, bioresource industry to create a solutions for transporting, uh, transforming all kinds of um, um, residues, uh, organic residues into uh, products. Uh, he oversees projects from initial conceptual design, ideas, so manages process development testing, provides system designs, economics. And uh, throughout his career, Nick has worked on many projects that have resulted in millions of pounds of uh, organic uh, residues being diverted from landfills or um, and other less beneficial disposal. With that, I will um, uh, yeah, show the recorded the presentation from Nick. And Nick asked you to uh, follow up with the, him uh, through email if you have questions regarding his, uh, the information he uh, is going to present. Hi, and thank you for taking the time to listen to my presentation today. My name is Nick Reckinger and I'm with a company called FICO International. I will start the presentation by giving a brief background on FICO and what we do. Uh, go over the uh, agricultural uh, byproducts uh, industry. And hi, and thank you for taking the time to listen to my presentation today. My name is Nick Reckinger, and I'm with a company called FICO International. I will start the presentation by giving a brief background on FICO and what we do, uh, go over 
the uh, agricultural uh, byproducts uh, industry, uh, what the current situation is and what some of our uh, opportunities are for uh, making value added products. And then I'll give you a couple of examples of projects that we've worked on recently. So FICO International was founded back in 1951 uh, in Green Bay, Wisconsin, and it stood for Fertilizer Equipment and Engineering Firm uh, or company. Uh, we specialized uh, in the early days in NPK fertilizer plants, uh, granulation drying plants, and have uh, over the years have diversified into a number of different industries and uh, rename the company FICO International. Uh, we do currently today, we do, we still do a lot of inorganic NPK type fertilizer plants, uh, but also uh, have over for the last 20, 30 years have moved into uh, organic fertilizers and uh, waste transformation. Uh, so FICO is a, is a custom equipment manufacturer, um, so we will uh, sell single pieces of equipment like the paddle mixer you see here, or we will combine uh, a lot of our equipment together along with uh, equipment that we buy from other vendors and provide a system uh, for the customer to take, uh, to take it from a, uh, a raw material all the way through to a finished product. And we do that by, uh, we have some product development capabilities in-house with a, a testing facility. Uh, we call it our innovation center. Um, we have uh, engineers that can go out in the field and perform process audits. Um, and, um, and then service technicians that can go out and service all of our equipment, make sure it's running properly uh, throughout its lifespan. Uh, at FICO, we have a, a number of different divisions or equipment lines uh, with uh, the, the agglomeration being a basis for what we do. Uh, we take powders and we agglomerate them into uh, different size granules. And there's a number of pieces of equipment within that agglomeration division. Uh, thermal processing, we do a lot of high uh, dryers, coolers, high temperature kilns, calciners have a lot of capabilities there as well. And then material handling, uh, bucket elevators, belt conveyors, uh, tripper cars, uh, different types of uh, pieces of equipment to move material, material around throughout the plant. Uh, and then we can combine all of those divisions and again, provide a system of equipment for uh, a number of different industries, a lot of them being fertilizer or soil amendment type uh, products. Uh, and then uh, the last thing would be our uh, waste transformation capabilities where um, we can take materials that have been destined for landfill in the past and uh, create uh, value added products from them. Uh, and again, we've been doing that type of work for the last maybe 20, 30 years uh, in a various different industries. So when I talk about waste transformation, what does that mean? You know, there's a number of different waste streams that we, we've seen over the years, uh, both bio-based or organic-based waste streams, and then orga inorganic, uh, maybe chemical-based waste streams or metal-based waste streams that we've seen as well. Um, a, lot of the, a lot of what we see comes from, uh, from our agricultural uh, companies, manures, compost, things like that. We'll also see some industrial waste from rendering plants, uh, food waste as well, restaurant waste. Um, and then from municipal is also another big area. Um, the municipal biosolids, uh, composted biosolids, 
Um, all of that stuff, we can uh, make products uh, alone or by combining different ingredients together to make, uh, make value-added products from. Um, and then uh, we won't talk a lot about this today, but we do have capabilities of taking other materials, uh, SO2 sludge, uh, gypsum wallboard, uh, steel dust uh, from steel plants and recycling that around. Um, so we do have some other different capabilities like that. Uh, so specifically talking about our agricultural companies, um, the, the dilemma that we've, we've faced for, for many years now is that uh, for, for many different reasons, the, the, the herd sizes, the, the farm sizes have continued to grow and grow larger and larger, and the number of farms has, has shrunk. And what, that hap what happens is we then con uh, concentrate the, uh, the waste products or the byproducts from the, from the animal production uh, into, into smaller areas or into more um, uh, localized areas. And we need to, in order to safely uh, dispose of that waste uh, by land applying, we have to start transferring or transporting that material further and further away from that single point. Um, and what can happen is if we don't transport this material far enough or we don't have enough land due to urban, you know, urban area expansion and land costs, um, then we start to concentrate our nutrients in, uh, in, in certain areas around those farms. Um, and when the nutrient level goes up, uh, that leads to, uh, can, can lead to uh, a higher concentration of nutrients in the runoff water uh, through surface water runoff or uh, through groundwater runoff. Um, and then from the farm's perspective, uh, the, the manure has always been um, a source of, of, of fertilizer, a source of organic matter, uh, something that, that improves the health of their soil. And if this material, if that, if those, uh, if the nutrients of the organic matter is not staying where it was applied, then they're losing that value. So it's a, it's a, it's a harm to the farms if the, if this material is running off. So this then gives us an opportunity to say, how can we do this better? How can we move this uh, maybe wet, sludgy-like material to a, a further area uh, where it can be then used and, and fully realized for its benefit. Um, as I've said, you know, there's a lot of nutrients, not only the, the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium that we, we hear about often, but there's a lot of also micronutrients in manures that you may not get from it from an inorganic uh, fertilizer. So there's magnesium, sulfur, iron, boron, and, and countless other micronutrients that are also beneficial and, and required by, by plants to uh, grow healthy. Um, I've already said the organic matter is, is really important to the soil for building a, a healthy soil. Uh, a soil that will, will retain moisture and not have it all just run off. Um, and then there's other opportunities we have when we start looking at a holistic approach. Can we add energy production by uh, anaerobic digestion and, and maybe even recycling water, getting to the point where we clean the water up enough where it can be recycled or possibly used uh, for irrigation. Um, and then, you know, the, the, these products that we make, um, uh, they oftentimes go to supply the organic uh, food industry. Uh, and that's a, a, an increasing um, growth market and it has for many years and uh, looks to be continuing, uh, continuing its strong growth. So again, um, what's the need for all this material? Um, the the organic organic food production. I just found some numbers that said over the last uh, nine ten years, they've seen an average annual increase of nine point five percent, and that that's a pretty huge growth. 
And uh, per, you know, I've seen it, uh, I've seen the, the, the demand for this type of product is high. Um, there's still not a lot of production of organic, uh, truly or, organic certified fertilizers out there. Um, and I know, you know, the organic food producers are continuing to look for different sources. Um, as a bigger picture, the, uh, the world demand for food as the population continues to increase um, is only going to increase and we have to be more efficient in how we, uh, how we fertilize the, the soils that are providing that food. Um, the, uh, the inorganic sources of nutrients are not, uh, are a finite source uh, for the most part. And um, we could potentially start to run out of that source if we don't look at these uh, other means uh, of recycling the nutrients uh, on the farm. So organic materials, as far as the uh, production of them goes, of, of create, taking an organic waste and producing a, a product from it, um, why aren't we doing this? Why is this something that's not common on every farm? Um, and one of the big reasons for that is that the, the consistency of the material, it's, it's usually a very wet sludge-like material or, or maybe with poultry, it's, uh, it, it is, it's dry, but it's very dusty. Um, but also it's not compared to our inorganic fertilizers, it's a fairly low analysis fertilizer where uh, an inor inorganic fertilizer might be 50 to 60% uh, the macronutrient that you're looking for. Uh, most organic products uh, are gonna be less than 10%. So you need a much bigger volume of that fertilizer to equal what you would need uh, in, from an inorganic standpoint. Um, and like I mentioned, the, there's a wide range of feedstock. So there's really not just one process you can put in that's gonna be able to handle all the different organic wastes that are out there. We have uh, from dairy manures and hog, man, uh, hog manures are gonna be very wet uh, slurries, uh, liquid slurries that have to go through a solid liquid separation process uh, before that, before they can go through the granulation process where we're gonna mix dry material in with that wet cake and create the pr product that way. Um, and then on the flip side with, again, with poultry manure, um, there's, there's many different uh, many different sources uh, and every farm is going to be a little bit different on what that material looks like. And often that needs to be dried a little bit down so it can be ground up fine enough so we can take it through a different process that's going to then grow it into uh, the correct size granules uh, that for, for, uh, for fertilizer. Um, the, uh, the, the other issue is transportation. Um, transporting this material, whether it's the sludge and it's just you're moving a lot of water around that's expensive or uh, the drier materials. Uh, and when you try to apply them, you end up applying and a big dust cloud uh, is around your uh, applicator. Um, none of those things are ideal. So one, one approach, um, and, uh, if you look at it from a full uh, farm perspective, um, is, is done in steps. So this, is, uh, this, this particular slide here is talking mostly about a, a dairy farm um, where you're going to start with a wet sludge-like material. Um, and one option is to take that sludge, uh, which still has some energy value in it. There's, uh, there's still some potential in that manure to create a methane gas from it. And you can put that through an anaerobic digestion process um, that's going to, uh, it's going to break down that material. It's going to homogenize that manure um, and then obviously make some uh, gain capture some energy from that. It could be uh, in the form of electricity if that gas is put through a generator 
um, or, or in the form of methane, and it can be cleaned up to either put into a pipeline or used in the further steps uh, in the fertilizer granulation step where we do need heat, we do need thermal heat in that process uh, to generate the fertilizer. Um, after anaerobic digestion, you, you still have a very liquid uh, uh, material left. And so fortunately, there's been a lot of innovation in, in this part where we're gonna take, uh, uh, we wanna capture the nutrients. We wanna keep the nutrients and those fine particulates in the solid phase and, and not let them go off and run off uh, once they're applied on the land. Um, so the, the second stage will go through a solid, solid liquid separation. Often this is a multiple step process, taking coarse material out first and then going through a second step where there might be a chemical addition and, and we're capturing those fine particulates and the majority of the nutrients. Once we have that, uh, we call it a cake. Um, once we have that nutrient rich cake, that's where uh, FICO's process comes in and we can we'll create a, a fertilizer granule from that. And we'll go a little bit more on the further uh, slides uh, about what that process entails. Um, and then if the water has been cleared up enough, um, it can be either used as irrigation or maybe even reused on the farm. So this here shows you a diagram of what the, the last slide was talking about. So uh, if, if you follow um, where my pointer is here, you've got uh, manure coming in uh, straight out of the barns. It's gonna be a, a, a very liquid type manure, maybe eight to 10% moisture. The first step uh, could be sand removal if the manure, if the farm is bedding on sand or um, uh, coarse fiber removal, uh, which could happen before or even after the anaerobic digestion. Um, the material would then go into the digester. And again, can create some uh, energy value that way. And it, it also, uh, preconditions the manure for further further processing. Uh, it's not required, uh, but it, again, it does help uh, for the next steps in the process. Um, then we go through the solid liquid separation step uh, or steps uh, to capture a nutrient rich cake. And then this part down in the gray here is all the FECO process. So it's not just one piece of equipment you put the cake into and out comes a granule. Uh, you start with a, a, a mixing process where you're gonna take material that's already gone through the process and it's recycled back around and put into the mixer. And then the wet cake is put on top of that. And that mixing process uh, combines the dry and the solids, but then it also is creating the granules. And we'll have a, a short little video of that later. Um, I have listed here a binder as well. Oftentimes material, uh, sticky tacky material is needed to add into this product to create that hard fertilizer grade granule at the end. Um, then we go through a drying step. So this is this this is where the gas uh, from the anaerobic digester or maybe it's natural gas can be used to heat the product up. Uh, it'll, get, it'll be a pathogen kill step and it will remove moisture so that the product uh, can be stored properly um, and, and has, a, has good strength to it to hold up to transportation, to application. Um, after material has gone through the dryer, it's going to be warm and we need to cool that material down. So we will put it through a cooler um, and then through a product, a, a deck screen that's going to take anything that's oversized and undersized and put that into the recycle bin. And the onsized product will then go off uh, to bagging, to truck loading, um, whatever that facility decides. Um, and then, and then we also have uh, off of both of these drying and cooling steps will be uh, exhaust gases that come off. And there's different methods uh, of, of cleaning up that gas. 
so that we're not polluting the atmosphere with uh, particulates or odors. So the method of agglomeration that FECO specializes in is called tumble growth accretion or agglomeration. And as I mentioned a few slides ago, we have different processes for sludge-like feedstocks. Uh, that's called our mixer with this paddle mixer uh, to a drier granulation like the previous slide showed you. The, uh, when we're dealing with dry feedstocks like poultry manure or even like crushed up limestone or gypsum, we're gonna use a different method where we have to actually add moisture in the process. And the main agglomeration piece in that is what's called a disc pelletizer shown here. For the mixer granulation, uh, again, it's, it's mostly for this wet sludge like feedstocks where we're gonna bring uh, a lot of recycle off spec material back around uh, to, to mix in with the wet cake. And that's where we can add different binders um, and, uh, and, and create the granule uh, through the process. Um, this material can be very tricky. Um, so you have to know how to handle it through the plant. You have to know the different types of screw conveyors and belt conveyors and things like that that are necessary to handle this wet and sticky material. So this is just a, another a little close up of that diagram I showed you before. The disc pelletizer granulation. Uh, so again, this is for the dry type materials. Um, we're often gonna have a process before this that might grind up the material into fine, uh, finely divided powder like material. That's the, that's the key. Um, for organic materials, composting is often a very good step beforehand to homogenize, uh, even out the moisture. Um, and again, it, that compost could then go to a, a screening process to take out any of the larger materials that could just be recycled back to composting. Um, or we could take that and um, uh, put that material through a grinder as well and, and break that stuff up. Um, this process, this is showing you a, uh, this picture here is showing you a pin mixer, uh, which oftentimes the, the, the material, the, the preconditioned, the ground up material will first come into a pin mixer where we'll add some of the moisture, some of the binder, and that just helps to pre-densify and start to agglomerate. We create little seed pellets in this pin mixer, which then gets discharged onto this disc pelletizer uh, where we have a, a lot of control to grow specific size granules that we want to see. Um, maybe one disadvantage of this is that it is an open system. This disc palletizer is an open system. So if you don't have a mixer like this in front of it, that's de-dusting the material. Uh, if you're just putting the dust straight onto the disc palletizer, um, you, you, do, you could have a, uh, an issue with, uh, with collecting uh, or trying to mitigate the dust within the plant. Here's a di diagram of a disc pelletizer granulation loop. Uh, as you'll see, everything beyond the actual pin mixer and disc pelletizer um, is pretty much the same as the drum dryer approach. Um, in this case, the dry feedstock will come into the pin mixer and there will be some off spec material, not nearly as much from the mixer uh, approach, uh, but there will be maybe 20 to 30 percent off spec material and that can also be recycled around. So there's no uh, waste material in this process. Anything that's too big will go through a crushing step and then go to the recycle. Anything that's too small will just get straight recycled back around. Um, again, it'll first go through the pin mixer where we'll add some of the water and some of the binder, and then it will get put onto the disc pelletizer where we'll add the remainder of the water and binder to get the material up to the moisture where the particles want to stick together 
and form into the round spheres or uh, agglomerates that we're looking for. Those agglomerates will then again go into the dryer, through the cooler, through the product screen, the deck screen, and then the on-size product will then go off uh, to the customer's use. The disc pelletizer is a, is a pretty fascinating piece of equipment. Um, the neat thing about it is that uh, due to centrifugal forces, we end up getting a segregation of particle sizes throughout the, uh, throughout the, the disc. Um, so this was showing a clockwise rotating disc. And what happens is the larger granules, don't, they don't make it up and over uh, as far as some of the smaller granules do. So those larger granules will congregate in this area. And eventually as that pan fills up, they'll pour off the lip of the pan over the lip of the pan and then off the pan to the dryer. Um, slightly large, slightly smaller granules will make it a little bit further, smaller and smaller as you go. So this allows you to target which size granules you wanna grow by only spraying on those granules and also uh, targeting where you feed the pan. You can adjust where the feed comes in on the pan. That's gonna have the growth material on it. So you can target where your sprays are on that pan and where the feed comes onto the pan to help you control the, the size of granule that you're getting from it. A third method of granulating is called extrusion pellet, pelleting. Um, it can be confused uh, by the terminology, um, disc pelletizers and extrusion uh, pelletizers or pelleting. Um, they're completely different processes, but uh, many people can be confused by that terminology. Um, a pellet mill will take a dry will make, take a dry feed stock and it'll actually press it through the die. Uh, there's a, a die inside this machine down here. Uh, and then there's some little knives and choppers that will, uh, it, it creates a cylindrical type product. And then those choppers will, um, will cut it off to whatever size uh, cylinder uh, that you're looking for. Um, those cylinders can then be sent through what's called a crumbler to, to break those up a little bit. and try to make a uh, spherical type. Uh, it's kind of a, uh, an angular spherical product. Uh, one of the downsides of this is that it does create a lot of dust. And depending on the consistency and makeup of that dust, it may or may not be able to be recycled back through the system. Um, the advantage of these is that at the smaller capacities, um, they do tend to be a little more economical than the uh, tumble growth agglomeration lines can be. Um, so anything maybe under uh, like one or two tons per hour, um, the, uh, the uh, agglomeration systems uh, may not be um, very economical and these, these are an option. And I should say that uh, FICO does not provide this type of equipment. We specialize in the tumble growth agglomeration. I don't have a good process flow diagram of the extrusion pelleting because again we're, we're not as familiar with that but uh, you know similar to uh, agglomeration you've got the raw, manu raw uh, manure uh, and then it'll have to go through some type of preconditioning process. In this case uh, usually it's going to be drying uh, crushing, size reduction. Um, there's a process where they, uh, they'll they sometimes steam condition. They'll, they'll put the, the material in contact with steam to kind of soften up some of the cellulose material in it, run it through the pellet mill, um, cool the, the going through the pellet mill and steam conditioning, the, the material will heat up a bit. And so again, they'll, they'll have to cool that material down so you can store it. Um, and then it that may be the finished product, or it might go through crumbling um, and then classifying. So that's uh, that's just uh, running it through uh, a screen to take the oversized uh, and undersized. 
and then you have your finished products. Uh, in, in all of these plants, uh, another part of the process is the, uh, is the gas treatment. So we don't want to be running these processes and just uh, instead of polluting our water with the waste material, now all of a sudden we're polluting the air with particulates, odors, maybe pathogens, things like that. Um, so there's fortunately a, a very mature industry in gas treatment um, from many other industries. Uh, we can use the same type of equipment to uh, remove uh, particulates, uh, remove most of the odors um, and, and anything else really that's in there to have, uh, have a, a pretty much the only thing leaving the stack is gonna be the steam uh, and maybe a little bit of hot gas leaving. Um, it's, uh, it is feedstock feed stock specific. So you do have to have the knowledge um, and the vendors that you uh, that that have the knowledge to know what type of uh, process, what type of equipment is needed uh, to get uh, to get the constituents out of the gas stream. Um, but it does it does add a considerable amount of cost to uh, the the project as well, but a necessary cost. This, um, don't take these numbers to the bank, but um, this gives you an idea of what a, an agglomeration, a mixer dryer granulation facility might cost. Um, I used eight tons per hour just because that's a, that would be, I would consider a pretty typical size plant. Um, I should say that um, in order for a, uh, uh, one of these, organic fertilizer plants often to make sense, you do need a certain quantity of manure. Um, this is gonna generally equal out to, from a dairy standpoint, maybe 10 to 15,000 head of, of, of dairy uh, cows. And um, off, you know, obviously there's not that many farms out there. Um, there are becoming more and more at that size, but there are obviously a lot small, a lot of farms that are still quite a bit smaller than that. And so one of the challenges that we face is how to aggregate waste. Um, and there are a number of you know, community type digester projects going in that do start, that are starting to aggregate that waste to a, uh, to a single point uh, where then you can, uh, where then it can make sense to put in a, a granulation facility like this. But as you can see, we're not talking about very small numbers here. In the end, if you add up all these numbers, we're talking over, uh, you know, maybe uh, 13 million here for this one. Um, and, you know, that'll vary quite a bit based on the local conditions, uh, what the permits require for gas treatment things like that. But in the end, you know, it's, it's something where a, a single farm obviously is, is not often going to put one of these in themselves. It's, uh, it's often going to be a, a fertilizer company that comes in and, and wants to create and, and sell the finished product. The, the system also obviously does require some energy, uh, both from electrical standpoint. Uh, and again, this is just based on this eight ton per hour facility. We're estimating about 900 horsepower in the system at 10 cents a kilowatt hour, uh, 48 million BTUs required. Um, if that's all run on natural gas, uh, this number is probably a little bit higher today. Uh, that's probably more like a, a, a Oh, that's 30, yeah, about 60 cents to 70 cents a therm. Um, so these numbers, uh, actually, I just forgot to update that number. This natural gas cost is correct, and the total cost is correct, and the cost, cost, cost per ton is, um, is correct. I just forgot to update this number here. Um, this is a very general, both the cost on the previous sheet and this sheet are very general. Every situation could be a little bit different. If you have 
the uh, biogas, you know, this rate could be zero uh, or your electric electricity could be quite cheaper. Um, but these are going to be your main operating costs. Obviously, you have operators that you have to pay. Um, that would be another cost uh, that needs to get factored in and any, uh, any other overhead costs. Moving on to a specific example to just kind of show you the scope of, of what these plants might look like. Um, this is taken, this top picture is taken after the plants already installed. Um, this bottom picture is, is during installation so you can see inside the plant. Um, this agglomeration part of this project is all in this middle part of the building. This front part of the building is where they're going to receive the manure. And in this case, they're adding some other inorganic minerals to it as well. So they have some storage uh, for those materials and a way to uh, dose those uh, materials into the plant. And then on the back end of the building here is all product storage. They're taking it and just piling it up uh, so that they have a few months of storage in this building. Um, this is a mixer dryer granulation project um, where the, the paddle mixer is installed up here, up, oh, sorry, up in this area. It goes directly down into the rotary dryer. There will be a conveyor installed in here eventually that takes it over to this side of the building, which you can't see here, but there's a cooler on this side of the building and brings material back to what the deck screen up here that takes the uh, undersize and oversize, crushes the oversize up and then recycles it back to, uh, there's a, a silo in the back here that uh, gives us some surge capacity for that recycle. And then ultimately through conveyors and bucket elevators gets it back to the paddle mixer. Um, and then product goes off up this far back here, bucket elevator up to a conveyor that goes along the, uh, along the top of this uh, later part of the building here and discharges it into their piles. Um, we kind of went over all this before the solid liquid separation. Just know there's a lot of different uh, technologies out there today uh, for this. Um, again, in that plant, this is where the cake is, uh, is received. It comes on trucks. This is the cake from the farm. The farm is doing the solid liquid separation and then they truck it over to the plant and put it into these hoppers, which will then load it into the plant. Uh, that comes through this wall back here and then it gets mixed in with these minerals, these other minerals that they're um, combining with it. This is showing you that mixer, uh, what's happening inside the mixer. This is downstream a little bit from where the wet material comes in. And you can see it's uh, combining that wet with the dry, and then it's creating the little granules. When it stops here, you can see the little granules that are formed in there. After the mixer, it's gonna go into the rotary dryer. what that looks like. Obviously, what's uh, going on inside, drying that material, showering those granules down, and then discharging out on a belt conveyor. After the dryer, it's going to go to the cooler. And again, the same thing. Picking up and showering the granules down through a cool airstream. Then the deck screen takes the oversize, the onsize, the oversize, and the undersize. And then finally, you ended up with a pile of finished granules. Then that's a close up of those granules. Okay, well, I wanted to thank Nick, and I have provided uh, Nick's email in the chat. 
And if you have questions, please follow up with him. And that was an awesome presentation. Um, and uh, I, I see uh, we don't have an answer to questions. Um, thank you, Tyler Hossein, for answering questions as we went. Uh, and uh, with that, I will stop this, um, yeah, conclude this session. I want to thank, uh, uh, thank you for the attention and also thank you all the speakers uh, for the awesome session. Okay, thank you, Ruhang, uh, and we'll uh, have an abbreviated, a slightly abbreviated lunch break because, uh, and we'll get back on schedule at 1.30 uh, p.m. and we'll open that up with the uh, session seven, the advanced bioresources technologies to transition to a green economy. That'll be moderated by Chuck White. And then we'll have a closing session after a short break after that. And that, that should be very lively and a lot of questions, and answers and interactions between the panelists uh, crafting a vision for a pathway into the future. So thanks a lot. I'll go silent here for the next 45 minutes, go grab some lunch and see you back here uh, for session seven at 1.30. Thanks so much for Oh, hi, this is Lauren Pondol, uh, and um, welcome back to our sessions today. We've got uh, two more, and um, hope everybody can stay around uh, because we'll have an open discussion at the end of the last uh, series of presentations so everybody can bring up their issues. Um, our next presentation uh, is going to be hosted by Chuck White who was um, formerly with Waste Management and uh, has been uh, consulting now on a number of environmental issues. And he's been on the CBA planning committee for the last several years. And uh, so he's gonna be talking about new technologies and having his uh, panelists discuss those. So um, Chuck, are you there? I'm here, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Well, welcome everyone. I uh, hope you've enjoyed the uh, sessions so far. Uh, I'm gonna spend the next just a few minutes talking about the issues that are facing uh, the uh, siting and development and use of advanced technologies for handling biomass waste. I'm not talking about plastic waste, I'm talking about biomass waste. And uh, we've got a, a couple of folks that are engaged in developing those kinds of projects right now. So I'm gonna, I'm going to go to my screen, my screen share, I hope. And for that. Okay, so um, this is uh, entitled Advanced Bioresources Technologies to, to Transition to the Green Circular Economy. The green circular economy is something that CalRecycle is talking a lot about <coughs> these days. And, but uh, the question is, is California ready for advanced technologies to process residual forest, ag, and urban waste into energy fuels and chemicals? And these would be low carbon energy fuels and chemicals, if not zero or negative uh, uh, carbon energy fuels and chemicals. So um, I'd like to begin talking about a little bit of background of where I've been over the last few years uh, on these kinds of issues. Um, what is carbon neutrality or what is net zero? Uh, this is a chart that came from a couple of years ago. It talks about where we are in terms of nationwide the greenhouse gas emissions. If we do keep on doing business as usual, that's where the green curve is. And then if we get if we really get below 2C, uh, which is now even not the target anymore, I think it's 1.75C increase. Uh, we're still, we're still gonna have a hard time getting there with the gray curve, because you can see it goes off, off the side of the, and never reaches zero. And what is necessary are other uh, 
technologies that have negative CO2 emissions or result in the equivalent of zero two emissions. And for the most part, those negative emission technologies are biomass related technologies. So over the long run, there's no question that there's gonna to have to be increased emphasis on these kinds of technologies. And what are the immediate, not only long-term, but immediate reduction. And uh, I've highlighted at the bottom of this page in yellow, an op-ed that appeared in today's uh, San Jose Mercury News by Winston Hickox and, um, and uh, Jim Boyd. Uh, Winston was firmly with the Cal EPA under the Brown administration. Jim Boyd is with the chair of the uh, head of the Energy Commission. And uh, they, really a compelling article. I uh, urge you to, to tap into it if you haven't seen it. I'm a little worried about stealing uh, Juliet Levin's thunder because I'm sure she's gonna mention it in her talk when she comes on uh, during the final session. But really the, the three big sources of biomass are forestry, agricultural and urban solid waste. Uh, forestry has really uh, benefits in terms of redu reduction of wildfires. And so instead of just letting the forest burn, uh, is, can, is there a way that we can effectively and conscientiously uh, remove high, uh, really many waste fuels from the forest uh, and turn them into energy and generate low, a lower carbon energy than uh, just letting it go up as uh, greenhouse gas emissions and wildfires. Agriculture, there's a huge push towards reduction of open burning, particularly in the San Joaquin Valley, the San Joaquin Air District. Uh, reduction of livestock methane emissions, both enteric and from uh, waste management practices. Again, the production of low carbon energy fuels and chemicals from waste biomass. And then urban solid waste management is probably the most difficult because there's a number of legislative and regulatory hurdles that have to be crossed, which I'm gonna emphasize a little bit because that's been the focus of my attention over most of the last 20 years of my professional career is how can we get more uh, low carbon energy and fuels out, out of a solid waste, organic solid waste, not plastic solid waste, organic solid waste. And again, that, that Mercury News is highlighted in yellow. I urge you to write it, and this will be available uh, on the, um, uh, after the session's over for downloading, I'm sure, on the, on the webpage. And so um, what are the strategies for, tra strategies for negative emissions? On the right, you see a getting to neutral, which was put out by Lawrence Livermore in last year or so. And it's really an excellent summary of what, how you can get negative carbon emission. It just really focuses on the need to maximize negative uh, carbon emissions from man proper management and use of biomass. Um, there's afforestation and reforestation with the capture and, and cost potential listed there. Bioenergy with methane reduction, carbon capture and storage, particularly with methane reduction, um, particularly an organic uh, solid waste that would otherwise be put into uh, landfills and produce methane, you can get immediate methane reduction uh, uh, and then long-term carbon capture and storage could be applied to these technologies as well. The only non-green uh, technology and the most expensive one is direct carbon, direct air capture where you actually process carbon dioxide out of air and the cost is really exorbitant and uh, it's not clear how that would really be the best alternative. Soil carbon, put, can we put more carbon into the soil uh, through, car, uh, through uh, uh, carbon capture and returning to soil in terms of compost or in terms of biochar and biochar you actually set, listed separately here as a way to uh, enhance the carbon carrying capacity of the soils. And pyrolysis, uh, for example, is an advanced technology that can generate uh, more biochar that can be used to uh, sequester carbon in the soils. And then finally, enhanced weathering. Well, it's not really uh, uh, directly related to um, uh, biomass and other than the sense that you can use it on, it's basically involved mining of minerals like silicates and things that can be applied and that can absorb slowly, uh, but if, potentially effectively uh, carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So there's a number of, my, my point of this is there's a number of uh, technologies that are out there, uh, but most of them are biomass related and bioenergy and biosource and bioresource, uh, which is really the function of our the organization, uh, the, the, uh, the California Bioresources Alliance. Um, in terms of focusing on the kinds of things you can do to or, or municipal organic waste, 
this is on, a, on the left is kind of oriented that good stuff is in viewed by the legislation and regulations down all the way to the bad stuff. And um, uh, food diversion and composting, anaerobic digestion, uh, even to the lesser degree, perhaps biomass conversion. But there's like 30 plants, there have been 30 plants, I think you're down to less than that now, of wood uh, waste conversion facilities to produce energy uh, from uh, wood waste. Uh, but those are in decline. Uh, soil amendments can be used, but there's strict limitations on having any food material in those soil amendments and other kinds of contaminants. Um, land application being the same kind of thing. Of course, we can't do uh, uh, alternative daily cover in landfills anymore. So we start looking at other and more advanced technologies and they start really getting very difficult to permit because of the variety of rules and regulations that exist in terms of electrochemical processes, thermochemical processing, pyrolysis, gasification is allowed, but only a very specific application of gasification. And uh, on the right, I talk a little bit more about these technologies. They really have the potential to really reduce uh, methane uh, from landfills by getting waste out of landfills and then generating renewable low carbon energy fuels or chemicals that can be then further used, uh, displacing the need for uh, petroleum hydrocarbons. And this is really a complicated section. I really don't want to spend much time on it. It just got arrows going over, but basically points out how most of these advanced technologies are considered to be a, a, what's called transformation under the public resources code. Transformation means incineration, pyrolysis, distillation, biological conversion, other than composting, and, and does not include composting, does, include, uh, does not include gasification, but only a certain specific type of gasification and not the one that is typically thought of when you use uh, in, in industry and in commercial practice uh, conversion, uh, ga gasification. Uh, and, uh, engineered municipal solid waste conversion is also uh, uh, um, not considered, but it's, um, uh, it's, a, it's a form of using uh, uh, pelletized waste, for example, to produce energy. And it is a form of, 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 of Trans, uh, transformation under the public resources code. Gasification has got a very specific meaning. I mean, the point of all of this really is not to get into the details, but to really talk about the fact that biomass uh, using technologies such as pyrolysis, gasification are really very hard to do, although people are doing it and we'll talk about later in this session. And here are some of the uh, things you can do if you wanna use uh, uh, advanced technologies. Uh, you can use existing authorized technologies, which is in, in food waste interception, anaerobic digestion, soil amendments, land application, composting. Uh, there, and under SB 1383, there's an Article II regulations that potentially allow technologies to be approved if they can show that their greenhouse gas reductions are equivalent to or better than composting. Um, you could try to comply with the nonsensical gasification definition that's in the public resources code, but no one's been successful doing that to my knowledge. Um, there is the uh, use the EMSW designation to produce fuels. And while it would be a considered to be a reduction in landfill disposal under 1383, it's still be considered disposal under other provisions of the per, uh, public resources code. So there's a little bit of advantage gain there, but not much. Uh, one of our uh, guest speakers uh, is going to be talking about their project, which is a very small project, but it's a RD and d project, and it's basically exempt from solid waste permitting, and we'll get back to that later, but it's only for very small facilities uh, with little or no profit. And then you, you can pursue a legislation to allow advanced technology, but there seems to be a lot of push, pushback in the legislature to grant uh, e easier access to the use of advanced technologies to convert uh, organic waste into uh, low carbon energy fuels and chemicals. Um, okay, so that's really all I had to say. Um, what I'd like to do is is turn it over then uh, to, uh, to my next speaker, whom I can't remember who is. I think, uh, is it, um, I think, is it Steve Wartell up next? No, it's so Melinda, uh, excuse me, Melinda uh, uh, Palmer with uh, uh, current oil uh, and refining. And you may ask, well, what's an oil company doing here talking about bioenergy? Well, Kern Oil is in a unique position while they've been able to take advantage of the um, uh, petroleum resources that are widely available in Kern County. That They clearly understand that that's on the decline, at least from the standpoint of California regulations. 
And they're looking at ways to transition to produce fuels, energy, chemicals from biomass resources. And they've already begun to do that in a big way in terms of uh, converting uh, biomass into um, biodiesel. And they're looking at other technologies that might be able to help them make the shift. They, they fully intend to be operational and uh, selling uh, fuel, energy, fuels, and chemicals into the next uh, 40, 50 years. And they're gonna be transitioning away from petroleum uh, as, as is appropriate to uh, these other kinds of um, feedstocks for producing these low carbon energy fuels. So uh, I'm hoping Melinda is on and uh, let me see if I can uh, get her uh, come on. Melinda, oh, she is there, good. Hi, Melinda, nice to see you Thank again. You, Melinda is with Kern Oil. She does a lot of the environmental regulations uh, for uh, compliance at, at uh, uh, Kern Oil and Refining. And she's really heavily engaged with the management and the owners of, of Kern Oil to convert that into a uh, increasingly use of biomass resources for energy production. Melinda? Thank you, Chuck. I'll go ahead and, and share my screen now and put a few slides up. And, and, and man, I feel like I'm going to I'm just follow right in the wake of Chuck because there was so much that he teed up in his presentation that that I think uh, I'm going to touch on here as well. So uh, bear with me. I, I might make some some points out there to to check on this. There we go. Hopefully that looks right. Yep. You might want to. Yeah, from the beginning. There, there we go. All right. I, I knew I could get there. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll just, I'll start off um, something a little quippy here. And, and Peter Drucker once said that the only thing we know about the future is that it will be different. Boy, isn't that the case? Um, for, for us at Kern Oil, um, as a small refinery and renewable fuel producer, we sometimes joke that uh, the only constant in our industry is change. Our business and certainly the landscape of California looked very different 85 years ago when we first opened our doors. But, but we're proud of how we have evolved and, and how we continue to innovate to embrace the opportunities that are inherent in the transition to a cleaner energy. And frankly, we're excited to do our part. Kern is very unique. Um, despite our small size, we are actually the only refinery producing gasoline and diesel between the major refining complexes in the Bay Area and Los Angeles. Kern is a critical supplier for the San Joaquin Valley and supplying the heavy diesel demand from agriculture in the valley, and as well as the transportation demand that comes from the I-5 and Highway 58 transport, transportation corridors in our area. Kern was actually the second refinery in the country to get a renewable diesel fuel registration from the EPA. And we did this back in 2009. Um, it was for co-processing biomass, which in our case, we process tallow. Um, and we do that along with the petroleum feedstock through one of our hydro treaters. And so the resultant renewable diesel that we produce has a carbon intensity of around 30 grams per megajoule. And that's comparable to the petroleum fraction or the petroleum distillate which has a carbon intensity of over 100 grams per megajoule. So we're, we're really proud of that significant reduction that, that we can achieve there. Today, our finished diesel contains up to 5% of both this produced renewable diesel and of biodiesel that we purchase and bring in for additional blending. It's interesting that both of these components are a little bit obscured in our finished fuel, given what the existing fuel labeling structure looks like. And, and when we're proud to be able to do that, but at the end of the day, it's time to do better. It, it's time to get more than those 
sneaky little 5% of renewable in there. Um, we really see this 5% labeling limit as an opportunity, particularly on the renewable diesel, and hopefully, you know, as, as uh, renewable naphthas and renewable gasoline come online, but particularly with the renewable diesel, because it's, it, this cleaner fuel is molecularly indistinguishable from the petroleum diesel. And that is a real advantage as a drop-in replacement fuel for utilizing the existing infrastructure that we have in place. And so what we would like to push for and, and are focusing some of our efforts on is being able to bump this up to a new norm of 10% or, or maybe even more. We use our small size to our advantage. Um, Kern can be nimble, proving out new technologies and renewable fuels in a commercial environment, but on a smaller or more feasible scale. Uh, something that larger refiners who are 10 times our size just simply either can't do or aren't willing to do. It's difficult to get approval. There's too much on the line, uh, you know, the, the, I couldn't speak to what all of the things that hold them back are, but, but we know that we can take on things in a way that they can't. And, and we've shown that to be true. Um, I can give you examples of a couple different partnerships. Um, in the last handful of years, we've worked with a company called ClearSign, where we've been able to prove out for them a new low NOx burner technology to utilize in our industrial heater with significant NOx reductions. And us being on the forefront of that with them, um, they're now in multiple facilities and have you know, really grown leaps and bounds. Similarly, we've taken on partnerships with a company called RTI, where we had become a test bed for them for new and innovative um, chemical cleaning systems um, to be able to flush out processing equipment, um, inert the, or, you know, um, hydrocarbon free the equipment so that it makes entry for personnel doing um, inspections and maintenance a whole lot safer than what existing options had before. At the end of the day, when we when we talk about fuel, you know, there's a tremendous amount of infrastructure right here at home, but also around the world, fueling stations, combustion engine vehicles, and all the supporting industries. And so I think we have to ask ourselves, how can we drive down emissions without throwing away that investment? Frankly, how can we make our advancements more exportable to developing countries, which would allow California to have a GHG reduction well beyond its 2% of global GHG emissions? How can we do things like this that make the business case for the reductions? And here's where I'll throw it back to Chuck and things he had in his presentation. You know, there's numerous studies that have recognized that that we can't get rid of oil and gas entirely because of, of the ongoing demand, or, or if we do, it's decades out, right? And, and, and I love the Lawrence Livermore getting to neutral report that, that was on one of Chuck's slides there. But you know, the reality is that petroleum products are intertwined in our economy. And so how do we do it the best that we can? Recognizing that carbon neutral doesn't have to mean no oil or doesn't realistically mean no oil. I think we do that by continuing to drive down the carbon intensity of the liquid fuel pool through the low carbon fuel standard and through supporting innovation around neutral or negative carbon intensity renewable fuels that can utilize this existing infrastructure and investment that we already have on the ground. We have got to give space for innovation and not just prematurely decide what's going to get us there when possibly that's to the detriment of innovation that could be crucial to achieving our goals. We need to look at opportunities where we can mobilize existing industry and talent. And, and I think that's where we're so proud of the work that we're doing. How do we reframe oil and gas as partners 
towards achieving our goal, as opposed to them being necessary sacrifices that it takes in order to get there. At Kern, we're on a dual path to maximizing our production of established renewable fuels, right? We really wanna expand that portfolio of our renewable diesel, and we're aggressively pursuing next generation renewable fuels, which can hopefully utilize waste materials, things like ag waste, MSW, the woody wastes that can help us solve our problems around forest management and prevention of wildfires. Um, I was at a conference here within the last week or so, and they referenced the San Joaquin Valley um, as the salad bowl, right? So how can we utilize um, the ag waste coming out of this salad bowl um, and, and do that, that, that can really hit two birds with one stone, right? Um, that's a lot of analogies crammed together there. I'm sorry about that. But how do we find a home for these waste materials instead of burning them or landfilling or land application and get to negative carbon intensity, wet renewable fuels that again, go back and utilize our existing industry, sorry, existing infrastructure. And how do we even share these learnings across industries? Um, I think as humans, we tend to think that we're unique, <laughs> but when it comes down to it, we're really not that unique. So why shouldn't we be sharing our technological advancements and, and these lower carbon intensity fuels to decarbonize across sectors, right? And as we do that, we need to not lose focus on the big picture. Right. What we're really trying to get at with climate change has to do with quality of life. And so we've got to be careful as we do this not to address issues in a vacuum without considering what are those unintended consequences. You know, otherwise, we risk creating more serious problems than the one that we're trying to solve. We've got to have a larger group of stakeholders with different interests different perspectives, and quite truthfully, stakeholders with skin in the game, because it is way too easy to advocate for policy when you're not the one living with the consequences of it. You know, as we consider the California landscape, we're looking at how regional approach might be the appropriate scale to have that line of sight across those stakeholder groups, across the communities, across government, industry, labor, environment, and also academia, but without having the process become so large and so unmanageable that you lose that personal connection to the outcome. And so one way that Kern is looking at that and engaging is that is our, our president and CEO, Jennifer Haley, is the co-chair of the energy work group of a regional collaborative, um, this Better Bakersfield Boundless Kern Regional Action Plan for Economic Prosperity. And then, so this group is really looking at regional advantages and how do we meet these challenges around climate change and capture opportunities right in our community, right in Kern County for us. And again, Chuck pointed out regulatory uncertainty um, that is definitely one of the biggest challenges to renewable fuel investment. And it can literally take years to get from concept to execution on a project. And by that time, you don't even know if the incentives are still gonna be there. We have conflicting policy coming out of Sacramento, various agencies with overlapping jurisdictions, things on the federal level it's complicated and it is a difficult landscape to navigate even for a business like Kern who is well established and already in the energy space in California. This is something that we have absolutely got to streamline and make these investments easier to justify and easier to fund. And certainly we understand the reluctance to fund or incentivize oil and gas 
But these are some of the biggest opportunities for the biggest reductions with existing talent and real expertise for the real innovation. How do we use that to help counter some of this regulatory uncertainty? How can we come at it from a more pragmatic approach and not be so preferential in funding only startups and only incentivizing startups? We all know the failure rate of that. It can't all be shiny and new. So maybe we can consider that the sweet spot is partnering that shiny and new and everything that they bring to the table with the existing and the established that already have experience in successful completion of projects, but also in the stability of running a business and having long-term loyal employee bases. This is hard guys. We cannot afford to push anyone away from the table but if we can come together, we can accomplish incredible things. And that's what we're looking to do. Thank you. Chuck, I think you're on mute. Thank you. Thank you very much, Belinda. I appreciate it. Um, are you gonna be able to stay on to the end of the session to answer questions or are you um, time limited? I will be on till the end of our session, oh, yes. That's great, so we'll pass on questions for now. You know, it's clear that, you know, current oil and refining is kind of, kind of got one foot in the oil patch and one foot in the salad bowl, and you're getting in the, in the process of potentially moving from one to the other. The question is how fast can you realistically expect, be expected to move? And what are the demands uh, of California in the interim uh, uh, for we see people are going crazy over the high price of gasoline now. And so there's pushback already on the need for uh, providing uh, further access to portable fuels. Yet California seems to be heading in towards a full blown electrification, but we're still gonna need fuels for aircraft for probably heavy duty engines. And really I think current is oil is so well positioned with one foot in the oil patch and one foot in the, in the salad bowl to really take advantage of being able to make that transition uh, as well as anybody can. Who know, like you say, who knows what the future is, but uh, we're, it's gonna come and it's gonna be there and we're gonna have to try to uh, exist on, on whatever the framework is. So thank you very much, Melinda, I appreciate it. Um, we're next gonna turn to uh, Steve Wartell. Uh, Steve, are you, you're there, I see. Um, and uh, you're the executive vice president of business development for core infrastructure which is, I think, a subsidiary of a larger firm. But any of that, you are in, you're building and op actually operating a, a, a solid waste to pyrolysis uh, plant in La downtown Los Angeles. Now, it's a very small plant. And you've been able to circumvent some of the major hurdles <laughs> related to the permitting, a solid waste permitting of, of larger scale facilities. But I know you have in mind of moving towards larger scale facilities. And this is probably one of the most effective ways to do it is do a small unit, demonstrate its effectiveness, demonstrate its capability, demonstrate its emissions, and demonstrate how it can play a major role in helping California meet its uh, low carbon uh, energy fuels and chemical future. So Steve, turn it, turn it over to you. Uh, I think uh, Melinda's got her screen share off. So uh, you're uh, uh, happy, invited to go as you please. Okay, well, Chuck, the size of our facility, and I'll talk about this at the end of my presentation, is actually what we would consider our minimum viable products for the marketplace. And it's operating at about a ton an hour of feedstock uh, rate. So about 24 tons a day overall, which may be considered small in some applications, it could be considered large in others. So I'll talk about how <clears throat> this technology is helping us create a circular economy by converting locally generated waste into biogas, hydrogen, and carbon char. Uh, before we start talking about the technology, though, let's talk about the problems that we're trying to solve with this. <clears throat> Problem number one is that traditional waste management practices, which have and continue to serve us well, uh, do generate greenhouse gases primarily carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. 
So we, we need to recognize that for all the value these technologies bring us, they do generate those greenhouse gases that we're trying to reduce. And secondly, <clears throat> problem number two is that in California, transportation accounts for about 40% of our over, overall greenhouse gas emissions, which is well beyond any other uh, sector of the industry or of greenhouse gas emissions. And this is data that uh, CARB has published about those greenhouse gas emissions. So we have a problem with waste management and we have a problem with transportation emissions. What can we do about this? Well, wouldn't it be nice if there was a solution that can convert those wastes into low carbon transportation fuels? <clears throat> Things like tree prunings and biosolids and nutshells and green waste. If we could convert them into gaseous fuel technologies or lower the carbon intensity of liquid fuels. And in fact, in California, there's existing legislation that provides what I like to call a push and a pull for this approach. So on the push side, we have SB 1383 that is requiring reduction of volatile matter going into landfills. And on the pull side, we have the low carbon fuel standards credits which aims to reduce the overall carbon intensity of California's transportation fuels. And again, that can occur through uh, new fuels like renewable hydrogen or reducing the carbon intensity of existing fuels through things like the innovative crude provisions in the LCFS program. And incidentally, this program has been authorized through 2030 uh, there's legislation being developed that would authorize it through 2035 or 2040. And other states are looking to develop their own LCFS programs based on the success of California's program. So let's look at the front end of that equation. And that is the biomass or waste aspect of it. This is a chart that I'm sure many of you have seen already, the data that uh, Williams and Kafka produced at UC Davis on the different uh, biomass feedstocks that are generated in California. And we see that the amount technically available is over 100,000 tons per day of waste feedstock. And that's a substantial amount. <clears throat> Although I do hear people ask sometimes, well, what happens if you run out of waste? And first I say, well, we should all clap and pat ourselves on the back for having achieved a monumental goal. But beyond that, we could then look at growing purpose grown crops that would achieve the same objectives, things like miscanthus or bamboo or even even algae. <clears throat> so we can always use plants to help us with this overall process. And as you'll notice here, much of the waste that's generated in the state is lignocellulosic, which doesn't lend itself well to anaerobic digestion processes as some previous speakers have mentioned. So we need to look at other approaches to managing those types of material. So let's talk about the characteristics of a biogenic waste. Biogenic feed originates with the photosynthetic combination of atmospheric carbon dioxide with water to form carbohydrates and oxygen. So you see these are the types of carbohydrates that plants produce cellulose, sugar, lignans, et cetera. And the chemical co composition of that biomass is about half carbon, largely oxygen, and then a small amount as hydrogen. Now we could take this biomass and run it through a process known as high temperature, slow pyrolysis to convert those biogenic feeds into gases and elemental carbon. So pyrolysis by definition is <clears throat> raising the temperature of the feedstock to a very high degree, in our case, north of 1000 degrees Fahrenheit in the complete absence of oxygen. When that occurs, the volatile fraction of the feedstock will convert into a gas. And we find that in our case, the gas has about half the calorific value of pipeline quality natural gas and is largely comprised of these four molecules. Uh, with a few other molecules that are built in. 
the non-volatile or fixed carbon becomes biocarbon or elemental carbon. And generally speaking, the carbon splits about 50-50 into the biogas and the biocarbon. So what we're doing here really is leveraging the ecosystem services of plants to reduce atmospheric carbon and allow us to develop a carbon negative process. <clears throat> so again, the trees take CO2 out of the atmosphere. We put that material to beneficial use. And by the way, trees represent all sorts of plants. So that could be foodstuffs and any other plants that we're using uh, as part of our daily life. But when we're done with that biomass, we discard it. And historically that's gone into landfills or other disposal mechanisms. But now we could take that material into our pyrolysis process and generate energy dense gas from that. And I'll talk a little bit more about the gas, but also generate this biocarbon, which is elemental carbon, which in the case of our process is highly stable. So that when that biocarbon is mixed into the soil, it will remain stable and will be sequestered in the, in the soil for decades or even centuries. So it's a process of transferring atmospheric carbon to elemental carbon that we can then lock into the soil. We have a name for this process. We call it Terrestrial Renewable Energy Extraction or the acronym TREE. -E. I'll let you ponder that while we move on. So by starting with biogas with this process, that provides us with a very flexible renewable energy platform to work with. So we've, we take these biogenic feedstocks and put them through the pyrolysis process. We're going to end up with two co-products, a biocarbon, which we'll talk about more later, and a biogas that again has a high calorific value, about half the value of of pipeline quality natural gas are about five to 600 BTUs per standard cubic foot. Now we can use this gas directly in many ways. For instance, we can generate steam with this gas. So we can offset the natural gas that's used to generate steam for any number of applications. One of which would, could be steam flooding in enhanced oil recovery. So we heard a presentation about the future of oil and gas production. You know, this is a way that we can use this technology to decarbonize existing oil production in the state, as well as other applications like food processing, boilers, et cetera. We could also use the biogas to replace natural gas in natural gas fired power plants. So things like uh, campus power plants and um, it really any natural gas power plant that can substitute biogas for the natural gas to produce electricity and lower the carbon intensity of that electricity. And it can reduce natural gas used in fuel cells. Now, fuel cells, uh, right now, server farms, I'm using that as an example here, are, are subject to the carbon intensity of the grid power that they use. And that's caused some people to call the, our, our server farms or our cloud storage to be a, a dirty cloud. So what can we do to clean up that cloud? Well, we can use renewable energy in devices like fuel cells to produce the power that operates those server farms. And, and frankly, anything, any, anywhere where electricity is used, we could decarbonize it by using this type of gas and this type of technology, which is very efficient uh, conversion of gaseous energy to electrical energy, by the way. So those are ways we can use the biogas directly, but we can also upgrade that biogas. Recall that I mentioned earlier that the gas contained appreciable, appreciable amounts of hydrogen. So we can separate that hydrogen to produce renewable hydrogen that could be used in fuel cell electric vehicles, cars, trucks, buses, trains, et cetera. And as that marketplace develops, it's still, it's growing, but it's still in an early stage. There's uh, just about 50 hydrogen refueling stations today and about 10,000 of these vehicles on the roads in California. 
But until that market matures, there are other ways you, we can use that renewable hydrogen to decarbonize our energy sector. For, for, for instance, using that hydrogen to hydro treat uh, crude oil in, the, in re the refining process. And it's interesting to note that when this hydrogen is used in a fuel cell electric vehicle, we are actually reducing one pound of carbon dioxide for every mile driven. And this just shows a quick uh, mass balance on the math of that, where if we apply a ton of feedstock to our process, that is going to reduce 3,000 pounds of CO2 from the atmosphere through the tree process. About 150 pounds of that or half of it's going to be returned through the pyrolysis and hydrogen separation process. The other half is going to be sequestered in the biochar. And we will produce somewhere in the neighborhood of 25 kilograms of hydrogen that will allow us to drive our fuel cell electric vehicle about 18, 1900 miles, which is going to reduce about 100 pounds of CO2 doing that. So again, carbon negative transportation fuel. Now let's talk a little bit about the biochar or the biocarbon, because it's the key to that overall carbon management. If I can just go back, the reason this is process is negative from a carbon basis is because half the carbon is going again into the soil uh, and being sequestered in that manner. And that biocarbon can be used in many, many different ways. Let's just talk about two of them here because of uh, lack of time. The first is as a soil amendment, and then we'll talk about how this particular biocarbon can be a coal substitute in difficult to decarbonize industries. So first of all, as a soil amendment, biocarbon has many benefits. It acts like a sponge in the soil, so it reduces the need for irrigation, which means less water is required uh, to grow the same amount of, of, of plants or crops. And in California, that's certainly a significant problem. Uh, it improves nutrient retention in the soil, so less fertilizer is required which also has the benefit of reducing nutrient runoff and, and non-point pollution because of that. And all of these benefits help enhance soil microbial activity. So we get healthier soils and increased yields. And the potentially most significant benefit is the carbon sequestration because that elemental carbon will not revert to CO2 or break down into methane in the soil because it is very stable as an elemental carbon form. Biocarbon can also substitute for fossil coal in difficult to decarbonize industries. So this is an image of a cement manufacturing plant. And it's probably not well known that the California cement manufacturers currently import about 900,000 tons of coal and petroleum coke annually uh, to produce cement. This biocarbon that this process produces could also be used to replace that fossilized coal and reduce the carbon intensity of cement manufactured in the state. So to summarize, we can create a circular economy by converting locally generated wastes into biogas, hydrogen, and biocarbon, yielding many benefits. First of all, reducing greenhouse gas emissions that are generated from traditional waste management practices by converting those waste feedstocks into carbon negative transportation fuels. And at the same time, generating biochar that can improve agricultural yields using less water and or decarbonizing difficult to decarbonize industries like cement manufacturing. And as Chuck mentioned, this technology is currently being operated at commercial scale at a research and development facility in downtown Los Angeles. We are currently using this facility to confirm the mechanical and thermal integrity of the process, to confirm the yields of the gas and biocarbon quality and collecting data on a wide variety of feedstocks. So we would encourage you to contact us to arrange for a visit to see this facility I've left my contact information on this visual. Uh, this demonstration project, by the way, is being supported both 
technically and financially by Southern California Gas Company and the South Coast Air Quality Management District. So if this is something of interest to you, I would urge you to contact us to arrange for a visit. Oops, Chuck, you're still on mute. That sounds great, Steve. Appreciate it. Uh, it's an excellent presentation. I think uh, there's so much synergy here that could be among the various people participating, not only in our, within our panel, but without the in, with, uh, throughout the entire session. I'm sure you're happy to talk with people that love to use your technology to develop those, and not just SoCal Gas, but others as well. Is that correct? Certainly. Yeah, absolutely. Good. And I've got a couple of questions for you, but uh, are you time limited or can you stay around for the end of our session? I'll stick around for sure. Oh, great. Okay. Well, so then I'll just move on to our uh, next speaker, TJ Pascatch. He's with um, uh, San Joaquin Renewables. It's up, we're going back up to Bakersfield again or near Bakersfield. Uh, TJ is a president uh, and CEO of both of Frontline Bioenergy, but also um, Renewables. He's had a wide extensive uh, career um, as a, a CEO with other organizations. Uh, he's got the PhD in chemical engineering and so on and so forth. So I'll let I turn it over to TJ. You're, I see you're there, up and ready and teed up. And thank you and welcome. And uh, we look forward to hearing about your focus, which I suspect is not right on municipal solid waste, but it's more oh, looking right. at what's in the, sa the, the salad bowl, back to the salad bowl again, right? Yeah, it's more of the, the mixed nuts. <laughs> no. Thanks, Chuck. Uh, yeah, so main point of this uh, talk will be to, to tell about the project we're developing in the San Joaquin Valley. Um, it's in, actually in the city of McFarland, so it's north of Bakersfield, about 25 miles. Um, it's a, it's a large transportation biofuel project. The biofuel we're producing is renewable natural gas. Um, and the, the project will be called San Joaquin Renewables. So before we get started, we, we do still have some, some equity offering underway. So if I predict the future, uh, I don't know what I'm talking about and you shouldn't rely on it. There you go. So first of all, you know, you talked about, uh, Chuck, when you started talking about the expense of direct air capture, and that's true. The thing about direct air capture is it happens all the time. This is a leaf, right? So we have sunshine and we have atmospheric CO2. That ends up being a solid biomass. That's, um, that's the carbon that's captured. It's natural, it's inevitable, and it's actually huge. It's very efficient and it's everywhere you look, right? And so we have this biomass um, issue where you have lots of sunshine like the San Joaquin Valley or the, the whole Central Valley actually of California. Um, the water is provided by um, irrigation, but you know, in, in places where it's rain, that's not required. And we've had, we've seen the effect of the wildfire. So it's actually a huge, a huge issue. Um, it's in the millions and millions of tons, right? So um, we have agriculture and forest growth are producing this large amount of biomass and it's not suitable for anaerobic digestion, uh, but it actually is perfect for what we do, which is thermal gasification. So it's important to note that because this is not municipal solid waste, you know, many of the regulations that Chuck was talking about actually don't apply to this. Um, and so we do have this large, what I consider a very large and valuable resource um, in California. So Bioenergy Association of California put this out and I've seen other folks refer to it, but we call these green, um, and, it, and you could call the lignocellulosic fraction to the extent you were able to recover it, uh, but we're really interested in, in the bottom two. So agriculture residue and forest and forest product residue as non-digestible organics. And that's what, that's what we can convert. Um, it's important to note, and you know, this push, you know, talking about the energy transition towards electrification, but if we have wind and solar, we're not playing in carbon. And, and Chuck, Kind of touched on this too is that to go carbon negative you've got to play with carbon which in our case means converting biomass which used to be biogenic or which used to be atmospheric co2 and so through photosynthesis we have access to the solid form of formerly uh, atmospheric co2 and we have to do something with that or we'll never go carbon negative and so that's kind of where we fit into the picture you know, in California and the Central Valley, uh, existing options for biomass and those millions of tons I'm, I'm talking about is mostly ag waste. 
um, they're limited. So we, we have had in the past uh, a very large and thriving uh, in, incineration with heat recovery for electric power, the so-called cogen plants. Um, issues, some of the issues that they've experienced is they use a lot of water. Uh, they use cooling towers to, to cool the, the condenser um, after a steam turbine, for example. Um, they also have the, the combustion emissions. So that's NOx, um, you know, particulates and so forth. And they can be regulated under Title V, um, you know, emissions controls and so forth, but, but they're kind of on the decline, it seems like. Um, there are folks that want to do business plans where they take the biomass and ship it off to places like Japan. Of course, that uses fuel all the way across. Um, I consider that inefficient. It's, it's, even if the biomass is free when you've originated, it's expensive by the time it gets where it's going. Um, we've got uh, a big push for grinding and soil incorporation. Um, the Air District, uh, San Joaquin Valley Air District is promoting that with, um, with subsidies. And there are issues, however, with that. Uh, decomposition is actually pretty slow in a desert and even with artificial um, irrigation. Um, it's not clear um, how it ties up nitrogen in the soil. It looks like that may be a, an issue. Uh, we certainly see fungus growing in the way almonds and walnuts are harvested. They're swept off the ground. And so if you have mushrooms growing, that's not necessarily the best thing. We're also harboring uh, growth in nematodes, um, soil bacteria that um, if, the, if the orchard was diseased, it's not clear that those diseases are, are not uh, given a safe harbor in underground uh, incorporation. And then we have potential for just mechanical issues with larger chunks of wood. And pretty much when we go out and talk to farmers in the valley, um, they're not super thrilled with this approach. And uh, not saying it doesn't work, but it, there may be a better options out there. And so, you know, currently we're left with, and you still see it when you, when you traipse around the valley, lots of open burning happening. Everyone knows it's highly polluting. Um, the valley topology doesn't allow for a lot of air exchange, so it just hangs in the air um, and currently discouraged and it's soon to be banned, at least in the, in the SJ uh, Air District, San Joaquin Valley Air District. So what else is there, right? So um, conversion to renewable fuel, you just heard the former speaker talking about this and our process is similar in some ways. Um, we do a process called thermal gasification. It's more traditional gasification, although we do have advanced technology that I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but we can take that solid fuel feedstock, go through a gasification process. The first thing we produce is the synthesis gas, and it's largely carbon monoxide, hydrogen. There's also CO2 and moisture, um, methane and other light hydrocarbons. Um, Frontline Bioenergy, which is the parent company um, for San Joaquin Renewables, We've tagged this line, fueling the energy transition. So transitioning to electricity, in our opinion, will still take fuel. And we like that, you know, uh, make a carbon negative fuel and then you can have carbon negative electricity that results from its use. Um, Frontline's been around uh, for about 16 years and our founder has been in this gasification space his entire career, more than 25 years. Uh, we have advanced technologies in clean gasification and we'll be putting those to use uh, in this project. Two of them in particular that are, are core and key to, to this process is what we call PM free gas and tar free gas. Um, and just like they sound, we're engineers, so we're not that imaginative when we come up with our trademarks, but it's gas that's completely free, uh, completely free by completely free. I mean, with five nines efficiency. So not like cyclones that still leave ash um, and biochar in the gas. This is high efficiency filtration which leaves air or leaves the gas cleaner in terms of particulate than probably the air you're breathing right now. Um, and then tar-free gas is um, a way to produce an extraordinarily low tar synthesis gas that is suitable to go directly to catalytic reactors after filtration with the PM free gas technology. I won't say much more about the technology. If folks have questions on that, I'm certainly happy to answer. I uh, just wanted to show you kind of where the technology is coming from uh, for this project. Um, the process overall makes use of that um, frontline core technology here. Um, it's going to have an air separation plant. We do use oxygen and steam in the gasification. Like I said, it's, it's somewhat akin to a more traditional gasification process. Um, nitrogen for inerting and bringing biomass up to, up to gas fire pressure. That just simply gets vented. Um, the process, the air separation process produces a co-product argon that's valuable and we'll actually sell that into industry. 
the main product is the, the energy, the RNG for pipeline, um, and we'll produce a pipeline quality RNG that's over 97% methane. Um, and it's important to note this project, this project is a VEX project. So we do have carbon capture sequestration. So we do have this, um, it is a VEX project. And so with this carbon sequestration well, and we'll be one of the first in California, we've spent an extraordinary amount of money on geology and study and permitting for that. Um, and it's gonna be a long haul to get that permit, but um, California Central Valley does have some of the most suitable geology in the whole country for carbon uh, sequestration. So we're, incur we're hopeful that we'll, we'll make it through that. Um, we also produce a biochar co-product and we'll expect that to go into compost or as a direct land application. And you know, some of the earlier speakers talking about land application, biochar has many of the same benefits with soil moisture retention, uh, potential smoothing out of, of fertilizer application um, and so forth. So and the project produces a lot of that, a little bit more on that later. And then uh, ammonium sulfate fertilizer. So the nitrogen that's in the biomass um, ends up in our product or in our project as, a, as an ammonium sulfate fertilizer. Um, it's a 40% solution ready for, and, ready for application. One thing about this project, we're actually a microgrid as well. So we'll be grid independent. Um, the, the electricity for the project only comes from a uh, dedicated power facility. There'll be about a 28 megawatt power facility as part of the project. Most of the time it runs on renewable natural gas that we produce. We do have the, the ability to start up with a pipeline access um, for black start of the project because we don't have electricity other than that, that power station that we have. So we really, everything that comes out of the project is a valuable product and there's really nothing uh, left over, so to speak, um, which we're, we're proud of that. So again, I, I mentioned it's going to be one of the first BEX projects in California. Um, whoops, went the wrong way. Sorry. Um, 125 jobs. So it's a, it's a large facility, but it's going to be fairly highly um, automated. Um, there's a lot of of jobs though produced and the it should be noted that the area where we're building this is a fairly dis, uh, economically disadvantaged uh, community if you've seen the movie with kevin costner and mcfarland usa it's fairly accurate um, as far as that goes and just a bit of the scale the air quality benefit and in the valley nox is really a huge issue um, in terms of all the criteria pollutants nox is nox and particulate matter are the two that are are really bad and actually NOx and agricultural um, ammonia emissions contribute to additional particulate. So if we can remove the NOx, um, that's a big deal. And this, is, this project will remove the equivalent of 2,400 diesel trucks from the road. Um, just on a, again, by the numbers, the project is gonna consume about 400,000 dry tons of ag waste. Uh, that's, and I'll talk about feedstocks later. We don't use any water. So unlike the cogen plants, uh, the, the project is self-sufficient when it comes to water usage. Um, we'll, we'll produce 22,000 tons per year of that ammonium sulfate. The, it's a 40% solution. So some of the water that we actually produce goes out with the ammonium sulfate fertilizer and that'll meet um, you know, industry standard for that. The scale of the product RNG is about 29 million uh, gas and gallon equivalents. And again, it's pipeline quality. 50,000 tons per year of biochar and 5,000 tons per year of that liquid argon. Simultaneously, the project stores in, in these numbers, this is about right. So we bring in 400,000 tons per year of ag waste. You know, if you looked at the chemical formula of biomass, it's, uh, and thankfully the previous speaker went over this, but that material is about 50% carbon by weight. And CO2 has two oxygens for every carbon. Um, and biomass only has one. And so you end up uh, being able to sequester the same mass of the biomass that you bring in as CO2. Now only about half of the carbon that comes in the biomass ends up as CO2 in the sequestration well. The other half ends up in the RNG. A methane molecule has a carbon in it. And so that will produce CO2 when it's combusted, but um, that was biogenic CO2. Where are we? We did get our RIN pathway, so we will be able to produce D3 RINs with the project. Um, all our feedstock site and offtake agreements are executed and our permits are drafted. We actually submitted the uh, sequestration well permit already. 
and we're we've teed up on uh, CEQA, completing CEQA and also the air permit. Um, and we were able to announce last month we got our funding for the project secured, which was a big deal for us. We've been developing this project for three and a half years, so um, that was a that was a good day. <clears throat> so simply put, we create value from biomass. We don't use any water. We create jobs and we clean the air. So that's the simple message for this project. Uh, some people aren't really familiar with, with RNG. Um, it's probably more versatile than you even think. Everyone knows, I think, in this group because the big money right now is direct transportation fuel. So using it as a CNG uh, for compressed natural gas vehicles like diesel, you know, formerly diesel fueled trucks that can be either converted or built directly to consume CNG. And that's the big one. That's the, that's the high value market. However, you can take this RNG and at the scale that we're doing our plant, another way to do it is an input to other processes. So one way to do that and uh, would be replacing fossil natural gas. And that would reduce the uh, carbon intensity of the produced fuel. And I say biofuel, but it actually would be any fuel that uses uh, natural gas currently in its processing. So it could be traditional oil refining. We could lower the CI of traditional oil refining. Um, in, a, in a refinery, you need hydrogen for hydro treating. And this SMR is a steam methane reformer that converts natural gas into hydrogen. Um, and then uh, if you use RNG for that, then it's a negative CI hydrogen. And you'd have to establish that through the pathway, of course, but, but certainly the science is there for that. Ironically, you could use RNG with either fuel cells or internal combustion engines that are, are well uh, regulated and emission controlled to, to run EV charging stations. And again, the EV charging stations now, if you say, oh, we're gonna use renewable electricity, that's great. Well, where did it come from? If it's wind and solar, then the best you can do is about zero on the carbon intensity of that EV charging. If you use RNG to start with, you can go carbon negative with EV charging. And we're pretty excited about that as a future market. And then the other thing is just anything else natural gas is used for. Many people have natural gas in cooking, uh, heating, et cetera. And so natural gas as a biofuel is probably the most versatile biofuel you can think of. And uh, all these different applications of it, um, plus the infrastructure for distribution through the, the national pipeline network, make it just, just a great biofuel to go for. Um, a lot of folks have seen this. Uh, there were some speakers that mentioned the low carbon fuel standard and the CARB that regulates that uh, does these data um, charts, which I think are just great to show kind of where, where things stand. You see most of the carbon negative um, non-liquid fuels are these um, renewable natural gas. So this is biomethane, they call it bio CNG. Most of these projects would be the dairy digester projects and they have varying carbon intensities um, the carbon intensity of fossil is these black dots over here, which is 90 to 100 or so. Um, carbon zero would be carbon neutral. And then as you go negative, the more negative you go, the greener or the, the less, um, the more beneficial it would be to use this fuel to reduce greenhouse gas. And then under LCFS, the more carbon credits we'll generate as long as we're below the benchmark. So our project slates in right about here. It's important to note the size of these bubbles is the size of the project. So this is a relatively large project when it comes to carbon negative RNG, uh, about on par with the very largest um, dairy digester projects that have been built. And our carbon intensity is about minus 115 um, for this, for the RNG that we're going to produce. You mentioned the feedstocks and again, not not traditional, you know, MSW based organic waste. Our feedstocks are ag residue, ag waste, and then separated food waste. So this is nutshells. So we've got um, orchard wood waste. So this is from orchard removals. This would have been the same wood that, you know, for decades went to the, the cogen plants as fuel for electricity generation. As those projects kind of go dormant. Um, in fact, there's one that used to be about six miles from our project and it hasn't run for many years. Um, will be taking about the same amount of biomass as that plant used to use, a little bit more, but about on par with. Uh, we'll also use shells, so pistachio shells, almond shells, and walnut shells. So um, the area where this plant is, you know, the, the agriculture is largely 
um, nut orchards. And so we have these three types of nuts and we can use the shells from all three for those. Like I said, the project site's under control is actually, this is a good uh, a photo of it. Um, this is looking actually kind of to the Southwest, but this is the McFarland City Wastewater Treatment Plant. And we've purchased the land just to the North of that. Um, there is a PG&E substation in the corner of the lot and we could someday decide to make renewable electricity and, and push into the grid renewable electricity. Um, but we will, like I said, have a microgrid uh, for the project. What's neat about this, this land is we have the high pressure transmission line right under the project, uh, right under the property. And then there's a lower pressure distribution line that feeds the city of McFarland. Um, for our power island, we'll actually draw off for startup, we'll draw off of that low pressure line, but we'll feed product RNG into the high pressure line. And so that'll go out through the whole um, pipeline network in California. Right now, this, this land is bare ground. They were doing alfalfa. Um, they actually would, would spread the treated sewage on this land um, just as irrigation water after it was gone through treatment, secondary treatment. Um, the other thing that's neat about this property, which you can't see from looking at it, um, is that we're directly over a deep saline aquifer called the Vetter Sand, and that'll be the, the storage complex for CO2. And so the CO2 sequestration well will be directly on the project site. We won't have to run any CO2 pipelines or anything like that. The project is in uh, final stages, I guess, of permit preparation. Like I said, um, starting on the, the right, we've submitted our class six well permit, um, but we're about to, to finish off the CEQA initial studies. And, you know, I think most folks would, under, would, would know what CEQA is about, but it's just as a review, it's a holistic look at the environmental impact of the entire project. Um, and then the air permits, just looking at air, air emissions, What's neat about this project is we'll actually be a synthetic miner. Um, that means, and I'll, I'll get to that here in a sec, um, but it means that the emissions from this project are exceptionally low. And part of the reason we're able to do that is because we really, we don't have a, a stack. Um, there's only, you know, the sequestration well, there's an emergency flare. Almost all of our emissions come from what we predict as emergency flaring requirements for the year and then fugitive emissions, um, which is pretty cool. And then the class uh, six well for C CO2 sequestration, if you're not familiar with what that is, it's these are regulations that were drafted and promulgated almost 10 years ago and very little has been done with them uh, until recently as the 45Q tax credits have increased in value and the California low carbon fuel standard carbon credits have gone up in value. It started to create, it, uh, create an environment where this starts to make sense. And so um, when you develop your permit, it's a, it's a fairly daunting process to go through. It took us a long time, a uh, better part of a year. Um, would you have to address all of these issues? Um, and I won't, I won't just read this for you, but you have to address all these issues. You have to spend a lot of money and do extensive geology, geology studies. Um, and we've done all that. And our site appears to be suitable. I would say very suitable. Uh, like I said, we've submitted our application. Another thing to note is that just the class six EPA well, you can get that permitted, but to use the benefit for that under LCFS requires you to also comply with additional and more stringent regulations under the California low carbon fuel standard, what they call the California CCS protocol. And so right now we're, we're opening the next phase of this, which is to confirm compliance with all the CCS protocol requirements for that well. I mentioned before we'll be a synthetic miner and these would be the limits um, for Title V synthetic miner. And we will be well under these. Um, and I, you know, our max emissions would be those threshold values. And so I tried to calculate what is the air quality impact of our project. Um, and there's two, two ways that we reduce emissions. One is from the RNG production itself by em eliminating or um, avoiding pile burning emissions. Uh, of the feedstock. Um, so we can reduce from, say, for example, the PM 2.5 that would be generated by open burning of, of the, the wood feedstock. Um, so we're reducing almost all of that 99%. So almost all of the reductions from pile burning. And then on the RNG that we produce, the beneficial use of that, um, you know, the emissions from a CNG tailpipe 
versus a diesel tailpipe that would be transporting or moving the same load. Um, that comparison is here. So we're gonna see about a 99% reduction in PM and uh, over a 90% reduction in uh, NOx, 95 in CO, and 75% reduction in non-methane VOCs um, from that. So if you add those two together, uh, it, it becomes a big impact. Um, and I didn't list the CO2, but uh, basically it's that 400,000 tons per year um, that we're reducing. So that's, that's a big impact, we believe. Um, you know, uh, I didn't list, by the way, I'll go back up to this. I didn't list the methane VOC from the tailpipe. It's true that CN CNG vehicles do slip a little bit, little bit of, of methane, but compared to the reduction of pile burning methane emissions, it's still a very large reduction in that. Now, when pile burning gets banned, you know, we wouldn't be able to claim that anymore, but uh, there may be meth methane emissions from um, other sources or applications that, that would be an alternative fate for that biomass. That's all I have, and I'm, I'm able to stay around too for questions. Chuck, you're muted. We've had uh, about 15 minutes left. So we've got about three, uh, the four of us, I guess, we can all chat. I've got a bunch of questions for all three of you. Um, uh, can we get the other, can we get Melinda and uh, Steve on too? You probably have to turn off your share. Oh yeah, I do, sorry. There we go. Here comes Melinda. Good. There we go. So, uh, Melinda, my first question for you, if you don't mind, is, is okay, if we've heard from a couple of technology providers, you've got an existing facility that's been dependent on petroleum. How do you reach out or how, what kind of plan do you have to talk to uh, technology providers such as these guys provide us to try to find if there's a possible fit? So I think, Chuck, the answer to that is that we have been um, elevating our company profile, um, making ourselves very visible, um, both in Sacramento and, and just in the space. Um, in fact, TJ, TJ and I, or um, Sam Joaquin Renewables and Kern have met and, and have discussed all the great things that they're doing and how maybe there's potential um, for, for us to connect with them to, you know, look for ways that we can um, source their RNG that they're looking to produce and use in the refinery for exactly the things he talked about of, um, you know, reducing our carbon footprint, even for our existing operation. And so um, I think one great example of what we're doing is um, we have recently become the first, dare I say, petroleum company to be a member of the um, Bioenergy Association of, of California, or BAC, which, which I think was even the source of some of the data on uh, one or more of the slides that we saw. And so, um, you know, I, I think it's just partnering with, with who exists in that space and, and recognizing that there is this whole second industry that we associate with, right? Oil industry has long had industry groups, whether it be um, WISPA or NPRA, or I guess now it's AFPM and otherwise. And so it's integrating ourselves with those trade groups and with those industry associations on the renewable side. Um, we also work closely with the folks at CARB and with CEC to make sure that they know this is a place that we wanna be. To, to say, look, we want to be an innovator and an incubator. So where you have you know, new technologists coming to you that are looking for partners or, or looking for places that they can implement their ideas, we raise our hand and say, give them our name, let us talk. And, and it's just making yourself available and open to that, I think. So your phone lines are open for the various technology providers that are attending this conference if they think there might be a, a synergy there. Yes, they absolutely are. Great, great. I have a question for both Tom, uh, TJ rather, and um, uh, Steve. 
What kind of uh, parasitic loads do you have require to, to, to run your plants? Is it significant or I'm not thinking about startup, but once you have it in steady state operations, uh, is there a significant loss? Who do you want to go first? Should I go first? Oh yeah. Uh, that's, that's part of what we want to demonstrate with our uh, commercial demonstration project, but we believe that it's going to be on the order of 20%. Which is which is pretty darn good, right? Actually, that's exactly our number too. That's, <laughs> that's remarkable. Yep. Okay. About twenty percent so, of the gas that we produce goes to that power island I mentioned, and a lot of waste heat goes in there. There's a there's a waste heat based power generation there too from from the project. But yeah, it's almost exactly twenty percent. That's funny. So, uh, in terms of San Joaquin renewables, you're not really looking at municipal solid waste. Uh, but the core is definitely looking at possibly, well, you're using municipal solid waste now, but you're doing it at a scale where you avoid some of the permitting ha hassles and some of the regulations. What, what, are the, what are your plans for your two projects, if any, to look into the municipal solid waste space? I know you're already there, uh, Steve, but uh, what about you, TJ? Uh, are you thinking of looking at that too? Yeah, I mean, for, for a long time, I would say, for me, at least for the last, before we started working on the San Joaquin Renewables project, I was very focused on municipal solid waste. Um, I found that, you know, the regulatory environment to be kind of unfriendly. So we uh, kind of switched to biomass. We figured, you know, we found this, this nice area in California where there's lots of it around. And um, so, yeah, uh, we, we certainly can process that with our technology. We spent a long time describing all that. Um, it's a little bit more expensive. It takes higher metallurgies, the, but certainly technically possible, just a challenge from regulation for sure. Well, we've got to get rid of 75% of the organic waste that's been going to landfills by the year 2025. And, we're, and if you look at the tonnages that are going for disposal, we're going the wrong direction. We're actually increasing the amount of tonnage going to land disposal. So something needs to be done with that. And I try to make the argument as best I can that uh, uh, it's time for us to rethink uh, some of the limitations and prohibitions that exist in the public res resources code. Uh, as uh, Steve, are you going to be stuck with building uh, 20, uh, one ton a day plants for the rest of your life? Or you got plans to go a little bigger than that? And how do you plan on navigating the, uh, the, the uh, regulatory hurdles for municipal solid waste? Well, I would say that, that we're not fixed on any particular waste source. So I totally agree with TJ. There's a lot easier waste sources out there than municipal solid waste, and we'll be pursuing those as well. In an urban setting, there is a substantial fraction of urban demolition wood that's easier for us to process than municipal solid waste. So I would say that we're very agnostic about the waste source, looking at each particular use case independently. As far as the regulatory aspects of this goes, we recognize that that's a huge challenge that, we, that is confronting us. And we're right now looking for our first commercial partner to engage in that process. Yeah. We've been talking to CARB and the other regulatory agencies so they know what we're doing, that we're going to be coming to them shortly with requests for projects. But until we get that first one, first deal inked, uh, that's, that's a, a future challenge to confront. Well, I know Julia Levin, I think, is gonna, with BAC is going to be on the next panel. I hope she is. I think she is. And uh, the, um, uh, you know, I made reference to that uh, uh, op-ed that was in the Mercury News this morning by Winston Hickox and Jim Boyd, who used to be with the Energy Commission. And they're making the argument that California is losing its leadership in, in the climate change, particularly after the COP26, a huge emphasis on the need to refocus on short-lived climate pollutants. And that's really things that are generating methane now uh, that to try to keep them from generating methane and use that material to produce low carbon energy fuels and chemicals. And I, I'm, you know, CARB has been going headlong on this electrification route and, and away from portable fuels. And but, but there's uh, Winston and, and uh, Jim Boyd make the, I think the very strong case that there's a need to rethink that. And you can get a lot of benefits as you guys have pointed out, some of the very low carbon uh, intensity fuels, negative intensity fuels are a heck of a lot better than electrification, probably better than electrification will be for many decades. So why are not we, why are we running headlong away from these already 
demonstrated lower car carbon fuels uh, to something that is not low carbon. And, and it, there needs to be some re rethinking that. And, and, and as Jim and Winston point out, uh, uh, California seems to be looking not at the science uh, behind all of this, but beginning it is looking maybe too much at some of the public policy issues that they think are out there driving this whole thing, like electrification. So I don't know how you feel about that, but I, I certainly think organizations like uh, the California Bioresources Alliance and, and the California Bioenergy Association, we should be able to put together a, 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 an effective advocacy strategy to a, maybe like refocus on how we need to, to do a biomass energy uh, focus going into the future to help companies like Kern make the transition to the future and, and be able to provide a low carbon, uh, lower carbon energy uh, framework than we have today. Uh, I'm happy to take other questions on the question A. I see a few have rolled in. Let me see if I can find what they are. Um, okay. Let's see. What are the time frames for TJ's feedstock acquisition contracts? Multiple time frames, spot market, midterm, long term. This is from um, Mike Thoreau. Yeah, Michael. Um, I know Michael. So we all um, know Michael. Believe me. <laughs> <laughs> they're they're long term. Uh, they're ten year contracts with an extra five years optional. So relatively long term, I think. So there is some spot market um, in our basket, I guess, if you will, too, but, but not much. Okay. What um, is the type of power block that you're using? I'm not even sure I understand the question. Uh, yeah, I think I sure. do. So that's, okay. we have um, Yenbacher um, internal combustion engines that have the highest efficiency um, selective catalytic reduction for NOx reduction. Um, they, are, they are super low emissions. Um, Engines will also have an <clears throat> organic ranking cycle for waste heat uh, conversion to electricity. And um, yeah, so that's basically the, the power block. Is Yenbacher still GE or is it, are they different now? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> that's a good question. <laughs> well, I know it's We're okay, actually going anyway, through a third party for mind. that piece. So. I'm just yeah. demonstrating my own ignorance. Okay, well, um, we got all five more minutes. I don't see any more questions that are from the uh, towards our panel. Um, uh, so, you think you're going to be up and running, uh, TJ, in what a year, two years? There we go, predicting the future. Um, <laughs> okay, well, I, we won't hold you to it. I promise. <laughs> uh, four years, maybe. I think that's reasonable. It could be faster than that, but it probably won't be. But. Yeah, good. And you know, when, is, when does San Joaquin really plan on getting eliminating open burning in the in the in the district? Is I believe it's banned as of twenty twenty four. Is my understanding. So, by the time you go online, you use the credit you'd be able to get from the existing uh, diverting away from uh, burning, right? So, it's a good question. Um, whether it's open burned. So if it's open burn, there's a slight um, additional benefit because the, the greenhouse gas, the other, the other emissions besides CO2 that are present there, there's some, there's some NOx and methane that, that have a higher you know, greenhouse gas intensity. It's not a huge or significant difference. It, it's probably true that once open burning is banned that our CI may creep up a little bit, you know, a few points because of that, but um, that's okay. Okay. <clears throat> Melinda, do you have anything you wanted to add in terms of uh, what you've been hearing today from these groups? And do you, do you feel uh, hopeful and <laughs> energized for the future here as this? I, I know you guys are under the gun of being a petroleum company, but you want to, you can't get, get away from it today or tomorrow, but maybe sometime in the future, make that, and we got to figure out a way to make that transition process uh, hopefully as painless as possible. Well, check, and, and that's exactly what we're looking to do. And, and I think, you know, the comments that you made just a moment ago about the op-ed that was, you know, published earlier today, I, I think that's spot on. And, and it's getting enough folks to kind of come at it with the right mindset that, you know, we, we, we it's very cliche, but we have to be in this together. And at the heart of it, this is a complex issue, and there is not going to be one simple solution for the magnitude of what the problem is. And so it is, 
it's critical that we come at this without marking things off the table, without having predetermined the technology, um, without putting you know all of our eggs in one basket, so to speak, because it's it's the collection of multiple solutions to this that are going to get us where we need to be, and that are going to maintain our momentum across the time frame that it's going to take to make this happen. Well, that's the frustration I keep feeling after decades of trying to see if there's a way to amend the sub things of the restrictions in the public resources code related to solid waste to try to get away from these flat out bans on things called transformation and things they include under the definition of transformation and really look at more performance. If you can meet the performance standard exactly. of producing the fuel, if you can eliminate the emissions and you can demonstrate that you can do that, uh, wh why not? I just, uh, is, is this what I see? And, and it, unfortunately, there's just that non-scientific thinking in a lot of circles that uh, they want to want to try to drive the future situation. And it just is not changing. I've tried to have so many conversations with staff over at the legislature and they, you mentioned the word conversion technologies or transformation or anything like that, and they just run the other direction. Yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right. And every incremental benefit that we can get along the way is absolutely worth it. Yeah, I agree. I, yeah, yeah, I think not, yeah, go ahead. What's, what's really great about the LCFS program specifically is that it, it re, it's going to reward the most carbon negative approaches Yeah. because, you know, if you have something that's better and more um, produces a lower CI, you're rewarded more highly. And so the market they've created there is gonna naturally prefer technologies that are that are greener. Now, having said that, it's all hands on deck because, you know, like Melinda said, it's gonna take all the efforts and you don't wanna just tell people no because you're not uh, good enough or we've decided a priori that we don't like that thing that you do, you know, even though it could be done correctly and well. Yeah, you don't want to keep moving the goalposts. You want to say, "Where's what the goalposts are?" And then, okay, if you can meet those goalposts, you've got. And you can't. It may take a few years to get there, but you don't want to have those goalposts move in the interim. So yeah. I and I would, I would also add that the, the carbon intensity calculations employed by CARB under LCFS are scientifically rigorous. They actually are doing an excellent job. I was very surprised at how thorough they are when looking at how to calculate these CIs. Uh, me, as a scientist, I was like, wow, I mean, they're really being yeah. fair. I mean, they're really looking at it correctly. Yeah, they're really dedicated guys over there, girl, yeah. guys, guys and girls over there at the, the, uh, the CARB that do this work. I am always very impressed with their diligence. Yeah. And it, it was kind of the core thing being put together uh, of this whole carbon intensity back in the day when, when they were first developing the low carbon fuel standard. and. It was really, I think it's a model uh, for almost everything to do with climate change and greenhouse gas emissions. And I wish it could be emulated elsewhere in terms of uh, other uh, types of programs, not just transportation fuels. Yep. Okay, well, I think we've reached our three o'clock cutoff time. Um, I'm happy to turn the baton back over to whomever is ready to accept it. Um, and I, I'm really interested in hearing the next, uh, I think we may have a five minute break or something, but we'll come back for the next final session. Yeah. Uh, hi, this is Lauren. And yeah, we'll have a 15 minute break. And then the next session, um, Anthe Alexiotis with um, uh, CARB is going to be uh, moderating it and um, get me. And um, then we'll hopefully have uh, some time for an open discussion where everybody can pose their questions and issues and uh, get into a discussion. So that'll Great. start at 3.15. So I um, hope you all be back at 3.15. I'll, I'll be here for sure. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Bashai's office wanted to call you and let you know we got your results of your stress test and I wanted to schedule a follow-up for you. Please
Ready to go, Lauren? I'm ready to go. Okay. You're on. Okay. OK, so hi, everybody. We'll get started with our final uh, session of the symposium. Um, Anthe Alexiadis uh, with the California Air Resources Board will be hosting this and um, we'll uh, have several presentations followed by an open discussion. So hopefully everybody can participate in the discussion. Um, Anthe is uh, working on the um, uh, short-lived climate pollutant policy uh, at uh, CARB and uh, we'll discuss that. Um, and then have several other presenters. Um, so, Anthe, take it. Hi, everyone. Thanks for sticking with us through this last panel of the day. Um, I'd like to ask the organizer to go to my first slide, please. Um, my name is Anthe Alexiades. I'm with the California Air Resources Board. And I'm really pleased to introduce this great panel of speakers um, who are here to share their perspectives on a few different and highlight some of the challenges and provide us insight into how we can further improve on some of the leading ideas that we've been hearing about over the past two days of this symposium. Um, so before we turn to them, I wanted to start out with a couple of quick slides to give you all an overview of the state's current efforts that intersect with bioresources management. Um, so uh, Alan, please, I have a, another slide I'd like to, to start out with. You could go back. Thank you, that's it. I had a title slide to introduce the panel too, but that's okay, we'll start here. This is great, thank you. Um, the, the one with the pies is great, yeah, thanks, okay. Um, so my work at CARB is focused on strategies to reduce methane and other short-lived climate pollutants in the waste sector. Uh, so I've personally been really excited to see all of the increasing awareness of the importance of reducing methane, um, and especially the commitments that we've been seeing recently, most notably the Global Methane Pledge that was announced at the UN Climate Convention in Glasgow just a few weeks ago. I think, you know, since well over half of the methane emissions, both statewide and across the US, are from livestock and landfills. Um, I think that means that we can really expect to see significant focus moving forward on the waste and agricultural sectors. And California is really well poised to be a leader in these efforts. So on the next side, um, you can see each one of these programs, policies, plans, or initiatives play a role in supporting improvements in how we manage organic residues in the state. So just to highlight a few of these, the California Climate Investments, which are funded by cap and trade auction proceeds, provide targeted funding for incentive programs like organic waste grants that are helping to prevent edible food waste and expand our compost and anaerobic digestion capacity. And CCI also funds healthy soils projects for agricultural practices that sequester carbon in soils, and that includes things like compost application and practices like reduced tillage, cover cropping, and whole orchard recycling, which one of our panelists, uh, Brent, is going to tell us a lot more about in a few minutes. Um, and then CCI also funds dairy manure projects and many others that aren't shown here, including forest health and land conservation activities. Uh, in addition to grants, we also have other incentive programs like LCFS and Biomat, which have been discussed uh, throughout the symposium. And those programs both reward the production of bioenergy from waste resources. And then, of course, the state also oversees regulations that drive changes in the solid waste sector. 
Um, so I think most notably CalRecycle's 1383 organic waste regulations that we heard about in the first panel this morning um, is going to be a huge step forward in building up the organic waste collection, processing, recycling infrastructure, um, and as well as you know stimulating market demand for all types of different products made from organic waste through its procurement targets. Um, so we're really going to need all of those things in place in order to meet the legislative target of reducing landfill disposal 75% by 2025, and hopefully eventually, uh, you know, entirely phasing out landfilling of organics at some point in the future. So meanwhile, until we get there, um, CARB's landfill methane regulation helps to mitigate emissions from that waste that's already been disposed in landfills. And then we're also learning a lot through our methane research programs that will help us identify and mitigate leaks, as well as understand what further actions or new technologies and practices can really be effective at preventing emissions. And then finally, you know, the state's always engaged in a number of planning and scoping efforts to help guide future activities. So just a couple examples of those are the Wildfire and Forest Resilience Action Plan and the Climate Smart Land Strategy, which lay out vision, a vision for how we manage our terrestrial carbon stocks and make those systems more resilient in adapting to climate change. So collectively, all of these plans and policies inform the state's vision for transforming the conventional ways that we manage our food waste, our manure, and other agricultural residues, as well as how we manage our landscapes in order to get our carbon neutrality and air quality goals. So I'm going to leave it there and transition to our panelists. Um, I just want to remind the audience, if you have questions for us, uh, for the panelists as they're speaking, please send those over using the Q&A function in Zoom, and I'll get those in the queue for our discussion session after we've heard all the presenters. Um, so let me go ahead and introduce our first panelist now. We have Dr. Scott Coffin with the State Water Resources Control Board, uh, where he leads development of drinking water regulations and advises strategies for managing microplastics. So we're really fortunate to have him here today to get us all up to speed on the impacts of microplastics in the context of land applying biosolids from wastewater treatment plants. If we can get uh, Scott's presentation up, then you can take it away, Scott. Thanks. Thanks, Anthi. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, as Anthi mentioned, I'm going to be talking about microplastics, and really this is an emerging field, so there's going to be a lot more unknowns, uh, fewer solutions in place at the moment. Uh, next slide, please. So by now we're all familiar with the plastic waste crisis. Uh, everywhere we look, we seem to find these plastic particles uh, from the deepest part of the ocean to the tallest mountain, as well as the air we breathe and the food we eat. Next slide, please. As plastic enters the environment, it degrades into smaller particles, but it doesn't fully degrade. Uh, we can visualize this degradation in the form of microscopy. Uh, for example, this is a polyethylene facial scrub uh, from uh, back when facial scrubs were allowed to have polyethylene beads added to them. Uh, looking through a scanning electron microscope, we can actually visualize the formation of micro and nano sized plastic particles just from one small micro bead. Next slide, please. So when microbeads and other plastics, uh, primary plastics that degrade into microplastics and uh, as well as um, uh, intentionally added microplastics go into the drain, uh, they can go to wastewater treatment plants and some amount of that will be discharged into the final effluent, but the majority of that is going to be sequestered into the sludge. So if the treatment plant has secondary treatment, they're removing around 88% of the sludge. And if they go all the way to tertiary treatment, they're removing up to 99% of the microplastics into sludge. Next slide, please. Uh, in California, about 75% of biosolids are land applied. Um, this is based on a, a 2013 assessment from the California Association of Sanitation Agencies. Um, the, uh, a decent portion of this is class A, uh, sold as compost or land applied, and class B used for agriculture. Um, some of this is also used as uh, cover, uh, as well as uh, some goes to landfill. Uh, next slide, please. A recent study looking at archived biosolid samples all the way back from 1950 found a strong correlation between the microplastic content in those biosolids and the global plastics production. Uh, and 
right now the global plastics production is on an exponential increase so we are expected to see increasing concentrations of microplastics in our biosolids moving forward a recent study in germany uh, looked at microplastics in uh, agriculture as and modeled the ways that they can get into agriculture. So they considered three different routes. One is uh, plastic culture, uh, which is mulch film and cover tarps and any other type of plastic products that are intentionally used on farms. Another is sewage sludge, so then the form of biosolids, and then compost. Uh, oh, um, if you could go back. Um, and the, the, the dark line here on the bottom is the mulch film and cover tarp. Uh, the sewage sludge, um, you can see, um, outnumbers that uh, by several orders of magnitude. So uh, this is over over time. Um, prior to 1980, Germany was not using much in the way of biosolids. So that's uh, why we see a huge increase there. And so for the farms in California that are using biosolids, they are likely contributing significant quantities of microplastics onto their land uh, relative to the the uh, mulch film and cover tarps and other types of plastic uh, that they're using on those farms. Next slide, please. So what happens? Why, why do we care? Uh, once microplastics are in the soil, plants can uptake and accumulate these plastic particles through their roots, and those can be distributed out through the shoots. Uh, this is a visualization here uh, on the submicron uh, plastic uptake via crack entry. Um, so you can you can actually visualize the the particles being taken up into uh, um, into the pores and distributed out through the the shoots. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, my, my microplastics can in. Uh, interact with plants in other ways. Um, they can integrate into the soil's biophysical environment, <clears throat> especially if the, the plastic particles are fragments. Uh, they tend to have more uh, effects on the biophysical environment. And there are uh, some recent studies uh, demonstrating this here. Next slide, please. So what does this matter for the plant, the, the plant growth? Um, a recent study exposing nano-sized plastics to a, a Arabidopsis uh, plant, which is a, uh, a, a sort of model plant, found that with increasing concentrations, they saw decreased plant growth. And particularly when the nano-sized plastics were modified with uh, uh, NH2 groups, they saw um, higher uh, effects or more pronounced effects. Next slide, please. We know that the bioaccumulation uh, in the rhizosphere can actually decrease the, gr the growth rate as well as the nutrient uptake. Um, corn treated with polyethylene showed reduced uh, growth over time. And uh, you can actually see this uh, visually with this, this figure from the, the recent publication. Next slide, please. This may also have impacts to the food that's produced by these plants. Uh, 2021 study found that environmentally realistic concentrations of microplastics in soils reduce the number of mature tomatoes produced by tomato plants uh, with a very high concentration used actually eliminating all uh, tomato production from this plant. It's unclear how contaminated California's farmlands are that are using biosolids. Uh, so it, it's, it's hard to know at what point in the future we might anticipate to see reduced plant growth or if we are actually seeing that right now. Next slide, please. Looking beyond, uh, below the surface of the plant, actually looking at the terrestrial ecosphere, uh, we can look at to the literature for laboratory studies that have been conducted on organisms that live, live in soils. So um, looking at not just the plants, but the fungi, the bacteria, archaea, arthropods. And here we can actually compare the concentrations of what's been found in the environment to the laboratory effect concentrations for each of these species and build what's called a species sensitivity distribution. That's what's shown uh, on, the, on the right uh, sinuous curve here with all the, the colored points. The red line is overlaying the uh, environmental occurrence. So what we've actually documented in global terrestrial uh, biospheres. And uh, typically you, uh, you, won't, you don't want to see any overlap between these two lines. That means that there's risk occurring for those species. And in this global risk assessment, they found that at least 5% of species are at risk in 63% of soil samples globally. Another way of saying, another way of looking at this is that 
22% of species are at risk and 5% of samples. So this is, this is certainly concerning from a risk assessment point of view, uh, but we don't have any data for California. This is entirely based on other countries. Next slide, please. Uh, in addition to the direct impacts just on a normal system, we also know that microfibers can exacerbate drought condi conditions. Um, there was a recent study that found that the microplastics alter the dominance of different plant species, promoting one and decreasing the growth of another type of species. Next slide, please. So one of the critical concerns with plastic is that it doesn't really go away. In the marine environment, it can take between as little as two years, but as long as uh, thousands of years to fully degrade. And this brings to mind, or, or it brings the question of whether or not we should be using biodegradable products in society as a replacement for plastics. Next slide, please. So what is the big deal with bioplastics? Uh, should we be using them? Are, are there certain ones that are better than others? Uh, what's the impact to our agricultural systems? Next slide, please. So not all bioplastics are created equally. First off, a product can be a uh, bioplastic, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's biodegradable. Uh, in some cases, these biodegradable plastics are absolutely compostable in a home, co home composting system, uh, uh, PHA or, and PHBs, as well as thermoplastic starch um, are highly degradable but more commonly used bioplastics like PLA or polylactic acid really needs an industrial composting facility. You can't just throw it in your backyard. And if we are moving forward with bio-based plastics, we wanna make sure that these actually biodegrade in realistic conditions that they're exposed to. Next slide, please. Some considerations for bioplastics. There has been a recent study that showed that Compostable plastic bags can increase the aflatoxin content in the soils, uh, specifically Aspergillus flavus. Um, this has to do with the, the actual degradation of these plastics. Uh, we can't always control the types of organisms that are going to eat the bioavailable sugars uh, and, and, and compose these. And in this case, it turns out to be a, a hazardous um, a microorganism. Uh, so in this case, they found that burying compostable film in the soil actually reduces the soil quality and can increase the risks from aflatoxins to consumers. Next slide, please. If we're moving to bioplastics, it's important to recognize that we already have very limited phosphorus and nitrogen in the uh, in the soils in our environment, especially in the Midwest. Uh, this is a had been recognized as a high risk planetary boundary threat for the earth and switching from oil to using corn to make single use uh, products is not a solution. And we should really be thinking about using waste, organic waste to make plastic products and ideally reducing the amount of single use products that we use in general. Next slide, please. Um, just, this is actually a look into the literature for microplastics. And the red here is looking at biology. So the effects on just organisms. Um, the, the next you can see is sea and freshwater, uh, soil, and then um, the, the lowest line here is atmosphere. So the, the evidence or the scientific evidence for impacts of microplastics in the soil is only just beginning. We are absolutely just scratching the surface here. And if in the next two or three years, we're going to learn a tremendous more about the potential impacts. Um, coming down the line after that is, is what's in the air. Uh, so Anthe, we'll, we'll have uh, some chats about that. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the solutions that we are looking at in the state water board in the Cal EPA is looking upstream and trying to reduce the amount of plastic that enters the environment to begin with, as opposed to trying to take it out of the waste stream at the end, as biosolids are a uh, useful nutrient, it's a useful resource, and we don't want to be contaminating those biosolids. Uh, removing microplastics from biosolids is likely impossible, and so really we should be focusing far upstream. Uh, we are on, on a business as usual track. We will be doubling the amount of plastic pollution we produce by 2030. And so we really need to think about reducing as our primary directive here. Next slide, please. I just wanna 
put up a quote here from Pete Seeger. Uh, this was actually written into Berkeley ordinance uh, law. Uh, if it can't be reduced, reused, repaired, rebuilt, refurbished, refinished, resold, recycled, or composted, then it should be restricted, redesigned, or removed from production. So this is sort of the underlying uh, logic here that, that the California EPA is trying to promote for plastic pollution. And uh, with that, that's all I have, and I will pass it back over to Anthi. Thanks so much, Scott. That was really compelling. Um, we're going to save all the questions to the end, so I look forward to discussing more with you. Um, moving right along now, we have Dr. Brent Holtz, who has been a palmology farm advisor for the University of California for 27 years and the county director of the UC Cooperative Extension Office in San Joaquin County for 12 years. Brent's research and education programs are focused on sustainable practices for growing almonds and fruit. And today he's going to talk with us about his work on whole orchard recycling. Welcome, Brent. Thank you, Anthony. Should I share my screen or? Uh, the organizers should be working on getting that up, but if you can beat them to it, feel free. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> well, thank you uh, very much. And I'm going to speak on whole orchard recycling to reduce organic residue, uh, build soil organic matter, carbon and fertility. Um, this project uh, is very dear to me. It started about 40 years ago and this is my family's farm in the San Joaquin Valley, north of Modesto. It got surrounded by a city and back even before there were air, air quality restrictions, we couldn't burn our brush from our annual prunings because we were in the city limit. So we had to find an alternative. And my dad ended up purchasing this uh, brush bandit wood chipper and we started chipping our brush and putting it back on our soils uh, decades ago. And as a graduate student, I started wondering how these wood chips were affecting the soil quality and the nutrients and the mushrooms that would, we see would growing in this. And I did a series of experiments as when I became a farm advisor with the University of California looking at wood chip soils and non wood chip soils. And uh, here on the left, after about a decade of wood chipping, you could see this dark organic matter layer forming, which was much higher in carbon and nutrients than than this, this uh, non wood chip soil here on the right. And to summarize quickly that decade of research, uh, the wood chipped orchards had more mushrooms, basidiomycetes, more bacterial and fungal feeding nematodes. And these were the good kind of nematodes for soils, not the plant pathogenic time kind. And we saw increased soil nutrient levels. We saw lower pH, more organic matter, higher soil carbon, so um, I wondered, could, could we recycle a whole orchard and put all those wood chips back in the ground? And could we do that without negatively impacting the next generation orchard that we're gonna plant? And I started again with the, the oldest trial in 2000 using the, the family uh, wood chipper again, but I uh, measured up chips and soil and I added the wood chips to, to to 10 barrels and planted a tree. And I added 10 barrels without wood chips and planted a tree. And I, I followed the, the tree growth. So here's, here's the 10 barrels, uh, here's 20 barrels. 10 of them had wood chips and soil and 10 of them just had soil. And I followed their growth uh, throughout the next several years. And um, here, here, here they are pretty big growing. And here, like, again, we see a lot of mushroom growth. And the main point of this trial was that the first couple of years, the, the, the trees without wood chips had, had better tree growth. And this was a trunk circumference. But then by the fourth or fifth year, uh, we started seeing significantly better growth in the trees with the wood chips. So I, I felt from this trial that, that we could do this on a larger scale. And, I, and um, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, and I've been following this, I've followed this, uh, 
this trial for about 20 years now, and, and we do see significant increases in soil organic matter, and more importantly, soil organic carbon, uh, even after 20 years. So um, it's, uh, it's been a, a good mechanism of increase, increasing soil carbon, and I wanted to, to test this on a larger sta stage rather than just in barrels. So I, uh, again, could we recycle a whole orchard without negatively impacting the next orchard we were gonna plant? So this time I went to uh, an actual orchard at the Kearney Research and Extension Center, which is a UC owned uh, test farm south of Fresno in the city of Parlier. And I used this iron wolf, which uh, to grind up trees it's, uh, it wasn't made to grind up trees, it's a rock crusher. It weighs 100,000 pounds and has 1,000 horsepower. And this head you see here weighs about 35 tons and it's covered with five inch titanium teeth. <laughs> Growers like to see this run in videos and this bar pushes trees over and it grinds the trees up and this, this bar can come down over here and reverse and rototiller the tree into the ground. So in this particular trial, I had two treatments. I ground these trees into the ground in the foreground, and these trees in the back were pushed and burned. So we had two treatments, grinding and burning. And I like to point out, this is what happens to trees in nature and forests. They usually either decompose slowly on the orchard floor, or as we see so often in California, they can burn up in a forest fire. And so this treatment had grind and burn at the Kearney Ag Center, uh, seven replications. And I planted the next generation orchard in exactly the same spot where the old trees were. And you could tell where the grinding was done because it stimulated nut sedge growth. But we basically didn't see any uh, difference in tree growth early on in this trial. And we saw similar results where we saw a significant increase in soil organic matter and a significant increase in soil organic carbon over time. And we saw uh, uh, later on, uh, the carbon was increasing the soil by 68% and whole orchard recycling led to eight tons per hectare of, of carbon sequestered after nine years of the orchard recycling. Uh, then we looked at tree growth. We had three varieties in the new orchard we planted and basically all three of them had greater growth in the grind treatment than in the burn treatment in tree circumference. And the most important thing that um, all the growers are concerned about in the San Joaquin Valley is that the grind treatment, when the orchard started to yield, produced, produced more yield than the burn treatment. And almost every year of the, 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 the trial, the grind treatment was always always had a greater yield than the burn treatment. In some years it was significant, some years it was not. But the, uh, the main thing was is that over the, the accumulation of the project, the, the grind has out yielded now uh, the burn by 2000 kernel pounds of almonds per acre. So now we can, have, we can put a significant uh, measure to the increased yield that can help offset the, the price of the, of the whole orchard recycling. So in summary of that, we've seen whole orchard recycling in this trial, it increased soil organic matter, it increased organic carbon, soil nutrients, microbial diversity, and most importantly for growers, orchard productivity. And as we've heard in this, this session about the bio, the cogeneration plants closing, a lot of them started closing in 2015. And this was the first year I had frustrated growers that, that had big piles of wood chips they couldn't haul off anymore. And, and a lot of them after listening to my research uh, spread their wood chips back on the ground at their own expense. Now we don't use the iron wolf anymore, but we use these large horizontal grinders and the iron wolf could do about two acres a day. And, and these things can do about 20 acres a day. They're a lot faster, but we use a, multiple machines to, to grind up an orchard now. We have loaders that take the trees to the horizontal grinder and another loader that has to put the wood chips in the, in the spreader. And then we have to spread the wood chips back on the ground. And here's, uh, here are wood chips being spread back on the ground. 
there's a lot of biomass <clears throat> in whole orchard recycling, about 60 tons of biomass per acre. It's a lot to move. It's a lot to move off site to anywhere. So uh, I'm trying to get growers to keep it on site and keep it in the orchard. Now here's an orchard that caught us by surprise. It was recycled at 64 tons per acre rate and the next generation was replanted and the trees were kind of stunned at, at whoops. Uh, the trees were kind of stunned at first, they weren't growing and notice there's no weeds or anything growing in this orchard and, and no herbicide has been placed, put down for over a year. So in this case, we think we added too much carbon, we upset our carbon to nitrogen ratio. So a lot of my work in the last few years is helping growers overcome this initial setback of adding too much carbon to the soil too early. And in a number of experiments, here's where I added 0.8 ounces of actual N to trees in March. And here's the control. And we, we started getting a very uh, good response. And we looked at leaf analysis at different rates. And we, we figured out that we were getting a much better response of tree growth by adding nitrogen earlier than we used to after whole orchard recycling. And here's my latest experiment at the Curdy Ag Center. Here's a 70 ton per acre wood chips on the berm. Here's the control. And we added the same amount of nitrogen to them, about 45 pounds per acre. And we actually got a significant increase in the whole orchard recycling treatment this time uh, compared to the control when we added the same amount of nitrogen, but we just started earlier in both treatments and uh, the whole orchard recycling uh, allowed us to have better tree growth uh, when we started earlier and we, hired, we had higher leaf analysis when we started earlier with our fertilization, even though we added the same amount. So we've changed our nitrogen recommendation the first year after whole orchard recycling. Um, without whole orchard recycling, we usually recommend three ounces of nitrogen per tree uh, that first year with whole orchard recycling. That first year we recommend five. And then we recommend the same, the same amount, four to five ounces uh, per tree the second year. So the, we only have to apply additional nitrogen to these trees after the first, the first year in the ground, we don't have to continue to add more. And I think that's why this is my soils nitrogen textbook when I was back in school and here's soil organic matter. It's a big black box that helps us buy nitrogen, hold it in the soil profile where it's more available to the plant. And I think that that's what's happening when we add uh, this organic matter back into our soils where we're helping the efficiency of, of the tree capture and use that nitrogen. I think uh, the other big issue is why we are actually getting you know, better yields with whole orchard recycling is, um, we have a PhD student now um, doing neutron probe data from our experimental orchards. And in the wintertime at the, the 15 centimeter depth, we're getting almost a 40% increase in water holding capacity um, in the whole orchard recycling treatment. So I think that, that that wood material is not only helping us hold and capture nitrogen and it's got nitrogen in it, but it's helping us hold and capture water which I think is translating to in increased tree growth. And of course, it's gonna be more and more important as, as water becomes more and more scarce in the San Joaquin Valley. The whole orchard recycling also helps with water infiltration. Uh, we see more, more microbial activity, all the microbes in the soil, we're adding all this carbon to, for them, a food source, so they're growing and thriving. I actually have an experiment looking at annual applications of wood chips to the soil. Um, I, think, I think we can do this more than just once every 25, 30 years when trees are recycled. Uh, we have a nice flyer out on whole orchard recycling. And my goal is to try to keep growers, to keep this biomass on site and recorporate it in the ground and, and help it with the next generation orchard in the form of holding water and nutrients. We have a large team of scientists uh, working with us on this project now that I'm very grateful for. And of course, uh, the San Joaquin Air Pollution Control District has been giving growers incentives since 2018 to recycle their orchards, which has helped with the costs. 
Uh, CDFA has added uh, whole orchard recycling to the Healthy Soils Program. Uh, NRCS has uh, implemented a, a program for uh, growers. And I estimate now that, that probably over 40,000 acres have been recycled. And, um, um, you know, with almonds are at 1.7 million acres in the San Joaquin Valley, it's, it's really not a lettuce bowl, it's a, it's a nut basket. And um, with those kind of figures, I expect to, to have about 40 to 50,000 acres uh, being, come out, uh, being re removed a year um, moving forward. So I hope that whole orchard recycling is a big part of that process moving forward. And I thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. And I'd be happy at the end of the session to answer any questions. <clears throat> Wonderful. Thanks so much, Brent. It sounds like some really important benefits um, that you found with this practice, and I look forward to hearing more as well. Thank you. Uh, great. Our next speaker is going to be Jim Stewart. Jim is the chairman of the California Bioenergy Producers Association, and he has 16 years of experience managing and consulting on renewable energy project development using a wide range of emerging technologies. He's here to offer us a critical review of bioenergy regulations governing um, the use of agricultural and municipal solid waste for bioenergy and to introduce us to a bunch of new projects that are in the works. So over to you, Jim. Thank you. Um, I'm having a little bit of trouble with breakup. So please let me know Anthe, if, if I have any trouble, if you have any trouble hearing me. Sounds great. Okay, thank you. Um, the nation's waste streams are an in integral element in sustainable development and the circular economy. I'm going to talk this afternoon about two of them, municipal solid waste and agricultural residues and their status as feedstocks for renewable energy production in California. There have been some references during the last two days about some of the things that I'm going to talk about, but I think this will be a more candid assessment of where the real challenges are in California. The, uh, I'm, not, I'm not getting it to change. Um, Anthony, you were going to set it up so that I could change the slides. Oh, I apologize. You're not sharing your screen. We're seeing um, the organizer screen. So you can either say next slide or um, you can take over the screen share and, and run it yourself if you'd like. I would like to take it over and run myself. Is that possible? Um, I can, it says I can't share while others are sharing. Hopefully our organizers are hearing you and, um, and they'll take their screen share off so that you can take over. As we, did, we did discuss this. I'm still not getting it. There we go. Now you can open yours up and share. Uh, I'm not, uh, I apologize, but I'm, I'm not getting it. What I'm seeing is Dan's uh, name on the screen. Go down to your screen share and then yes. share your screen or the file. You should be able to do that. Uh, I've gone to screen share and I'm not getting that. I'm getting, I'm getting, uh, it says, I'm getting a picture that says, into, sure, let's see, let's see, okay, wait a minute. Choose just want to share the entire screen. You can do it either way. Oh, the, the, the I still, I'm still coming back and getting your a view of you on the screen. Um, 
it looks like it's got your screen on there and the reason you're getting me is because i'm just i'm talking and, well i can't yeah. see what's on, i can't see what's on the screen with you from from, from yours yeah so but all, you're seeing all, your all own I'm, screen I'm, no i'm all i'm seeing on my screen is your name yeah me too that's what i'm seeing too on your screen not on mine See, there I am. I'm so you. I'll get I'm off. I'm so sorry about this. Yeah. It's, 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 Anthony, Anthony, I'm sorry. Uh, maybe, uh, again, all I am seeing on my screen is Dan Noble and now your picture. So, um, it may be Maybe. easiest if we just allow the organizers to present your slides, and then you can. That would be fine. I'll just have to. I'll just, okay. I'll, I'll just have to tell them to uh, to change the slides for me then. Exactly. Okay. Great. We'll get that back up. Thanks. I'm sorry for the delay. There we go. Well, next slide. Thermal waste conversion technologies represent the next generation of treatment for these waste streams and they're just destined to assist in California's quest for zero waste, reducing dependence on landfills and fulfilling the state's goals for renewable energy. And yet for more than two decades, state policy has discouraged their use into the production of biofuels and other products from municipal solid waste. Thank you for that. Go, go ahead. Change slides. Thank, thank you. Where do conversion technologies stand today? For well over 20 years, the state has had a definition of gasification and statute that is universally acknowledged to be scientifically inaccurate and which leaves developers vulnerable to spurious legal challenges and possible shutdown due to lack of compliance. The definition restricts the use of air or oxygen in the gasification process, which would disqualify most technologies and requires the entire manufacturing process, not simply the gasification step to have zero emissions. This is a physical impossibility and a standard that would shut down every power plant manufacturing facility or bioenergy uh, project in the state. In statute, con conversion technologies, including low temperature technologies, remain generally equated with incineration. Further, a number of other statutory provisions prevent MSW gasification facilities from receiving credit as landfill diversion. And as a result, jurisdictions are reluctant to enter into long-term feedstock contracts with pro project developers. These provisions have long discouraged conversion technology providers from developing their projects in the state. Next slide. Next, next slide. Let's look at what's occurred during the past decade. In 2001, SB 341 established a statewide goal of reducing organic waste disposal 75% by 2020. At the time this legislation was passed, CalRecycle said that in order to, for California to reach its 75% recycling goal by 2020, the state every year would have to reduce, recycle, or compost an additional 24 million tons of material currently going to landfills. That was based on an estimate of 80 million tons of solid waste being generated in 2020, which is probably where it was. Through recycling methods alone, this obviously proved to be impossible. And in 2016, SB 1383 reduced that goal to 50% by 2020 and 75% by 2025. The 2020 goal was still missed by a mile. Other mandates included in that decade, Diversion credit no longer being allowed for green waste when it was used as alternate daily cover in landfills and providing source separated organics collection services to all residents and businesses by 2022. 
for companies active in the production of renewable energy from the waste disposal and recycling process. These mandates have necessitated massive changes in how organic waste is disposed in California. Waste management companies and waste haulers and public jurisdictions are scrambling to find new sources for disposal. Next slide. For the more than 45 million tons of post-recycled solid waste that will be placed in landfills this year, conversion technologies theoretically could produce at least 1.75 billion gallons of LS LCFS compliant biofuels. Approximately 340 million tons of post-recycled municipal solid waste have been landfilled in California in the past decade, and we haven't even been, been able to make a start with con conversion technologies. For the past decade, Cal Recycle has pursued a policy of solid waste management that is narrowly focused on source reduction, reuse, and traditional recycling. So how has the state been doing by relying upon the traditional hierarchy of waste reduction, reuse, and recycling alone? Next slide. During the period from 2014 through 2019, which is the last year for which Cal Recycle reported, the state's annual recycling rate declined from 50% to 37%. This is clear evidence that Cal Recycle's policies have not been achieving its legislative goals. Next slide. Thermal technologies are an essential element in any effort to achieve an improved recycling rate to interdict and make productive use of solid waste before it is placed in landfills and to produce fuels, chemicals, and biomethane for renewable power production. Next slide. California's statute defines recycling as the process of collecting, sorting, cleansing, treating, and reconstituting of materials that would otherwise become solid waste and returning them to the economic mainstream in the form of raw material, reused or reconstituted project products, which meet the quality standards necessary for the marketplace. <clears throat> Notice it says returned in the form of raw material. Next slide. Compare this with the statute in New York, which says when granting a beneficial use determination, the department shall determine on a case by case basis, the precise point at which the solid waste under review ceases to be solid waste. Unless otherwise determined for the particular solid waste under review, that point occurs when it's used in a manufacturing process to make a product or used as an effective su substitute for a commercial product or used as a fuel for energy recovery. Next slide. Don't we wish we had that in that definition in the state of California? In the implement, in implementation of its mandates and other programs, Cal Recycle has virtually ignored the potential for using recyclables as raw materials in, in the state. Since its founding in 2004, the Bioenergy Producers Association has sponsored four comprehensive legislative packages that would have made possible the use of conversion technologies in the treatment of MSW in California. All four were rejected by the legislature the last in 2010, when we were unable to overcome a convergence of opposition that included traditional recycling advocates and even legislative staff. Next slide. It is interesting to note that in 2010, our legislation received support from 100 stakeholders, including a letter signed by the heads of all three state agencies, the Energy Commission, what is now Recycle, and CARB, whose chair at the time was the legendary Mary Nichols. And yet, 
After it had passed the assembly and was ready to go to the Senate floor for passage, the Senate Environmental Quality Committee called the bill in for a hearing after which it was gutted and revised to the extent that our association had to oppose its final passage. Subsequently, CalRecycle ceased its support of conversion technologies. And as we knew the legislation would be rejected if we ever sponsored it again, we decided to retreat from the battlefield and to limit our efforts to an informational campaign through our website and speaking out on these issues as I am today. I would note that in three different years since that time, we polled the entire legislature and found representatives interested in sponsoring another bill, but they backed off after being advised by committee staff that it had little chance of passage. Next slide. But what about administration policy other than Cal Recycle? As long ago as 2010, the California Air Resources Board stated that its number one solution for meeting the GHG reduction goals of the LCFS was to increase the use of biofuels from waste materials. To meet its LCF goal, LCFS goals 11 years ago, our projected the need for 24 new commercial scale advanced biofuels facilities in California by 2020. No high temperature MSW driven biofuels projects have yet been constructed in the state. Next slide. I just thought you might like to see this because this is the actual slide from the, cal from the CARB PowerPoint presentation in 2010 that said what I just told you. Next slide. So what's been going on elsewhere in the United States? To begin, biofuel biorefineries capable of producing a total of 1.6 billion gallons of renewable diesel from organic feedstocks are now in development or construction around the country intending to export this fuel to California to take advantage of our LCFS. I'd like to give you several examples of what's going on elsewhere in the country and the diversity of their outputs. Next slide. Fulcrum Bioenergy recently commissioned its Sierra Biofuels plant located in Nevada, approximately 20 miles east of Reno. Using gasification, it's processing approximately 175,000 tons of post-recycled MSW per year, creating 11 million gallons of renewable synthetic crude oil that will be upgraded to sustainable aircraft fuel. Let's go to the next slide. Brightmark is commer commercializing a plastics renewable facility in Indiana that will divert 100,000 tons of plastic waste from disposal each year, using pyrolysis to convert the material into 18 million gallons of ultra low sulfur fuel and naphtha blend stocks and 6 million gallons of wax. Next slide. This is really what we need to focus on. Th this in Chesapeake, Virginia, will be the nation's first fully integrated eco industrial park dedicated to the complete processing, recycling and reuse of all the elements of the municipal solid waste stream. Through the sequence of technologies, 95% of the incoming MSW will be productively recovered or reused. If you look at the picture, the area to the right of the bridge uh, is the site for the project. And what you're seeing is the, the former plant that was on that site, which has now completely been cleared in anticipation of construction start for this project. Next slide. The sequence of technologies planned for the facility will begin with a recycling facility that will handle 2,450 wet tons of MSW per day that's 850,000 tons per year that are currently going to landfill. Using the TRI gasification technology, which is the same thermal system as Fulcrum has used, 
they will produce 17 million gallons per year of renewable diesel and 10 million gallons of Fisher Tropes waxes. The inorganics will be fed to a high temperature plasma assisted vitrifier from Plasma Power, which will produce construction aggregate and 15 megawatts of power that will be in used internally in the project to operate the facility. The project is permitted by the city of Chesapeake with letters of intent in place for financing. In California, it would be virtually impossible to permit and build this facility, and I doubt that anybody would attempt it. Next slide. However, in California, as has been mentioned several times today, none of the repressive statutory and regulatory provisions that have discouraged the development of MSW conversion projects apply to single stream cellulosic wastes. Therefore, technology providers and project developers have selected California's Central Valley and its vast resources of agricultural wastes for their entry to the California market. They are doing so in the hope that there they can demonstrate these technologies and convince the legislature the time has come to allow them to use MSW. A current survey indicates that renewable energy projects consuming approximately 1 million tons of ag feedstocks are currently announced or in development in the Valley. Next slide. As we all know, the San Joaquin Valley is home to some of the worst air quality in the country. And so I won't take your time to review that. What's next slide. In the Valley, uh, the, during the past decade, as has been mentioned again today, 28 out of 33 of the biomass combustion facilities ceased operations when their power purchase agreements expired and they could no longer compete with natural gas. This left the agricultural industry with very few alternatives for the disposal of its waste. In 2014, after more than 10 years of consistent decline in open field burning, the APCD was forced to allow the increased use of open field burning again. This past February, the California Air Resources Board mandated the annual reduction and complete cessation of this practice by 2025. And that was what motivated its formation of the California Clean Biomass Collaborative, which Michael McCullough discussed yesterday. Other facts, factors impacting the agricultural community including, include the elimination of diversion credit for landfilling of, of ag residues, burdensome regulations imposed to offset unregul the unregulated pollution from heavy duty and truck trucks and other vehicles that travel through the, re the region on 99 and on Highway 5. Next slide. The exceptional drought conditions in the valley uh, experienced have also um, caused a great deal of, of difficulty with the renew, re, removal of uh, existing orchards. And I might add that the uh, new mandates under the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act are likely to generate additional demands for farmers to do additional fallowing of their acreage, their ag agricultural acreage. So now let's take a look at the Central Valley at, at several of the projects that are in development, projects that involve the production of sustainable aircraft fuel, green hydrogen, renewable diesel, renewable natural gas and electricity, all of which are being used using agricultural feedstocks, which could be applied to MSW as well. Ametis is, an, is a very active and, and progressive company that's using the Inentech gasification technology to convert waste wood to cellulosic hydrogen, which will be combined with renewable oils and hydro, hydroelectric electricity to produce 45 million gallons per year of sustainable aviation fuel and renewable diesel. The plant's gonna be located on a 142 acre former US Army ammunitions plant in Riverbank, 
and the commercialization is expected in 2024. Next slide. Just a few minutes earlier, TJ Pascat uh, told you that his company has secured $165 million in funding to develop and construct a biomass gasification to RNG project near, near uh, McFarland. Uh, the project will also sequester carbon dioxide in a in sequestration located at the site. Next slide. Yosemite Clean Energy has secured its first site for a carbon negative green hydrogen and renewable natural gas production plant in the Oro Oroville region. The facility will utilize proven Australian based gasification technology to produce commercial scale carbon negative green fuels. The or Oroville plant will be its flagship dual bed gasification facility in North America, following over 100,000 hours of commercial runtime in developed plants in Europe, Japan, and South Korea. Next slide. Of great interest, Chevron Corporation, Schlumberger, Microsoft and clean energy systems are working together to develop a bioenergy with carbon capture and sequestration to produce carbon negative electricity in Mendota on the site of a former biomass combustion plant. The facility will annually convert approximately 200,000 tons of agricultural waste into renewable synthesis gas that will be mixed with oxygen in a combustor to generate electricity. More than 99% of the carbon from the process is expected to be captured for permanent storage by injecting into nearby deep geologic formations. These are examples of projects that could all work in MSW. Next slide. Of real interest is that that through, throughout the period when the biomass combustion facilities were operational, the Fresno-based West Coast Waste, which was during the height of the biomass combustion facilities, was one of the state's largest orchard removal and disposal companies. They handled approximately 5 million tons of agricultural waste over the pro over the past 20 years. When these facilities began to close in the middle of the past decade, they began a worldwide search for disposal alternatives. The result is an innovative concept that I think is going to be one of the first, well, that it will be the first of its kind in the world. Next slide. Their Fresno Renewable Energy Center will be construct constructed at the company's headquarters, which has been operating as a recycling facility since 2001. Throughout that time, it has also been receiving and processing curbside green waste under long-term contract with the city of Fresno. It has never had a single complaint as to air quality, odor, or traffic. Its renewable energy center to be done on the same site will be the world's first renewable energy facility to combine on the same site, one, an anaerobic digestion facility that will produce renewable compressed natural gas for use as transportation fuel. Secondly, a waste gasification to power plant that will produce power for PG&E under its Biomat program and supply renewable electricity and thermal energy surplus to that agreement to operate the AD system, which will reduce the CI score of the RNG coming from the AD project. It will support the commercial application of the Verde pre-digestion technology, which uses thermophilic bacteria to pre-treat incoming feedstocks. Next slide. This is, a, this is a, a model of the project. The Verde process represents a game-changing breakthrough for anaerobic digestion. <clears throat> 
It will enable these facilities to use sources of lignocellulosic biomass in AD technologies that previously have broken down poorly, if at all, and in turn, turn them into precursors for highly efficient biomethane production. The breakdown of green waste, dairy manure, and food waste will become much more efficient and thorough, allowing for up to 80% volatile solids conversion into methane gas, whereas in the past, it has been below 40% for this type of feedstock. <clears throat> Next slide. With assistance from a $3 million grant received from the California Energy Commission in 2019, West Coast Waste has been successfully demonstrating the Verity pretreatment process. Under the, the CEC's 2021 grant competition, which the results of which were just announced this month, the company in competition with 17 other applicants won a second grant also in the amount of $3 million to assist in the commercialization of this technology. They're pleased to receive this continuing expression of support from the Energy Commission. The grant was the largest amount awarded under this CEC program, and it came, as I said, after competition with 17 other applicants. Next slide. <clears throat> Here are some of the benefits of the gasification process. It will improve air, local air quality. It will improve local air quality by removing more than 70 tons per year of airborne particulate matter from Fre Fresno's ambient air. <clears throat> it will produce five megawatts of renewable electrical power using a carbon negative process three megawatts of which will be delivered to PG&E under its Biomat program, with the remainder of the output to provide heat and power for the AD facility. The gasifier will consume approximately 98% of its feedstocks, which will include dry digestate from the AD plant, making possible the productive use of a material for which extremely limited markets exist. And it will also use 40,000 tons of agricultural waste, primarily almond orchard trimmings and removals. <clears throat> With the reduction in landfilling and the production in comp compost compostable materials, truck traffic will be reduced by eight semi trucks per day. And it's going to provide, an, obviously, a wonderful alternative to open field burning. Next slide. I just mentioned the gasifier that will purify the ambient air that it takes in. It will do this by thermally destroying contaminants as the air passes through the gasifier's heating process. The pollutants in Fresno's ambient air will be reduced by 20, 29 tons per year of PM25, 18 tons per year of PM10, and 23 tons per year of ozone. Next slide. The AD process project will annually produce 1.35 million diesel equivalent gallons of renewable natural gas for pipeline injection, while processing 91,000 or more tons of pure per year of green dairy and food waste. It will produce 7 million gallons of clean water from green waste moisture reduction. <clears throat> this project will not use water. And in a circular process, it'll, as I mentioned, it will deliver its digestate to the gasification po to power plant for use as a feedstock. And that in turn will produce renewable power, as I mentioned, that will reduce the CI score of the RNG we produce. And it will assist in commercializing the Verde predigestion technology. We believe that as a bolt-on technology, the Verde pretreatment pre process holds the potential of increasing biomethane production from AD facilities by as much as 36%. Next slide. 
And in summary, the project will offer owners an alternative to open field burning, providing a productive outlet for the disposal of their vines and orchard removals. Uh, next slide. This has been a candid few minutes, but it really has outlined what's necessary in California if we want to move forward and be able to produce biofuels and other products from the massive amount of, of, of MSW and agricultural residues that are being placed either in landfills or are going unused in the, in the fields in agriculture. And all of the other things that have been talked about today are attempting to address a massive volume in California that can never be, that can never be overcome unless we, we begin to use new technologies that can handle larger volumes of waste on a continuing basis. The EPA has just announced a, rule, a rulemaking process for the uh, application of gasification and pyrolysis technologies. And I hope that that process will uh, contribute in California to leading to legislation and steps forward that will enable these technologies to play the same kind of role in California that they are playing throughout the nation and indeed in, in, in Canada and, and Europe as well. Thank you very much for listening. Great, thank you, Jim. All right, we're running a little bit behind time now. I wanna make sure we have time for our Q&A. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our last speaker. I'm pleased to introduce Julia Levin. She's an attorney and the executive director of the Bioenergy Association of California. And Julia in the past has served many important roles as an expert in energy and climate policy, not only here at the state with the Natural Resources Agency and the California Energy Commission, but also um, with other organizations, including the World Bank, USAID, the Audubon Society, and the Union of Concerned Scientists. So we're really fortunate to have her here today to share insights on progress in bioenergy markets. Welcome, Julia. Thank you. And it looks like the organizer, thank you for pulling up my slides after Jim's experience. I was a little nervous about that. And so uh, you are a very hearty bunch at uh, almost 4.30 in the afternoon on a Friday. So I'll try to talk fast. And I think earlier speakers have covered a number of the points I'd like to make. Um, but thank you all for being here, especially this late in the day. So the Bioenergy Association of California represents about 90 members at this point, including local government agencies, private companies, utilities, researchers, nonprofits all focused on converting organic waste to energy. So while I echo a lot of the points that Jim made, um, our focus is a little bit different. We focus exclusively on the organic waste fraction of the waste and all end uses. So transportation fuels, electricity, combined heat and power, um, and other en uh, pipeline biogas and other energy end uses. Next slide, please. So the reason that we, uh, next slide, please. The reason that we focus on the organic waste fraction is partly for political reasons. As Jim pointed out, it's very hard to deal with the non-organic fraction of our waste stream. But the bigger reason is uh, because it's the organic part of our waste stream that is so critical for climate change. And that's because organic waste is the largest source of short-lived climate pollutant emissions, particularly methane and black carbon in California. So hopefully all of you followed um, the findings and the reports and the recommendations coming out of the latest International Climate Conference. The overarching theme of that conference is we have to do more and we have to do it faster. And by far the most urgent thing we need to do is to reduce short-lived climate pollutants because that's the only thing that really benefits the climate right away. And that is all about methane and black carbon. HFCs as well, but methane and black carbon are really the big kahunas. Next slide, please. And in fact, um, recent assessments show that short-lived climate pollutants have caused almost half of all of the global warming to date. Next slide, please. And again, that is mostly about methane and black carbon. The other short-lived climate pollutants, while very potent, are not as large a source of global warming. 
Next slide, please. Sorry, I am gonna to try to move through these quickly. Um, more importantly, even than what's happened today, it's what's going to happen in the next decade. And the science is very clear that methane and other short-lived climate pollutants are gonna cause more than half of all the warming in the next decade. So it is really, really, really critical that we reduce these super potent climate pollutants. Next slide, please. And most importantly of all, as I said before, short-lived climate pollutant reductions are really the only carbon reductions that benefit the climate right away, or even for the next several decades. Everything we're doing to reduce fossil fuels, while critically important in the long run, takes about 30 years or longer to start to benefit the climate. And that's what the dotted line shows, not quite that fast. <laughs> uh, back, thank you, right there. Um, the dotted line is if we only focus on carbon dioxide reductions, meaning fossil fuel reductions, we won't actually begin to benefit the climate until 2050. The only reductions that start to cool the climate right away are short-lived climate pollutant reductions. And so Dr. Ramanathan, a climate and atmospheric scientist at UC San Diego and climate scientists from around the world have said, short-lived climate pollutants are not only the most important thing we can do to benefit the climate, but they are really the last lever we have left to avoid catastrophic climate change. Next slide, please. That's all the negative urgency, why we need to deal with organic waste and short-lived climate pollutants. On the positive side, reducing short-lived climate pollutants is by far the most cost-effective thing we can do for the climate. And if you haven't looked at the Air Board's latest report to the legislature on the state's last five or six years of cap and trade investments, I urge you all to look at this report from April of this year. And that report, table two, shows really clearly that the investments in short-lived climate pollutant reductions are by far the most effective investments overall and the most cost-effective investments. You know, averaging around nine or $10 per ton of carbon reduction compared to the average of all of our climate or carbon reduction investments, which is around $75 per ton. Next slide, please. In addition to being super effective and super cost effective, investments in short-lived climate pollutants can provide carbon negative emissions. And we are going to need carbon negative emissions to get to carbon neutrality because there are a lot of emissions we simply can't eliminate. And so the way that we will um, balance out those emissions is by developing projects that can produce carbon negative emissions. By far the biggest opportunity, go back one slide, please. <laughs> um, I told you to go fast, uh, but not quite that fast. Um, by far the biggest opportunity for carbon negative emissions in California is converting organic waste to energy with carbon capture and storage, as Jim referred to it, BEX, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. That alone can provide two thirds of all the carbon negative emissions we need to reach carbon neutrality in California. Next slide, please. Just how carbon negative are fuels and energy from um, organic waste? Um, if you look at the very bottom of this chart, and these are all based on life cycle carbon intensities from the California Low Carbon Fuel Standard, biogas from diverted organic waste and dairy biogas are extremely carbon negative. Um, as much as negative 550 grams of carbon uh, per megajoule of energy. The other forms of bioenergy will have slightly positive carbon emission can also be made carbon negative if you add that carbon capture and storage. So this is a huge opportunity, both to reduce short-lived climate pollutants and to provide carbon negative emissions. Next slide, please. And that's why entities like the University of California have very ambitious biomethane procurement goals because the University of California oper operates a lot of essential services like hospitals and labs and other things. They can't afford to have the lights go off. They have their own power plants on UC campuses. And the University of California is actively procuring biomethane um, as a way to substitute for fossil fuels in its existing power plants and as a strategy to meet its own carbon neutrality goal, which is actually to achieve carbon neutrality by 2025. Next slide, please. So how much organic waste do we produce in California? You've probably seen a similar slide over the last two days, but I just want to underscore that we generate an enormous amount of organic waste. We have a lot of people, a lot of cows, a lot of agriculture, and a lot of forests. If you add it up, it's enough to produce about 4 billion gasoline gallon equivalents of biogas or 4 million tons of hydrogen. 
That could provide almost 20% of California's total electricity generation. And it's really, really valuable power because it's available 24 seven, meaning it can fill in around solar and wind, or it can replace diesel and backup generators or diesel and heavy duty trucks. Next slide, please. So now I'm gonna to get to why we should be focused more on bioenergy as um, an outlet for organic waste than landfills or compost. And I know this is gonna be a little bit controversial, but I think many of you are scientists and all of us need to follow the science here and, and really continue to drive down emissions everywhere we can. So um, recent monitoring by NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab, which is available online at the site um, at the bottom of this slide, has found that landfills are actually leaking a lot more methane than we thought. They're required to capture their methane, but it turns out that they're leaking an enormous amount, particularly 10 to 12 of the leakiest landfills in the state. But landfills altogether are causing almost half of California's methane emissions. They have now overtaken dairies. And that's a huge problem. Even the methane that landfills are capturing though, only about half of that is being used for electricity or transportation fuels. The other half is just being flared, which is just a waste. There's no energy capture and no pollution controls on a flare. So we have got to incentivize both reduction in methane leakage and beneficial use of the methane that is captured. Now I wanna to turn to compost. Sorry, <laughs> go back again, please. That same NASA website, shows that compost actually is also emitting a lot more methane from compost production than was previously thought. In fact, if you exclude those 10 to 12 leakiest landfills, compost production facilities emit as much methane as the average of California's landfills, meaning we're spending a lot of time and effort and money to divert organic waste away from landfills to compost facilities that are emitting just as much methane as the landfills. It doesn't make any sense. This is not to dis compost. Bioenergy also has a wide range of emissions. And, and that's why my overarching suggestion is across all end uses for organic waste, we have to continue to drive down emissions. So with compost, that means changing operational practices, but it also means what we really need to do is produce bioenergy first and then compost the remainder. Or if it's the cellulosic portion of the waste, we need to gasify or pyrolyze it and then use the remainder for biochar or biochar will be the byproduct of that. A state of Oregon Department of Environment study a few years ago found that when you convert diverted organic waste to energy and then compost the remainder, you'll achieve three and a half times greater greenhouse gas reductions than with compost alone. So we really need to start looking at these different alternatives on a life cycle basis. And I think we, that we'll find in the science supports that converting organic waste to energy first and then producing either biochar or compost as a co-product will maximize the greenhouse gas reductions. In addition, Jim talked about some of the benefits of going to thermal conversion, but a key benefit is that gasification and pyrolysis operate at very high temperatures and therefore almost certainly break down PFAS chemicals, which is another huge benefit of thermal conversion of our organic waste. Next slide, please. So I think some of these programs have been mentioned, but I just wanna underscore there are a number of open opportunities for bioenergy from organic waste, starting with the Biomat program, which is administered by the investor-owned utilities it requires 250 megawatts in total of new small scale bioenergy facilities from organic waste. That includes 110 megawatts from diverted organic waste, food processing waste and wastewater biogas, as well as 90 megawatts from dairy and agricultural waste and 50 megawatts from forest waste. And there are a lot of megawatts left in this program still. Um, and the price offerings are quite high, 127, dollars per megawatt hour if you're in the urban organic category, more than $180 per megawatt hour if you're using dairy or agricultural waste, and almost $200 per megawatt hour if you're using forest waste. In addition, the PUC adopted, the California Public Utilities Commission adopted a decision this summer calling for a thousand megawatts of new firm renewable power, meaning renewable energy that's available when it's needed, like bioenergy. This program actually includes landfill gas, any RPS eligible resource. Um, the Biomat actually does not include landfill gas, only diverted organic waste and other organic waste sources. But this PUC decision 
does include landfill gas. So this is a great opportunity for landfill gas to provide new renewable power that can fill in around solar and wind and increase energy reliability in California. I think you probably have heard a lot about the low carbon fuel standard in the last couple of days, um, but that's a very valuable outlet for organic waste to biomethane, hydrogen, or electricity generation for vehicle fueling. Um, and finally, this summer, the Public Utilities Commission also proposed, they have not yet adopted, but they have proposed a large biomethane procurement program that would um, make the gas utilities responsible for procuring 75 billion cubic feet of biomethane annually by 2030. That's another enormous opportunity. We expect the PUC to move forward on a proposed decision um, to adopt a biomethane procurement program in the next couple of months. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Actually, I'm gonna skip this one. There are lots of great projects in development around the state. Um, actually, the one thing I will say about that slide is, I know Jim is frustrated with mixed solid waste projects, but we actually are seeing a lot of growth in organic waste to energy projects in California, and it is very exciting. Um, next slide, please. So this is actually my last slide. I just wanna end with some to accelerate um, bioenergy development in particular as what I think the science shows is the most beneficial end use of organic waste. We have got to prioritize short-lived climate pollutants in the state budget and in, in the cap and trade investment program. Um, we do need to focus all of our regulations and incentives on life cycle carbon intensity. We've seen with the low carbon fuel standard how well that works. We need to do that now with our other clean energy and climate programs so that we continue to drive down emissions everywhere we can. And so that we're actually accurately gauging what the benefits and emissions are of different projects and not just choosing technology winners and losers based on the technology name. We do, as Jim and I think others have said, we've, we've got to put gasification and pyrolysis on an equal footing with anaerobic digestion and compost. We need all of these technologies. They each serve different roles and they each have different benefits. We do need to move away from direct combustion. And that means especially direct combustion of biomass, but also combustion of the biogas. We need to move toward non-combustion technologies wherever possible. We need the PUC to adopt its biomethane procurement program, and we should be rate basing the interconnection, meaning connecting bioenergy projects to either the electricity grid or the pipeline grid. And I can't read the bottom of the slide, so I will skip that and go to the last slide. And I thank you all very much, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Julia. I uh, really appreciate you, especially highlighting the importance of methane and uh, always enjoy your, your very practical recommendations. Um, and thank all of you panelists for your very informative presentations. If I can have you all uh, turn your cameras on so we can have a quick discussion, at least until the organizers cut us off because we're running low on time. But I have um, a few questions. I have some specifically for, for each of you, but uh, Let's start with one kind of round robin for everybody to answer briefly. Um, so, you know, I think it's fair to say that each of the pathways we've heard about at this symposium would in, you know, to one extent or another, um, improve our overall resource efficiency and contribute to the state's greenhouse gas emission reduction targets, right? Um, but I wanna challenge you to think beyond those important gains and tell us um, what do you see as the greatest benefit of the solutions that you advocate for, whether it's you know healthier communities, um, economic growth, climate adaptation, or anything else. Um, Julia, feel free to start. Well, I think the greatest benefit of any of these end uses is for the climate. Um, we, we are facing a lot of environmental sustainability issues, but climate change trumps them all <laughs> and makes all of them harder to achieve for that matter. So I, I think climate change is the overarching threat in our lifetimes that we have to address and we have to address it as fast as possible. And so everywhere that we can reduce short-lived climate pollutants, I think we have to do that. And that's why I think really, if I could choose one recommendation, it's to look at all of these different end uses on a life cycle basis and, and start from there and really assess accurately, what are the emissions, what are the benefits, what are the reductions that we're achieving? 
Well, you know, I like life cycle analysis, so I won't argue with you on that one. Um, all right, uh, Jim, do you want to share what you think the most important benefit is? Well, he's not on camera. Are you still there, Jim? Why don't you go ahead, Brent? Well, one of the big in, uh, <clears throat> points I think I didn't mention with whole orchard recycling is, is that we're basically keeping the biomass on site and when you're removing an orchard at a 60 ton per acre rate, you know, that would be a lot of trucking expenses that, you know, used to go to move that biomass to wherever, you know, used to go to the cogeneration sites. And that, that's a huge amount of biomass to truck down the freeway. So, and one of the other things I didn't mention is our soils in the, in the San Joaquin Valley and California tend to be very low in organic matter. So as I tell growers, this is a, a once in a 30 year opportunity for them to actually build their soil organic matter, which can be related to <clears throat> the fertility of the ground. And, and also um, it can help capture uh, <clears throat> nitrogen that, that might otherwise flow into groundwater and cause pollution and, and that avenue too. So there's, uh, I think, uh, a number of, of benefits to keeping the biomass on site where it was produced and not, not hauling it off and, and letting it build soil organic matter for future, future crops on that ground. Yeah, absolutely. Great, thank you. And what about you, Scott? Well, the only solutions that I really put forward <laughs> is that we need to address this issue uh, holistically and start reducing the amount of plastic that enters our waste stream overall. I think in the short term, what we really need to get a handle on is just how much plastic is entering our farms through biosolids. Uh, we've no, no one has ever monitored for that in California, and we've only seen very few studies monitoring anywhere in the world. Great. Um, let's stick with you for a second, Scott. I have one for you specifically. Um, so you're in your presentation, you gave us a great sense of um, the impacts of plastic pollution and why we need to be paying attention to this issue. Um, so for those of us who are worried about the accumulation of microplastics in our fields and in our food, uh, what steps can we take now to be prepared to avoid, especially that with that exponential increase in um, plastic pollution that you showed us on one of your last slides? Uh, are you asking for the consumer perspective or a farmer's perspective? Um, I guess I, I can think speak both to are of interest, you know, individually um, as well as as policymakers and industry. Sure. So if you're a consumer and you're trying to reduce your exposure, you can just look around in your home for the things that are probably shedding microplastics. Carpets and rugs are going to be the largest sources, as well as any synthetic clothing that you wear. Uh, that's going to be the dominant exposure route for most people. Um, uh, farms that use biosolids, uh, there's a chance that those plastic particles are making it into the food. We don't really know, though. We've never looked for microplastics in, in the food that actually makes it to the market. Um, but if, if you're really concerned about that, uh, you can eat organic food that doesn't use uh, biosolids. Great, thank you. Um, and I, I always observe how um, any uncertainty from scientists tends to make us procrastinate and delay action. So I just wanna you know, uh, give you kudos. I think it's important to have people like you and the agencies um, paying attention and kind of raising awareness for, for all of us. Um, so thank you. Uh, okay, going back to Brent, you know, it was really interesting to hear uh, about the evolution of your interest and involvement in whole orchard recycling. I wasn't fully aware of the role that you had played in that. Um, so I, I just hope that you found it really gratifying, um, not only to be able to demonstrate all of those benefits, um, as well as to see it adopted more and more um, and increasingly supported by state policies. Um, you talked about the biggest expense or the biggest hurdle being the expense to growers. So I wonder if you can give us a sense of those costs and talk more about those funding opportunities for growers who are interested in adopting the practice. Well, I, I think the, 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 the good part of, of it, I, I think, is that, uh, you know, my, my research actually so showed a cost benefit of, you know, 2000 kernel pounds more per acre, which depending on the price of the almonds could, could be a, 
two or three four thousand dollar difference with whole orchard recycling in it and but it does cost growers a, about a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars per acre and uh, so it's a huge huge incentive but i i think the main crust of of my my program was showing growers that it, the trees could survive and grow with all that that carbon and that was ultimately beneficial and I think when growers believe it's beneficial, you know, they, they want to do what, what they can to improve their soils um, or to, to recycle. And, and the first implementers took, took this on at about $1,000 per acre expense. Um, fortunately, with, with some of the incentives that have been implemented, they're greatly reducing that and making orchard recycling much more um, uh, feasible or economical for them, but I, I think we we still haven't really gotten growers carbon credits for all the carbon that they're actually putting back in the ground, and and that's kind of some of our next goal. If we can, you know, we we we're reducing, we're improving our air quality, but you know, I I think growers should actually be able to receive a carbon credit for putting sixty tons of carbon back in the ground per acre. <clears throat> Could I respond to that? Because I think um, I am sure there are a lot of benefits of full orchard recycling. I don't doubt that. And I think you've done great work in that area, Brent. But carbon credits for, I assume you mean for carbon sequestration, that goes back to my point about we actually need to look at life cycle emissions and we really need to be very careful. And you know, there was a lot of hope that compost would provide carbon sequestration. And for a long time, people thought compost was a form of sequestration, but it turns out it actually decays quite quickly and is releasing methane. So it is great for replacing fossil fuel-based fertilizers. It's great for water retention, but it is not carbon sequestration. And I think the science now is quite clear about that. The Lawrence Livermore National Lab report behind me on getting to carbon neutrality really goes into that in great detail. And I think it's likely that for whole orchard recycling, while having a lot of the same benefits of compost, the benefits you described really well, but I would be very surprised if it constitutes permanent carbon sequestration, which is what carbon offset protocols are for. So I just, um, I don't know, but I think we have to be careful. And that kind of goes back to my recommendation that we really have to measure, monitor, verify, look at all of these different end uses on a life cycle basis and not jump to the conclusion that things like whole orchard recycling or compost equal carbon sequestration. They have other benefits, but it's probably not carbon sequestration, at least not permanent carbon, sequ carbon sequestration. And Julia, I wonder if I can ask you, would you say the same is true for um, many of the bioenergy applications that without um, actually geologically, you know, capturing and, and sequestering carbon, do they, you know, have less of the, the climate benefits that you spoke of? Well, the Air Board has looked at the life cycle emissions from a lot of different forms of bioenergy, and so has Argonne National Labs. Um, Argonne National Labs actually looked at biomass gasification in a pretty extensive study looking at urban wood waste, agricultural waste, and forest waste. The Air Board has looked more at biomethane sources, so anaerobic digestion. And you know, when they include avoided emissions upstream and then displacing fossil fuel downstream, you do get to really, really low carbon and often carbon negative emissions. That was the chart that I showed. Um, if bioenergy is produced using gasification or pyrolysis, then pyrolysis, then the co-product is biochar, and that is a material that can provide permanent carbon sequestration because it's basically solid carbon and it can be applied deeper into the soils. It doesn't provide some of the other benefits. I wanna be clear, they're trade-offs. Biochar is not adding nutrients back into the soil. It does help with water retention. And again, according to Lawrence Livermore National Lab and others who've looked at it, it does provide very long-term as a hundred years or longer carbon sequestration. Um, but if it's, if it's bioenergy through anaerobic digestion, and the co-product is compost, no, I don't think that the science shows, I don't think the science says that compost is carbon sequestration, biochar is. So I don't know if that answers your question or not. <laughs> there are a lot of different pieces when it comes to bioenergy projects in terms of the carbon intensity. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you, Julia. And I did notice that Jim is still with us, um, just not on camera. So Jim, if you'd I'd like to give you an opportunity to 
answer the first question about um, the benefits that you see, you know, beyond uh, greenhouse gas emission reductions and just overall resource use efficiency, if there's something you'd like to add there. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I apologize. I broke off for a period of time. And I would like to thank Julia for graciously acknowledging that their focus has been on organics and uh, that is critical. However, with uh, municipal solid waste in particular, right now we haven't really spoken about the waste management companies and the people who have been dealing with uh, landfill biogas as, a, as an energy source. This is causing a, a, the, the new regulations, the new goals are causing a massive reorganization in their own thinking. And they are seriously looking for ways to deal with uh, municipal solid waste that, uh, that will eliminate the need to put it into landfills. If we can avoid putting the material into landfills, and Julia is absolutely right. Um, the JPL study is a very definitive study that shows that the emissions from landfills and from composting are significant and, play, and, and, and actually a significant portion of the emissions in, for the entire state that we're dealing with are coming from those sources. So to the degree that through conversion technologies, we can avoid putting material into landfills. Uh, we're making a huge step forward in my opinion. Great, thank you, Jim. And I, I did wanna clarify um, just to make sure that I understand the distinction. Um, when you talk about you know, the regulations that have discouraged the development of municipal solid waste to energy technologies, um, you are referring to the whole waste stream, including plastics and non-biodegradable substances, um, or just a subset of that? No, I, I, the, way, the, way I, the way I can answer it is that it's an overall problem that we're dealing with that you can't address anything if you can't get started. And the, the California has had for more than 20 years a series of statutes and regulations that would discourage any developer from risking his financial resources to try to permit in California. It's not, not, only, not only should we be looking for ways, and I know Julia would, has, has been fighting this battle on behalf of organics for a long time, but we have to find ways to make it easier to get through the permitting processes with these projects and, and move them into production, move them into development. I, I noticed TJ said today, he's looking at probably four years to get from the point where he has a commitment for financing to a finished product. And when we're looking at the cessation of open field burning, having to be totally completed by 2025, we don't have enough time left now, if we start now to deal with the uh, finding this, the alternatives for, for open field burning. So I guess all I can say is this is fundamental. It isn't for one part or another part of, of, of what we're considering. It, if we can't get started, if we don't have a unified industry, um, and that's where I, I, I feel Julia's group can play such a role. They and the Coalition for Natural Gas have the have the uh, participating companies right now that can unite and try to bring the, the uh, Newsom administration to understanding this and, and perhaps make some changes in overall policy that will enable these things, these, these Thank you, Jim. Uh, I think we're going to need sure. to leave it there. We've we've kind of blown past our time yeah. and need to turn it back yeah. over to the organizers. Correct. Um, so we need to in legislation. Thank you. I'm sorry. That's Thank all you. right. Thank you, Jim. Thank I appreciate you. I appreciate your enthusiasm and all of you for being here. Thanks so much. And we'll turn it back over to Lauren now. Hi, uh, and thanks everybody. And I hope we can continue this discussion. It's very interesting. And um, we will be posting on our EPA website, the presentations from everybody. And 
Um, then also UC Davis will uh, have the uh, recording available to people. So we'll send out a notice on that. And then we'll also send a um, evaluation form to everybody so they can put in their comments on evaluation. And um, so uh, thanks to everybody for their participation and we hope to get this uh, discussion continuing. And, and uh, yeah, let, uh, let us know if you have any other questions and does anybody else have anything to add? Okay, well, have a good thanks Thanksgiving weekend. <laughs>